Last winter I was driving down the freeway at night, going between suburbs of a large metropolitan area kind of thing, so there were plenty of cars around, but it was mainly midnight or so, and it had been snowing when it isn't always white during winter here. I saw a car pull over on the shoulder of the freeway with a guy standing next to it, clearly in need of some assistance. I saw them as I was driving past, but since it was later at night and was cold out, I figured I might as well take the exit, loop around, and see if the guy still needed help. I get there, and it's a middle-aged working class type of guy standing outside of his pickup. He's wearing blue overalls, slender, is slightly balding, and puts off what I can only describe as a weird vibe. I couldn't put my finger on it, but it was one of those weird gut feelings that you aren't sure why you feel. He says that he's been having car troubles, is from two hours out of town, that his alternator is shot and that his battery needs a boost. I've owned a car with a shot alternator and I know that when the battery dies, you need to boost it for a little while if you're gonna get it running again. I tell him it's no problem, commiserate with him for a minute, pop my hood, and he says he's gonna go grab his cables. When he comes back, I notice in his hand that he has some sort of concealed metal object. I have no clue what it was, but I saw it for a brief moment, and saw that it wasn't a knife, but that it was metal, and a little shorter than the length of his hand, and he was clearly trying to keep it concealed from my view. This all happens so fast so I'm immediately on high alert. I see it for a split second as he's bringing the cables to me so that I can hook up my battery. I instantly take a step back and put some distance between us and tell him that he can hook up my battery and I'll wait in the car. All the while, an instantaneous, full fight or flight, getting ready to block an attack if he were to lunge at me. He doesn't and starts connecting the cables to my battery as I'm sitting in my car. I start to wonder if I was imagining things as he connects the battery, and we both wait for the battery to charge. Maybe it was just something that was bundled in with the cables that he just had in his hand. Maybe I misread the situation as dangerous. After a few minutes, he goes to start his car, shouts that it isn't working, and then walks back to my car where he waits in front of it. After a few minutes of waiting, he puts his head back under the hood of my car to fiddle with the cables. All the while, I'm of course watching him intently to make sure he doesn't come to the car window, because I was still spooked. He shouts some things about how it isn't working, and asks me to come out to take a look. I open my window a bit, casually tell him to not worry, and that it's probably just gonna take some time. Luckily, I can just barely see my battery in the dark, through the gap under the popped hood of my car through the windshield directly in front of me. I see him then fiddle with the cables, and hear him shout again that it isn't working, and for me to come out. Then I see him slip out the metal object I'd seen earlier, and saw him touch it to my battery terminal as spark shoots out from where he touched it. He starts yelling and jumping back, as I immediately jump out of my car and tell him that something came up and that I need to go now. I honestly don't remember much of what he was trying to say as I cut him off, or exactly what I said outside of that I needed to get the fuck out of there without taking my eyes off of him for even half a second. I don't even remember how the cables came off my battery, but I slammed the hood shut, jumped into my car, and drove off. I still have no idea what his plan was, no clue what he was trying to do or what on earth he was trying to make happen, but I do know for a fact that what I saw him do is in no way what he was telling me he was doing. But as I left him there and drove off, I was practically pinching myself, trying to make heads or tails of what just happened. And I cannot stress this enough, that the guy just gave off the weirdest vibes, like the hills have eyes kind of weird vibes. Maybe he was planning on trying to short my battery so that I was stuck there. But to this day, I wonder if I encountered some sort of mass murderer who had been planning on kidnapping somebody at the side of the freeway as they stopped to help. Who knows? But either way, it was weird as fuck. And it spooked me, and I noped the hell away from that guy as fast as humanly possible. I still wish I'd gotten the license plate or something to give to the cops 
But in that moment, the only thing going through my mind was just to remove myself from that situation as fast as possible. I used to be employed as a child protection worker. A report came through about a stepfather who was being abusive to his children. I was given the investigation by my team leader. When I interviewed the oldest child with the police, she had very visible physical injuries and told me exactly what had happened. I'll spare the details, but it was horrific. As the children were in his sole care, we knew that they needed to be removed immediately. We sent a team of two workers out to the children's school while myself and a colleague called the stepfather into the office. I lead the interview and it was horrible. He didn't even try to deny that he'd hurt his stepchild, basically saying, That's my kid. I'll do what I want and you can't stop me. When I served him with the paperwork, he absolutely lost his mind. He was swearing and screaming and said, If we were outside this building right now, I would fucking kill you. We ended up running out of the interview room, pressing our emergency alarm, and I even had to make a police report about the whole thing. It got really messy. The next day we had court for the children and my manager decided I shouldn't attend due to everything that had happened the previous day. My colleague who attended told me that this man was at court and yelled several times something to the effect of, Where is that bitch of a worker who took my kids? I remember feeling a little freaked out, but it's not uncommon to hear things like this when you have to remove a child. It's understandable that emotions are very high. You build a bit of a resistance working in this field, and overall, I mainly felt relieved that those children had been placed with an aunt and were safe. About two weeks later, I had to stay back late at the office on an unrelated job. It was about 9pm when I finished, and I was the only person there. I walked out the back of the building to my car. It was really dark. But when I got close, I thought I saw a shadow moving at the front of my car. Just for a second, and then it was gone. I was about 20 meters away at this point, but it startled me. I stood there for a second, just looking at my car, wondering if I was just being paranoid. While staring into the darkness, I started hearing tiny rustling noises, and whether imagined or not, all of the true crime horror stories I've ever heard flashed into my mind. Safe to say, I freaked myself out and sprinted back into the building. I called my boyfriend to come pick me up and explain what happened. By the time he drove up to the front doors, I'd convinced myself I was being silly and asked him to drive me around to my car. He circled around and with the headlights shining on my car, I could very clearly see that all four of my tires had been slashed. I was an absolute mess that night and called the police immediately. I was pretty sure that this man was responsible, but as I hadn't seen him, I couldn't say for sure. I took a few days off and came back to a meeting with my manager, who had put together a safety plan for me and the other staff. She'd organized to have a security guard escort us to our cars and said very clearly that no one was to stay in the building after hours alone. Then about a week later, a letter was delivered to the office addressed to me. Any mail that comes into the office goes through our reception staff. Our lovely receptionist opened it and it was a note that said, You're as good as dead, bitch. The words were typed and printed. She was an older woman and burst into tears when she read it. It didn't say who had sent it, but I am convinced that it was the same man. Over the next few weeks, letters kept coming, each one getting longer. They addressed me as bitch and homewrecker, saying that I kidnap and abuse children. It was just horrible, horrible stuff. The threats in the letters were the worst. The person writing them threatened to assault, torture, kill, find out where I live, and burn down the entire building. To be honest, the police were less than helpful. They basically said that given the nature of our work, they couldn't conclusively say it was this man, although they had questioned him. To me, it all seemed like a pretty massive coincidence. 
I'd never had anything like this happen before. They did say they were taking the letters very seriously and tracking down where they'd been posted from, but I never heard anything back about that. My workplace took the threats very seriously too. All of the security was bumped up across the building, and all staff completed refresher training on emergency management. One day on the way home from work, I noticed that a car was following me. At first, I thought I was being paranoid, so I drove down a bunch of little streets, doubled back onto the same route in a way that would make absolutely no sense. Even after all that, a dark green Camry was still placed a little way behind me. I freaked out but had already planned in my head what I was going to do in this situation. I headed straight to the police station, planning to pull right up in front of the building and beep my horn until I had someone's attention. The second I pulled into the police station, the green Camry drove straight past and disappeared down a nearby side street. I sat there for a good 20 minutes, too scared to get out of the car in case they came back around the corner. It dawned on me that in my panic, I'd forgotten to get the license plate. That upsets me to this day. I told the police what I knew, but they told me that the man didn't have any car registered in his name. This was the final straw for me. I was a nervous wreck. I was looking around constantly at work and at home. I knew that he lived relatively close to me, so I even stopped going grocery shopping in case I ran into him. I stayed on stress leave for a month and heard from colleagues that letters kept arriving. I was very honestly ready to quit, but then COVID happened. It really changed everything. Everyone went into lockdown and all access to the office was restricted. I started back working from home, driving a work car to and from appointments. I didn't go into the office regularly anymore, only allowed in small working groups when absolutely necessary. Over the next years, the letters slowed and eventually stopped. By the time we were allowed back into the office, there hadn't been any sign of this man for almost seven months. About a year later, I left child protection. I don't know what happened with those children, but my hope is that they're happy and safe with their family. And as for the man who I believed stalked and threatened me for doing my job, let's not meet ever again. So this happened a while back. I was probably around 10 to 11 years old, meaning my brother Alex was around 8 to 9 years old. We were walking home from the bus, which takes about 7 minutes when I noticed something was off. I didn't see anything at first but I just knew that something was wrong. So my brother and I start walking home, as the only two who got off at our stop were him and I. This blue and silver beat up truck drives past us, and I think nothing of it. It never slowed down or stopped, it just kept going. Alex and I were holding hands, as my grandmother always told me to do with him as he's my baby brother, and I want nothing to happen to him. Nothing happens at first, but then the same truck drives around again, driving our way this time. It was driving slower this time and went up the road and turned, out of sight. Now, Alex and I were nearing the three-way intersection that connected the cul-de-sac road to another side road, right off the main road the man just drove down. I happened to look down the street and see the truck driving real slow down the street towards us again. I knew we had to run. I knew there was no other option. I knew that if we didn't, my brother and I would not be safe. I didn't know how I knew, but I did. As soon as we passed a house that blocked us from view, I turned to Alex and spoke to him exactly four words. No questions, just run. And we did. In our driveway, there's a row of bushes and pine trees that divide our home from the next door neighbor. I dragged him in there and told him to be quiet and I'd explain later. I watched as the same truck drove down and around the cul-de-sac again before coming to a stop right in front of our house. I had to hold my brother's mouth shut because he was crying and I was scared that whoever was following us would hear him and hurt us. 
I was more worried for him than myself at this point. I was in fight or flight mode. I was the big sister. I had to protect him. I looked at him and said that the truck was following us, and I told him not to be scared. I said I wouldn't let anyone hurt him, and it seemed to calm him down a bit. After what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes, the door to the truck opened, and out came a man. He was tall, skinny and messy, short hair covered by a torn baseball cap, ripped jean shorts, and a puke green tank top. He entered our yard and looked around a bit. Alex and I were still in the bushes, and I was trying to find a way to get to our house safely without getting this guy's attention. The guy left after what felt like forever and entered his car. He started it and drove around slowly. I waited a few minutes to make sure he was gone before turning to my brother and saying, We need to run. When I count to three, we're gonna run behind the house to the back door, okay? He agreed and we waited a few more seconds before I started counting. I still didn't have a good feeling about this, but I knew we had to move. I started counting. As soon as I hit three, we booked it across our driveway and into the front yard to go around the house. As soon as I left our spot, I heard it. The sound of accelerating. He saw us. He was waiting for us to leave. He chased us up our driveway as we ran around the side. I grabbed Alex's hand and practically dragged him around the house and made him run ahead to the garage door to see if it was locked while I searched for my house key. The garage door was open, and I swear to God, I saw this man round the opposite corner of the house that we did as I entered the house. We entered it, and I slammed it shut, locking it and deadbolting it. I didn't stop running until I opened the house door and ran downstairs with Alex, screaming our safe word. It woke my aunt, who worked the night shift and was sleeping, we told her everything, and she stayed up with us until my grandmother got home. We called the police, and that was my first ever interaction with an officer. The man was never caught. To this day, I don't know what he wanted, but I'm sure it wasn't good. I'm just glad my grandma drilled stranger danger into my head. I don't know where my brother and I would be right now if she hadn't. I've quibbled with the thought of publicly sharing my story for a while now. Recently I've arrived at a place where I think the benefit of sharing outweighs the risk, so I'm taking a chance and just putting it out there. Maybe it will help someone. Many times I've looked back on the odd events leading up to the scariest night of my life, October 5th, 2015. I'd like to say that I did everything right, but honestly in hindsight I should have done more. I'm convinced that my son, who was three and a half years old at the time, actually saved me from harm that night. I could have easily become another statistic in the crime database. Although my stalker did not hurt me physically, it took me months to get past the psychological damage. Here is my story. In May 2012, I temporarily exited the workforce following the birth of my son, Chris. He was born with a physical birth defect that would require multiple corrective surgeries during his first year of life. He was also born two and a half months early, which had complicated things further. Chris's father, Aaron, agreed that I should stay home with our son until he was a year old, considering the circumstances. In May 2013, I felt comfortable enough to leave my son with a babysitter, so I went job hunting. I ended up being hired on the spot as a waitress at a small but very popular chain restaurant in my little town. Let's just say this little diner is widely known for their waffles and leave it at that. I was hired on to work second shift. After two months I'd worked my way up to first shift. By the summer of 2014, I'd long built a clientele of regular customers that enjoyed my service and tipped me well. Enough for me to have a little put back in savings, which came in handy when Aaron and I broke up. 
I ended up moving out of our apartment with Chris and renting a small two-bedroom trailer in the same town. It was mid-November of 2014 when I first met Ryan, the man who would later stalk me. It was an abnormally slow Saturday morning shift at the diner. Two men walked into the diner together and sat down in my section. They were my only customers at the time, so when the older man of the two started making small talk, I had the time. The older man introduced himself to me as Ryan, and the younger man with him was his son. Right away, by his body language and tone, I could tell Ryan was being flirtatious with me. He even cracked a cliché joke, saying, There's no way you work here because you're too pretty and you have all your teeth. Honestly, I wasn't really amused with that tired kind of humor, and while Ryan was decent in the looks department, I was a little annoyed with being casually hit on by him. I was 25 years old at the time, and much closer to his son's age. But nevertheless, I faked merriment because a happy customer equals a better tip. It's just part and parcel to the job. Suffice it to say, my fake laughing and smiling paid off earning me a $10 tip on a $20 ticket. They were only there for 30 minutes too. Not too bad, I thought to myself. The following weekend, Ryan came back to the diner. This time, he came alone. There was nothing unusual about this interaction than from the last. I took his order. We chit-chatted when I had time. I kept his coffee refilled, and that was it. But apparently, he enjoyed his experience because again, he left me a nice $12 tip on an $8 ticket. Ryan began visiting the diner every weekend from then on up until the end of December. By then, he had started coming two to three times per week, and at this point, he really started showing an interest in getting to know me. Now, that's not something unusual per se. I had some other regulars that I actually developed friendships with, so I did tell him things about myself in casual conversation during his visits. Just normal things that normal people talk about. One of the things I eventually told him about was the medical miracle that is my son. I even bragged about the fantastic job his doctors did, showing him the before and after photos of his surgeries. Over the past several weeks, Ryan's attitude toward me had changed. He was no longer this annoying, flirty, middle-aged guy, but rather a seemingly caring person. Maybe I was naive, but I genuinely appreciated his kindness, and I did not interpret it as a romantic gesture at all. Ryan continued coming by on my shifts for breakfast three times a week. February 2015 is when the first strange event occurred, which was soon followed by a string of more. It was a Tuesday afternoon. I had picked Chris up from the babysitter and was heading home from work. Now, where I lived was on a small uphill dead-end road. As you pulled onto my road from the main highway, you could easily see my trailer on the right side at the top of the hill. It was positioned perpendicular to the road, and the back side of it is visible as you drive up the road. As I eased my way up the hill, something immediately caught my eye. I could clearly tell my back door was open. I put the brakes on immediately and tried to figure out what to do. I literally never touched or unlocked that door, much less opened it, so I knew something was off. A door is not going to unlock and open all by itself. I ended up parking my car off to the side of the road and calling Aaron. At this point we were on good terms and co-parenting our son very well. Aaron came straight over and checked out my trailer while I remained back in my vehicle with Chris. About five minutes after entering, he called me and told me it was all clear. So I made my way up the hill, expecting to have been robbed or something, but nothing was missing. There was no damage to the door, so Aaron basically brushed things off, saying that I must have forgotten to close the door myself or something. I knew better. But since there was no sign of a B and D, I let it go. Two days later, I come home from work, and the same thing. My back door is wide open. At this point, I know I'm not crazy. I know I'd lock that damn door. It didn't have a deadbolt, by the way, 
They just had a lock on the doorknob that you turn. I had even tested it out that morning before work to make sure it was locked. So I called Aaron again. I stayed parked with Chris on the side of the road while he did a quick pass through my trailer. And again, nothing out of the ordinary except my open back door. A quick inventory showed that nothing was missing. I was nervous at this point that someone had broken in twice, and Aaron disagreed. He attributed this problem to a faulty doorknob lock. He then went to Lowe's and purchased a type of heavy-duty swivel lock to install on the door that locked from the inside of my home. He wanted to put my mind at ease at least. So while he installed the lock, I combed through my house. I mean, I literally spent hours after Aaron left inspecting every nook and cranny of the trailer. The outlets, my shower head, vents, my panty drawer, everything. I thought that maybe some freak had broken in and planted secret cameras since they didn't take anything. I didn't find anything amiss, so I begrudgingly let it go. Two days after that, I'm off work heading uphill on the road toward my driveway. My son is spending the weekend with his dad, so I have the house to myself that evening. A wave of relief washes over me as I see that my back door is still closed. Now, I don't know why I decided to do this, but something compelled me to actually inspect the door up close. I needed to make sure it wasn't tampered with. To my horror, I discovered that it had. There were pry marks along the edge of my door jam. I immediately went inside and unlocked the door so I could open it and inspect further. The edge of the door was bent to hell and back on the inside where the doorknob met the jam. That damage wasn't there two days ago when Aaron installed that new lock. I deduced that someone had probably been using the credit card trick to easily break into that door since the way it locked was by the knob. And when they figured out it would no longer work, they tried to pry it open, not knowing that a new lock was on the other side of the door. I'm thankful that lock held. At this point, I called the police and made a report. They basically told me there wasn't much they could do in this instance other than document the incident. They told me to call them if anything else happened. Needless to say, that wasn't satisfactory to me, but I didn't know what else to do. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping at home that night so I ended up making the hour drive to my parents' house and crashing there. Nothing else happened for a little while. By March, I'd been able to put February's events behind me and feel secure in my home again. I was working and going about life as usual. At this point, Ryan had begun visiting the diner five days a week. Oddly enough, he was there each shift that I worked. It became a running joke with the other waitresses and in fun they teased me about having a stalker. I would soon find out just how true that actually was, because in April, things got weird. I came home from work one day to find my grass had been mowed. Now, I usually paid a neighbor to do it for me since I didn't have a lawnmower. My yard was small, but maintaining it was a requirement of my lease agreement. My neighbor didn't charge much to mow it, and he needed the extra cash, so it was a win-win. I knew I hadn't asked my neighbor to mow recently, so I thought it was strange. I asked him if he went ahead and decided to do it anyway. He said he hadn't. So then I called my landlord and asked her if she had mowed my grass for some reason. I knew my grass hadn't been high enough to warrant that, but it was the only plausible explanation. Of course, she said no she hadn't mowed my grass. I was stumped. I then assumed that an anonymous neighbor must have mowed my grass out of the goodness of their heart. You know, like a pay it forward kind of thing. I mean, what else was I to think? All throughout April and the beginning of May, my grass was being anonymously mowed once per week. I know it sounds strange hearing it, but at the time, I genuinely thought a neighbor was just doing neighborly things and didn't want to be recognized for it. On May 5th, 2015, Aaron and I decided to take Chris to the zoo. When we got back from the zoo late that afternoon, we discovered that my front door was cracked open. Ugh. Now, my front door didn't have a deadbolt, but I must have forgotten to lock it. 
How stupid of me. You can imagine how upset I was due to my back door being tampered with multiple times back in February. I just didn't understand why this was happening again. Like all the other times, nothing was taken. My belongings seemed untouched. Yes, I was feeling targeted, but I didn't call the police because I felt like I technically had nothing to report. There was nothing stolen or vandalized, just an open front door. So I let it go again. Two days later, I would discover the depth of things. May 7th, 2015. It was one of my rare off days. I was at home relaxing when the diner called me. I answered, thinking my boss wanted me to come into work. It wasn't my boss, but my co-worker Celia. She stated that someone named Mary called the diner asking to speak to me. Mary had asked for me by name. Since I wasn't at work that day, Mary left her phone number and requested that I call her as soon as possible. I thanked Celia for the message and ended the call perplexed. I didn't know who Mary was, but out of curiosity, I gave her a call. Mary ended up being Ryan's estranged wife. She informed me that Ryan had a nervous breakdown while they were arguing earlier. He started raving like a wild man about how Sarah is a better girlfriend than she is a wife. He told her that we were in love and that he'd been taking care of me and my Down Syndrome son for months. My son doesn't have Down Syndrome, by the way. She initially thought it was all just crazy talk considering his mental state. He mentioned where I worked. He said we were going to get married. He said that I had asked him to adopt my son. He said that he was going to run away with me in order to get away from her. He even told her he started visiting me after following me home one day. When he said that, Mary knew that something was very wrong. Ryan had somewhat of a history with mental issues and Mary was used to him weaponizing things to hurt her feelings during arguments, but she said that this time was different. She knew he had started frequenting the diner, and red flags went way up for her when he admitted to following someone home, so she decided to call the diner and see if anyone by my name worked there. When Celia confirmed this, Mary perceived the possible danger, and she left me her name and number requesting a callback. My head was spinning at this point. While things were finally starting to make sense, I was still gobsmacked. At one point in the conversation, Mary mentioned my grasping mode. Yes, Ryan even flaunted the yard work he did for me in her face. It was all very strange and very surreal. Basically, Ryan had been obsessing over me for months. He became delusional and it created a whole relationship between me and him in his mind. It was all in his head, and obviously he was the one breaking into my home when I was gone. Why he did it, I still haven't pieced that 100% together. He never took anything. I imagine he was mowing my grass because that was his little way of taking care of me. Anyway. By the end of the call, I decided to go to the police department in person to file a report about Ryan. I thought at the very least this is harassment and I needed it documented. Maybe I could get a restraining order. Mary offered to provide an official statement to the police as well, to which I thanked her. The police department took our statements and the harassment complaint was filed. Although I couldn't get a PO based off of my statement alone, the officer did assure me that he would personally go talk to Ryan. I then went straight to the diner to inform my boss, Chase, of the situation. Now, Chase took this very seriously. Just that morning, a third shift waitress actually brought up to Chase how a man came in the diner very early, at around 4am. This man was trying to get her to tell him which days I'd be working that week. She told Chase it made her uncomfortable. So when I told Chase about Ryan, he went back and looked at the camera from that morning. And sure enough, the man that was bothering Third Shift for information about me was Ryan. So Chase initiated the process through corporate to get a permanent ban on Ryan from the diner. It was approved at a later date. I was scheduled to work the following day, and I was nervous throughout my entire shift. But thankfully, Ryan didn't show up. 
nor did he show up the following day or the next day after that. All was quiet at my home as well. The officer showing up at Ryan's house to speak with him must have spooked him enough to stop. Weeks, then months went by. No Ryan in sight. No vandalism at my home. No mysteriously mown grass. Nothing. My life had gone completely back to normal. But things changed again in October. October 5th, 2015. It was around 8pm. My son Chris fell asleep on the couch while watching a movie. I had dozed off as well, until I heard a few very light knocks on my front door. I then walk to the kitchen and look out the only window that faces my driveway. No cars there except my own. So I figured the light tapping I heard at my door was either just the TV or my half-asleep brain playing tricks on me. I then returned to the couch and started playing a game on my phone. About five minutes later, I heard a few light knocks on my door again. This time, I was wide awake so I knew my brain wasn't playing tricks. So I walked back over to my kitchen window to double check the driveway to see who was there. Again, my car was the only one in my driveway. Right as I go to close the kitchen window blinds, loud knocking suddenly erupts at my front door, and I mean loud, angry banging. I guess my instincts kicked in, and I sprinted to the couch, I scooped Chris up in my arms and ran down the hallway to his bedroom. I did the only thing I could think of in that fraction of a moment. He was groggy and confused, but he listened to my instructions. Get under your bed, stay under your bed, and don't come out until I tell you to. I then ran to my kitchen and grabbed a knife while dialing 911. I actually screamed at the door that I was calling the cops in hopes that it would scare them away. I positioned myself at the end of the hallway, which connects my son's room to the living room. This way I'd have a clear view of both the front door and my son's bedroom doorway. As the operator picked up my call, the banging on my front door was getting even louder. 911 said she was dispatching police right away. She instructed me to stay on the line until they arrived. About 12 minutes into the call, the banging got more violent, rattling pictures off of the wall. I thought for sure that they would break down my door at any moment. 911 asked me where I was located in the home, and I told her. She asked me if I could hide somewhere. She told me not to put myself in danger. In that tiny moment, I felt enraged. Hell no, I'm not gonna hide. I'm not taking my eyes off of my son's bedroom under any circumstance. Where are the cops? And besides, I lived in a small trailer and the only hiding place for an adult is my bedroom closet. I'd be easily found. So I just erupted over the phone. Look lady, I'm a single mom. I have no man, no gun, and no place to hide. If he breaks this door down, what am I supposed to do? Throw this knife at him. Where are the fucking cops? She assured me again that the cops are on their way and to stay on the line. More banging but this time it moved to the actual side of the trailer. It sounded like they were taking a baseball bat and beating against the outside of the trailer. At that moment, Chris started shrieking. I ran the few steps over into his room to check on him. The loud commotion had just pushed his fear gauge over the edge. He was screaming and crying incessantly under his bed. I quickly ascertained that he was physically okay, and I returned back to the end of the hallway to check on the front door. As I was explaining to 911 that my son was okay but just scared, I noticed that the banging had suddenly stopped. I waited another minute or so, trying to listen out for any sign of further escalation. All I could hear were sobs coming from my son's room. All in all, it took the cops 23 minutes to arrive. By then, the perp was long gone. For reference, I live about 10 minutes away from the police station. 911 even called it in as an active home invasion. I was livid about the response time. My front door was made out of some type of metal, just a cheap generic trailer door. It was now covered in dents. There were noticeable scratch marks on the lock. The siding on the trailer was damaged where the perp had hit it with something. Given the history, 
I immediately suspected Ryan was the perp. The police said since I didn't actually see the person, they couldn't arrest him without an eyewitness. The most they could do was make a report. They did end up canvassing the immediate area in case he was on foot. However, there was no sign of him or anyone around and about. I deduced that he probably had parked nearby out of sight. That way his vehicle wouldn't be spotted or recognized at my home. My home was situated near a thin patch of woods that has public access roads on the other side. I am also absolutely convinced that Ryan had nefarious plans for me that evening, but when he discovered my son was at home with me, he bailed. He stopped trying to break into my home the moment my son made his presence known. For whatever reason, Ryan always lit up when I talked about my son. He used to initiate conversations about Chris just to watch me dote over him. Looking back, I guess it was his morbid way of bonding with my child. And I think in his own warped way, he grew to care about him. So when he heard Chris scream, he decided to not follow through with whatever his plan was for me. I ended up taking a few days off of work because I was so shaken up. I stayed at my parents' house during that time because I was afraid to go home. My landlord had the damaged door replaced while I was gone. Realizing that I had a job and a life, and that I couldn't stay gone forever, I knew that I had to go home. So I got a gun, a small caliber revolver, but it would do the job. And then I went home. I lived in that trailer for another four months before I saved up enough money to move. It was totally peaceful during those months, with no further events or altercations, but I just couldn't stand being there anymore. Since then, I've changed jobs, met someone special, gotten engaged, bought a house and got a dog. No further sign of Ryan anywhere during any of these life changes. It's been nearly seven years since any sign of him. Ryan seems to have disappeared out of my life in the same manner he first appeared out of nowhere, and I couldn't be happier that he's gone. Hopefully, it stays that way. So a bit of background here. My father was in the army for 21 years. He retired and moved to a very small town in central Florida. He got bored after a couple of years, and even though we didn't need the money between his retirement and what my mom was making as a bookkeeper slash tax prep, he wanted to go back to work. He started working at various gas stations, and it being a small town, the owners wouldn't care if I came there and helped him out with stocking the coolers, or even running the register, as long as I didn't sell any beer or smokes. This all took place in the late 80s and early 90s. The actual story I'm going to tell took place in 1990, and I remember the date well, because it was shortly after my birthday, and being 15 in Florida, I just got my learner's permit, and my dad would let me drive him to and from work, just to get some experience on the road, both at day and at night. I was sitting in my usual spot at a table that was set up along the windows, book in hand, feet propped up and a Mountain Dew on the table, along with some snacks. I would generally spend most of the evening that way, reading books, getting up to run the register and stock the cooler at different times. I remember glancing up, because something caught my attention that was unusual, and I realized that a lady was walking up our parking lot from the direction of the interstate. This in itself was really strange, because where we were located, you didn't get many people walking and definitely not walking from the direction of the interstate. I figured she'd broken down somewhere and was coming to use the phone to call for a tow truck or something. I was completely wrong. She came into the store, looked around for a few minutes, and I remember getting just a strange and creepy feeling about her. She walked up to the counter and started telling my dad a story about how she'd gotten stranded and needed a ride up to the next big town up north from us. Ocala was the town. Remember that. My dad lets her know that he's working, and there's no way that he can take her. She turns and looks at me, and while she's looking away from him, 
My dad catches my eye and suddenly shakes his head no. I was confused for a second, but then she turns back to my dad and points at me, asking if I can take her. My dad responded back that I only had a learner's permit and wouldn't be able to drive her anywhere and then drive back. Normally, I would have done it, even though it was illegal because I'd done it a few times before already. I didn't argue with my dad since this was completely out of character for him. He was normally chatty with the customers, but for whatever reason, he was almost curt and dismissive of her. It turns out, he had a bad vibe about her from the minute he had seen her walking up the drive. Well, she cusses him for a minute, and he basically tells her to get out of the store. She slammed the door open. I thought the glass was going to break from how hard she slammed it, and then she stalks out of the store and down the driveway. I keep an eye on her and continue to watch as she makes her way back up to the interstate and then starts up the northbound on-ramp. Almost a year passes, and in my bedroom, less than a week before my 16th birthday, I hear my dad yelling from the living room, Son, get your ass in here and look at this. I quickly run to the living room and see my dad pointing at the TV, and I look at the mugshot of the lady up on the screen. I immediately remember the lady who had been in the store. Turns out, I almost gave a car ride to Eileen Wernos, who was later convicted of being a serial murderer and then later put to death. I still have nightmares about what could have happened. This happened one night about a quarter after midnight. I was in my bed when I heard frantic knocking. I walked out of my bedroom while the knocking continued again, and I heard a woman saying, Please help me, along with crying, but it was faint. I looked out the peephole to see no one there, and no other doors were being knocked on, just mine, which is odd itself, but I'm also on the third floor. Why would someone walk all the way up to my apartment if they were in distress? I think it was a recording, because if someone really needed help, they would be banging on everyone's door. I called the police immediately, and the dispatcher told me not to open the door. They also asked if I had a weapon. I've heard of this tactic before, while slightly different of it being a recording of a crying baby. It's insane when thinking about the statistics of stranger abductions usually resulting in murder. It's just so sick to try and prey on people's empathy. Police drove by. I saw them using their spotlight to look through the complex, but I had no idea if anyone was found or by chance someone was hurt if they found them. I've barely slept with all the possibilities of how this person found me, where they saw me, when they followed me, or if they live in this complex. I'm four foot ten, live alone, and don't know many people in my area. I don't have any family that are close either. I wonder, have they been watching me and know all of this? It's making me go crazy. Stay vigilant. Don't fall for these tactics and know that not everything you read on the internet is false. I heard about this a year ago and wonder if I hadn't already been aware of this. Would I have opened the door? Where would I be right now? Would I be alive? This world is fucked. For an update, I talked with the management to let them know what's going on. As of now, no one else has reported to them anything similar happening. I'm going to contact the police again for an update. I was redirected to another police department, but they weren't the ones who responded to the call. I know it takes some time for reports to be filed, so I'm just trying to be patient. I just want to know if this has happened to anyone else. I've ordered a ring camera and will be picking it up shortly. At least this way, I could get a video of them if they come back, and it might help me sleep better. As far as it being a prank, absolutely it could be, but I would be more inclined to believe it if it happened to other women in the apartment. Maybe it has, but they haven't said anything. One side of the coin, it's a very cruel prank that I shouldn't worry about. The other is that someone has been watching me.
and had something sinister in mind. It's horrifying to think that someone would pull an elaborate prank like this, or real-world things that happen that we never think could happen to us. With guns and self-defense classes, I will be getting both of these, but they both take time and a lot of money. I don't want to just get a cheap gun with no training. That won't help much. It will be something I won't invest my time and money into. But for the short security, I can only really get a ring camera and stay updated with the PD. I have since installed my ring camera and it's working. I feel much safer knowing if they come back, I can at least have a recording of them. I know I need to talk to my neighbors, but right now I'm exhausted from no sleep and I'm still spooked, so I will do that tomorrow. Also, hopefully the police report will be filed tomorrow, and I can finally talk to the deputy about this. This is about the first stalker I ever had. When I was 13, I was in a long-distance relationship with an incredibly insecure 16-year-old. He had pushed me into getting an Xbox 360 and then forbidding me to have any guy friends on it. Though back in 2010, it wasn't exactly easy to run into other lady gamers, so naturally I made friends of the male variety. During one of the many short-term breakups in that relationship, I ended up meeting a group of guys while playing Gears of War. They added me and over the next couple of days I'd play and chat with them. This one guy named Tweaker was the most vocal of the rambunctious group and was immediately very flirty with me. Being the naive moron I was back then, I figured he was just joking around. We'd be playing and he'd follow me around maps saying he'd protect me, or if he had the most kills in the game, then I'd have to tell him I loved him. Things like that. At this point, I'd only known these guys for maybe two days. Tweaker left the party to get food, and his friends were telling me that he definitely had a crush on me, but not to lead him on because he was a hacker. Let me say that in my very short time of not only being a girl on Xbox, but also it being a time where if you logged into your friend's account, and people called it hacking, I didn't believe that, nor did I think his flirting was anything more than joking. I wish I'd listened to their warning. The next day, my boyfriend decided he wanted to speak to me again. He saw me in the party with Tweaker and his friends and joined. He started calling me a whore and all that good stuff before getting kicked. Suddenly, Tweaker is losing it and asking who the fuck that guy was, so I explained the situation just for Tweaker to be genuinely confused. I thought I was your boyfriend. I made the tragic mistake of giggling, thinking he was joking. What's funny? You said you loved me. His tone was chillingly serious. His friends got quiet in the party, but sent me a message telling me to be careful with how I respond. What does that even mean? At the same time, my actual boyfriend is blowing up my phone with even more nonsense. Now in a rock in a hard place, drowning in confusion. I do the best my 13-year-old self can to defuse the situation. I try to clear up things with Tweaker while also apologizing to everyone, but I'm not allowed to talk to them anymore. From there, my boyfriend logged into my account and blocked them all. The next day, I log in to see 47 messages from Tweaker. These were the ramblings of a madman. Why did you block me? There's no way you were the guy like that. I'd never treat you like that. Respond to me. I know you're reading this. I can get him to leave you alone. We can be together. We can be happy. Respond to me. If I can't get to you here, I'll find a way to reach you. I'm confused and freaking out that my boyfriend will read all of this and start yelling at me again. Still not comprehending that this guy is serious. Later that night, I'm on Skype in a call with my boyfriend. Suddenly, a message pops up. There you are. Who the hell is Gene? How are they messaging me when I haven't added anyone? So I asked. It's Tweaker, duh. I told you I'd reach out. I blocked him immediately. And instantly, I get a message on my Facebook from Gene. 
or Tweaker. I can get you here too, love. I blocked him. Then my phone vibrates. There's no way, right? We'll be together soon. If I wasn't freaking out yet, I definitely was now. How is he doing this? Fuck. When they said hacker, is this what they meant? Stupidly, I tell my boyfriend, and he yells at me and blocks me, the usual. Now in tears, my phone rings. Out of reflex, I answer and I hear, what's wrong, baby? I'm not your baby. I don't even know you. Leave me alone, I respond. We'll be 18 soon, and I can come down and take you away. We'll be together, I promise. I sat there. Speechless as he read off my address, my middle school, names of my family members. Apparently he was in the same state as my grandma and didn't live far from her, which she eagerly let me know. I hung up. What do I do? Who the hell is this guy? Every day for the next month he would call, text, and message on everything I had available to reach me. There was no blocking him, he'd just unblock himself change my password, he'd get back in the next day and fly into a rage. Not once since that phone call did I respond, yet every day he would let me know he was coming and that he loved me more than life should allow him to. Then one day he called the house phone and my mother answered. Hey, your friend Jean is on the phone, she told me. I lost it. I hadn't told my mom anything about what was going on. Now this guy is calling my house, talking to my mom. I'm done with this. I take the phone and say, Never contact me again. There's something wrong with you and you need to get help. If you don't stop, I'll go to the police. I'm sick of your shit. He was silent for just a second. Then, in an erratic, breathless voice, he hissed, You fucking slut. I've done nothing but love you, you ungrateful whore. If you don't want to be mine anymore, then I'll give you to everyone else. With that, he hung up, but it was dumb to think that was the end. The following weeks, I received a massive influx of texts, calls, emails, and even letters from so many different people, only to find one email from Gene. He sent me four links to different websites. Under the links, he wrote, If I can't have you, they can. Suddenly, it all made sense. He posted not only my number, email, and my damn address, but also my full name and pictures of me to predator and trafficking forums. I am not and have never been a security guard, but I remember one time. I was closing the store with my boss. We locked the front door as we closed and cleaned. This was late at night. Well, near the end of our shift, we heard scratching at our store's front door. It's a glass door, an automatic slider, but as I said, it was locked. We originally shrugged it off as an animal or a tweaker. That was until we finished cleaning. My manager heard scratching at the back door, but it can't be opened from the outside. Someone or something was trying to get in. The scratching was violent and near the lower part of the door. He was back there finishing up an inventory check as it all happened. He shouted at whoever it was, basically leave or we're calling the cops stuff. The scratching stopped right after that and he made sure that the door was locked from the inside too, by procedure. Well, he also opened the door to look around. He saw no one or anything, but there were claw marks where the scratching was. Animals are not uncommon in that area, but they're usually stray dogs and cats and such. Normal stuff. These claw marks were not. Not our normal, at least. He came up front where I was putting cleaning stuff away. I was at our main checkout area next to the front door. I asked what happened. As he told me, we heard a loud scratching sound at the front door again, but we both turned pale as we saw a human-like hand with claws at the door and two eyes that were reflective. I was young and actually quite strong, 
My manager is a shorter and smaller guy, but also older. He called the cops, and we didn't leave until the cops were at our door. The officer escorted us to our rights, and as we left, he followed. Even the cops saw this. As we were pulled out of the driveway in a line, we saw a human-like head peeking out from us at the bottom of the building's corner. We all pulled out and stopped at a nearby gas station. The cop confirmed what we saw and he had some other cops drive by and they looked around. Despite what we saw and what cameras saw, we still don't know what it was. The officer is pretty sure it was a prank because he went around the area and asked anyone with a camera facing our store for possible footage. There was nothing. It didn't ever happen again. I used to be one of the nighttime duty managers at a hotel. The hotel consists of a main house which was built in the late 90s slash early 2000s and the old house which was built in the 14th century. There are a few spooky stories about the old house and the grounds which all come from actual events. At one point, it was listed as the third most haunted building in Britain. I wouldn't say that I was a believer or a denier of ghost stories. I thought some events can be explained and some can't. Being a local, I was familiar with all the stories and my dad had worked there for years when I started. Like I say, wasn't a believer and wasn't a denier. That was until I became a duty manager. Being a duty manager is a simple enough role, dealing with complaints from hotel guests, handing over to the next duty manager and everything else. One of my duties as a nighttime duty manager was to lock up areas of both parts of the hotel, places like the bar, restaurant, and gift shop. Other things such as making sure fire doors are closed, the emergency lighting is working, and closing and locking windows for security. This part of the job was extensive. Every window, fire door, and emergency lighting. I had to check this every single night. Now, the old house is where all the spooky stuff happens. In the old house is a chapel, pretty standard for a house of that size and age in Britain. This is where I experienced the first spooky thing. There's one window in the chapel, that no matter how many times you close and lock that window, the next time you walk past it, it'll be open again. This was experienced by myself, the other duty managers, and even the security guards. Nothing horrifying, but it gets worse. The next spot is a set of chairs called the Jerusalem Staircase, named so as the wood for the stairs comes from Jerusalem. Some stories about a ghost dog on these stairs that trip people up, I don't think any of this. It's stairs. People trip on stairs all the time. However, they lead to a room called the Long Gallery. Now this isn't a very long room. It's close to 100 meters. Other than length, there's nothing else to the room. I was doing my rounds one night, had come in to do my checks as normal, when suddenly I can hear heavy footsteps coming from the other side of the room. Which is possible. There are guest rooms at the other end. I shine my torch down the room and can see nothing. Then it gets scary. The footsteps slowly became harder and faster until they sounded like someone was sprinting towards me. I'm frozen. Next thing I know, whack, I've been shoved against the wall with pain in my back, stomach, and chest like I've been tackled. There is a similar room directly above, but that's only accessible to duty managers and security. Again, not the only person to experience this. The last couple relate to a confirmed murder in the house. It's a long story, so I'll give a TLDR. Lord of the house and his wife are expecting a baby. Lord has heard a rumor that his wife had an affair, had a local nurse abducted and brought to the house to deliver the baby. The baby was then snatched by the Lord and thrown into the fireplace, and he murdered his wife. The nurse escapes and curses the family, saying no male heir will be born to the family. The curse kind of came true. No male heir has survived long after birth. Now the bedroom where all these events took place is a popular part of the house 
with guests visiting all the time. However, it's not the real room. That's directly above. I have been in the room more times than I can count. Reports of a crying baby are common, but never proved. One thing never reported was blood dripping from the ceiling. As mentioned, the real bedroom is directly above, so myself and security investigated. We found nothing, nobody, not even a drop of blood. The second part is about a sculpture in the chapel of one of the male heirs that died shortly after birth as a result of the curse. The sculpture is pretty normal looking, a baby in a cloth with its eyes closed. Apart from one night, the eyes were open. I ran so fast out of that chapel, I'm pretty sure I broke the land speed record. So there's my experiences. Before I explain the light post man, I need to provide some background information. I live in a rural area of the United States. I don't mean farmland, I mean thick woodland, no neighbors, and a 30 minute drive to the nearest store. Yeah, rural. Anyway, our roads are decrepit and flanked by trees so thick that you can't see through them. It was on these roads where my friends and I would carelessly ride bikes and skateboards, which is a good segue to the matter at hand, the light postman. I was in my mid-teens and just had a really fun day with a friend. We skateboarded to the closest town, bought Mountain Dews and ice cream, then skateboarded around town until dusk. Admittedly, I urged my friend that we should head back sooner. However, I gave in when he protested. By the time we reached the end of my road, it was completely dark out. The moon was very bright though, so we could see the road very well. Oddly, no vehicles drove by the whole time, and my friend and I were excited to have the road to ourselves. We reached about halfway when we approached the gravel pit on my road. The gravel pit had a single flickering light post with an orangish glow. We had just passed the gravel pit when we heard a male voice shout, Hey, behind us. I froze. My friend hopped off his board and headed toward the gravel pit. I, reluctantly, followed close behind. He abruptly stopped at the edge of the road leading into the gravel pit. It was then that I could see the source of the voice. A man was leaning against the light post. I could swear there was no one there when we passed by, and the closest house was my own. Fearlessly, my friend took a step forward and asked the stranger, What's up? What are you boys doing? The stranger replied in an unsettling tone. We're skateboarding, my friend said casually while raising his board slightly in response. Oh yeah, the man said, taking a step forward. Why are you out so late? He took another step forward. We were just heading back. My friend said. I could hear nervousness in his voice now. Oh yeah, the man continued. Where are you going? He took another step. His posture was definitively menacing now. That was enough. I had a sudden and overwhelming feeling that I was in danger. An instinct, I suppose you could say. I began to skateboard away into the darkness. My friend, realizing that I noped out of there, promptly followed behind. I heard the man's voice booming behind us. Hey, come back. But we just went faster. I repeatedly checked behind us to see if we were being followed. Thankfully, we were not. It wasn't until later that I realized that I'd never seen the man's face. All I saw was a silhouette. His face was conveniently hidden in a shadow due to the light post being directly behind him. It was unsettling to think about that at the time. It is still unsettling to think about it. Why was that man there? Where had he come from? Why was he interested in us? So I'm currently traveling sea with my two brothers. 
We just arrived in Saigon this morning. In the evening, after dinner and a few beers, my two brothers and I decided to sit on a bench in Haodan Park and have a quick smoke. We were chatting away, sat on the bench, when I noticed a Vietnamese man repeatedly looking at us and walking in circles very near where we were sitting. At first, I wasn't too concerned about him. However, my spider senses were alerted. Then a minute or two later, I noticed another Vietnamese man dressed as a grab delivery driver acting suspicious and repeatedly looking at my brothers and I. The stalkers were both on the phone, and I believed they were communicating with each other. Being in a foreign country, my brother told us to leave. However, it was a good 600 meter walk to the park exit. As we were walking, I noticed both Vietnamese men had gotten on mopeds and were following us through the park, stopping behind trees and watching us. They overtook us and sat at a bench further down the path waiting for us to cross their path. Being aware of this, we left the path and started walking on the grass, avoiding the men. We were about a hundred meters from the exit when my younger brother looks behind us to see one of the men sprinting towards us. My younger brother took a fighting stance, standing his ground and asking what the man wanted. The man's posture became small and he began talking very quietly. Both me and my younger brother kept a good distance and told him to leave us alone as we walked back towards the exit, noticing the second assailant also approaching us wearing motorcycle gear. However, my oldest brother decided instead of trying to get out of this situation, he got closer to the whispering Vietnamese man to hear what he was saying. Both my younger brother and I were yelling at him to get the fuck out of there, but he was being a dumbass. It took the Vietnamese guy five seconds to win my brother's trust. Then out of nowhere, when my older brother was leaning in very close trying to hear the man, the Vietnamese guy grabbed my brother's crotch. He was shocked. I was ready to fight, expecting to be robbed or something, but the guy grabbing my brother was really unexpected. After that, we started shouting and the men fled. For context, both my younger brother and I are competing MMA fighters. The whole situation was unexpected. We didn't engage in any violence towards the men, just shouting at them. And that's the end of the story. Be careful in the parks at night in Vietnam. And to those two men, let's not meet again. Seven years ago, two of my best friends and I went to Europe in order to visit my friend Carrie's daughter, whose husband was in the Navy and had been stationed there. Anyway, on the last leg of our trip, we had decided to visit Dublin, Ireland for a few days. Everything went great while we were there, and on the last night, we decided that we would go and have a couple of drinks at the pub that was just a couple of blocks down from our flat. Well... My friend Carrie is a pretty friendly lady, and after a drink or two, we were all feeling a little more comfortable in our surroundings. Then she started chatting it up with the Irishman, Dave. Right away, Carrie's daughter and I felt there was something a little off about this man. After about an hour of talking, Carrie had wanted to take pictures with him, and he seemed to get pretty upset about this. He told her that he doesn't take pictures, and he doesn't have a Facebook, and that he doesn't want his picture on any kind of social media. Okay, I get it. There are lots of people who don't have Facebook or Twitter or whatever for their own personal reasons, and I respect that. But this man just acted downright paranoid about everything. At this point, I thought maybe he just had a wife or girlfriend, and he's afraid that somehow they'll see pictures of him in some place he's not supposed to be on some American woman's social media account, and impending doom will ensue for him. I tend to be very paranoid though, and I told her daughter that we need to take a selfie, but instead of taking a selfie, I snapped a picture of the man. I'm not saying it was right, but I've been through some pretty shitty stuff in my lifetime, and I've learned that one thing you do not do is ignore what your intuition tells you and mine was telling me something was off, and if anything happened, I wanted a picture of this man. 
Dave would look around a lot and try to get my friend to go outside and smoke with him, even though she told him several times she didn't smoke anymore, and he encouraged her to drink more. Eventually, Carrie's daughter was ready to go back to the flat, so, knowing how my friend has the tendency to wonder when drinking, I asked her if she would watch my purse for me and not go anywhere while I walked her daughter back to the apartment real quick. By the time I arrived back at the pub, Dave had gotten Carrie outside to smoke, and he didn't look excited to see me back. Now, I'll admit that sometimes I probably like to over-dramatize people's facial features in my mind because it makes the conversations in my head more exciting, but I'm pretty sure I saw some genuine disappointment there. Since the pub was closing, Dave asked us if we wanted to go somewhere else and drink with him. When I pointed out everything was closed, he said there were places that were always open we could go to. Carrie was eager to go, and I followed, even though my gut was telling me this probably wasn't going to end well but I was also not ready to return to the apartment and go to bed. So, lo and behold, Dave walks us to a door that has a flashing neon sign above it that says, Open 24 hours. But there's no name above the door, just the sign. We walk down a flight of stairs, and Dave pays 15 euros for each of us to enter. When we get to the bottom of the stairs, and what to my wondrous eyes doth appear, but a blackjack table on my right and roulette-like table on my left. And in front of me is a row of five bar stools with five scantily clad working women sitting upon them. At this point, Carrie and I look at each other and Dave starts claiming that he didn't know what this place was but that we'd probably better act like we belong here so that we didn't stir up any trouble. I automatically get a grim feeling because he had no problem shelling out the money for us to come down there. And for someone who didn't know what this place was, the bartender was quick to bring a Heineken and then ask if his friends wanted anything, in which he ordered us each one as well. After they gave us our drinks, Dave told us we should go downstairs so that we could talk without looking suspicious. Of course, Carrie and I had already been questioning the prostitutes about how much they like their jobs and everything, so I'm pretty sure there isn't much else we could have done to point out we were newcomers. Whenever we went downstairs, he sat us at a table and the man came down after him and kept trying to talk to him. He told the man he was talking to his family and he didn't even know him. The guy sauntered away exclaiming, Fine, if that's how you want to be about it, we can talk later. I should also mention that David told us that he was born and raised in Dublin, so I found it hard to believe that he had no idea where he was taking us when he brought us here. So at this point, in my overactive imagination, I'm 97% sure that we're going to be sold into sex slavery and this is the end for us. But I sit there and listen to him ask my friend a bunch of weird questions, which include, is there anyone waiting for you back home? which she takes to mean, do you have a boyfriend? And she launches into that whole story. Meanwhile, I'm getting up to pee every once in a while and dumping my drink down the sink because I don't trust this man or this place. Eventually, as the conversation gets weirder, I pull out my phone and start texting one of my friends back home. All of a sudden, Dave starts paying more attention to me, asking me what I'm doing and telling me that I should put my phone away before I get into trouble, and that I shouldn't be on it anyway when I'm supposed to be on vacation. When I didn't put my phone away like he told me to, he asked who was so important that I was talking to right now anyway. Everyone at home should be working by now. I told him, oh, I'm just texting my boyfriend, to which Carrie starts to say I don't have a boyfriend. I play it off like she just forgot that Andrew and I got back together right before we left. He commented, what do you need to text your boyfriend for right now? And he sounded like he was kind of angry. Now, I may have just underestimated our situation. It could be that he was really afraid we would get beat up or something for me having my phone out, but there was no signs that said, no phone, 
and no one had said anything to me about it while we were upstairs, so I felt like he was acting this way for a whole different reason. He'd also said, you're not taking any pictures of me now, are you? So I told him that the reason I was texting my boyfriend was because I'd given him my iCloud information before we left, and a list of places we were staying and what nights, because I knew it wasn't safe for decent looking American women to be traveling alone with no idea what they were getting themselves into. And he'd messaged me because he noticed that my GPS didn't show me back at our apartment yet and that he wanted to make sure we were okay. I didn't feel bad. After telling him that, he was fairly quick to get us out of there, saying we'd been there long enough, and it wouldn't look funny if we went ahead and left now. He then asked if he could walk us back to the apartment, to which I say we're fine, but Carrie told him that would just be peachy, and so he walked us to our flat. Now, thankfully we'd rented a place that had a gate, that you have to unlock before entering the area where the doors to the rooms are, and ours was on the second floor. We reached the outside of the building. Dave is trying to talk Carrie into letting him take us on a drive around Ireland, and then taking us back to the apartment, but earlier he said he walks everywhere or takes taxis, and by this time it was almost 3am, so it's not like we would have seen anything in the darkness. So I tell him no, we aren't going on a ride with him right now, but maybe in the morning we could meet up and he could take us. He says that would be a great idea, but he wants to come up to the apartment until we're ready to go. Carrie thinks this sounds okay, but then asks me if it sounds okay because she really isn't sure since she's been drinking. I tell him and her that it probably isn't appropriate since we aren't the only ones staying in there. Dave says that he'll be real quiet, and asks how many other people are in there, and if they're girls too. The whole time he's saying this, I'm trying to shove Carrie through the gate away from Dave, and he's trying to get into the gate, so I tell him we'll meet him at 8am at the bridge for him to take us on our ride, and he says that's too late, we should be gone by 7am. I say okay, we'll meet you at 7am then. He's reluctant to leave the gate, and tries one more time to make it through but I'd wedged my foot into a crevice between where the cement from the outside of the gates came through and met with the stone that made up the floor of the lobby area, and so he couldn't shove me out of the way. Finally, he slips away. I push Carrie up the stairs and told her to go open the apartment door, and here's how you know that I've lived through some stuff, because I'm going right back down to that gate to make sure he didn't slip a rock or something between the gate to prevent it from closing, so that he could try to sneak up to our room somehow later. When I get to the apartment, I'm locking all the doors and checking my window to see him just staring up at where our apartment is. I don't know what he was thinking, but something was off, and he didn't even know what floor we were on, unless Carrie told him whenever I took her daughter back to the flat. We did not meet him in the morning, and I hope we never meet again. I still have the pictures we snapped of him. I love going on late night drives. There's something about the empty road and the night air that just really chimes with me. I don't need to have a particular destination in mind, I just need gas in the tank. One night, not that long ago, I was out on one of my drives. i just come off the highway, I decided to drive up to a high point I knew of in the mountains. I figured that the view from up there would be pretty perfect. I planned on having a smoke and playing some tunes, and then heading home. I live out in the sticks by the way, it's not that uncommon for me to use mountain roads often. I was driving through some of these winding and narrow roads heading up the mountain, the type of roads which are sided by nothing but thick forest. I went over something, I don't know what it was, but shortly after I drove over it, my car started to make strange noises, there was like a hissing sound. I realized what had just happened, I must have driven over a nail or something because it sounded like I had a flat tire. 
There happened to be a little kind of rest area up ahead, so I decided to pull in and take a look. I was really annoyed. I loved my car and I threw most of my money into maintaining it. I had just upgraded my tires and now one had a puncture. The area wasn't big. I guess that it was primarily used as a rest area. You know, maybe for truck drivers with those long overnight drives. There was a restroom and a vending machine there. Since it was really late on a Sunday, no one was out. I had the place to myself. I parked my car and looked at my back tires. I could see the issue. There was a puncture. I was so annoyed. I lit up and just stood there, probably sighing and looking dejected. After the smoke, I decided that I might as well make use of the facilities, so I headed into the bathroom. Once out of there, I looked around. There was nothing but mountains everywhere. It was really quiet out, and I'll be honest, it was a little spooky to be there alone in the dark of night. My cell phone started ringing, and that made me jump out of my skin. I reached into my pocket and pulled it out, and I realized that it wasn't ringing. I was mistaken. Another phone was ringing, and it had the same generic ringtone mine did. It sounded as if the phone was coming from the other side of the little bathroom building. I was scared now. I didn't know if I was alone anymore. I loitered by my car for a while, expecting to see someone come out from behind the building, but no one did. Come to think of it, if there was someone out there, then they must have arrived on foot because there were no cars in the parking lot but mine. I decided to go check the back of the bathroom. I was half wondering if someone was hurt or something. Maybe someone lost their phone. I figured I might as well try and find out. I looked around the corner of the brick wall as stealthily as I could, and I couldn't believe what I saw. Lying on the ground were countless smashed cell phones. One of them was ringing. I thought about the chain of events which had led me to that parking lot and then I ran back to my car as fast as I could. I didn't care about damaging my car. I just pulled out of there as fast as I could. I headed back down the mountain passes and back towards the safety of lights. I chose to drive off for a few reasons, and if they aren't obvious, I will break them down for you. So one, I believe that the flat tire was deliberate. I think that I drove over something that was probably placed in the road, it was placed strategically so that I would have to pull into the rest area to check my car. I think that the rest area is where something terrible happens. I think that the phones were smashed up and thrown there, but whoever had been doing whatever they had been doing with the phones failed to break at least one of them. So that's why there was one ringing. I wonder if one of the victims, and I say victims because I believe something sinister is going on, I wonder if it was one of the victim's friends or family members calling to see where they were. What makes me say this is because I can remember as clear as day that a lot of the phones seemed feminine. They had little stickers or gems. I could tell by some of their cases that they probably belonged to women. Now I think about it, maybe someone was calling to make me pick up the phone. Then when I was distracted, I would have been rushed. I'm not sure but I'm very glad I got out of there without finding out. I reported this to my local police, and they said they would look into it, but I didn't hear back. I really wonder what might have happened if I answered the phone. I don't like thinking about what happened to all those owners of those phones. I have actually prayed once or twice that they just suffered a robbery. When I was in Afghanistan, we were in the mountains right on the Pakistani border. The first few months of deployment were pretty hairy, but as soon as winter rolled around, the fighting season dried up. Things got really quiet. Night shift went from, when are we going to get hit, to, what kind of weird shit am I going to witness tonight? I think it was February or so, and I was out on guard patrol in the north facing machine gun shack. We all had night vision devices, so since it was pitch black, we always wore them on night shifts. Well, I was looking out into the mountains when I see what looks like a guy come crawling out from behind a boulder up the hill. 
about a hundred meters away. Being February, we hadn't gotten hit in almost a month because there was two feet of snow on the ground and the temperatures were hovering right around zero. So the Taliban chucked deuces back to Pakistan and left us alone for the cold months. Now, this guy was on all fours like an animal, just sitting there, half behind a boulder, seemingly staring into my soul. So I pointed the machine gun at him and turned on the visible laser. I put the laser right on his nose and didn't get a reaction. Nothing. The guy just stared at me. So at this point, I'm getting a bit freaked out. I'd been blown up, shot at, almost RPG'd, and now some local is playing fuck fuck games. I radioed into our tactical operations center that there was an unarmed local staring at me on the north post, and I either wanted someone to clear me to wax him or come out and look at what I was seeing. E5 on the radio tells me he's sending a private out to babysit me. Fucking dick. The guy comes out, looks up at the hill at this guy, and promptly nopes out of there. He goes back to the tactical operations center and tells the E5 that there really was a guy just staring at us out on the mountain. So the E5 comes up to the shack, and I point this guy out. I shit you not, as soon as the E5 gets an eye on the local, the guy jumps up, hops up on the boulder, and starts screaming like somebody just dipped him in boiling water. Guard tower at the east corner can now also see the guy, and as soon as the crazy local started howling, East Shack loses about a 30 round burst of 762 out over his head. That shit is allowed when it's dead quiet. The crazy guy jumps off the rock and runs down the mountain screaming the whole way. It was dead quiet the rest of the night, but the commander upped security to 50% meaning half the guys on our outpost had to pull security for the rest of the night. The running joke for the rest of the winter was to be on the lookout for the mind-controlled experiment that the CIA lost track of. It freaked me out. Good for a story, though. I'm an ordinary single woman who will turn 30 this year. I've been thinking a lot about my life and I want to share this terrifying experience. It happened when I was young. When I was young, I lived in a quiet area of northern Kyushu. Ever since, I can remember my dad hasn't been in the picture. It's always just been me and my mom. She wasn't there as often as she could have been, I guess, because she had to work two jobs to keep a roof over our heads and food on the table. This happened in spring when I was in the early years of elementary school. I was on my way home from school. My mother did worry about me getting home by myself at first, but we didn't live all that far from the school. I came home from school as usual, headed into our building. We lived in a block of apartments. I took off my shoes and went inside. I put my school bag down, sat at the table, and started doing my homework. On top of the table was the dinner that my mom had prepared for me. In the morning, mom would head off to work at a nearby toy factory, and then on her lunch break she would come home and make something for my dinner. When she finished work at the factory, she would then head to her second job, working in a restaurant downtown. I was doing my homework. It was really tough. I wish I could have asked mom sometimes for help. It must have been about an hour after I came home from school when I heard something. I heard a man's voice call out. Hello, is someone in here? I looked up to see the dark silhouette of a man stood in our hallway. I always forgot to lock the door at that age. I say silhouette because of the way the sun in the west was behind the man. I couldn't see him clearly. I remember that the first thing that struck me about the man was the fact that he was wearing a white long coat, the kind that doctors wear. The man started speaking before I had the chance to think. Miss, terrible news just terrible news. Your mother, she's collapsed in the factory and she's been taken to hospital. Oh my god, not mom I thought as I raced over to the doctor. I followed him out of the apartment. There was a big rusted black bicycle downstairs just outside of our apartment's lobby. He lifted me up and put me on the child's seat at the back 
and then climbed onto his seat and started pedaling. We rode off under twilight skies. I was looking off to the side, watching the city pass us by. I asked the man, Is mom going to be okay? He didn't reply. I asked again, Nothing. No matter how many times I asked him about mom, he didn't say a word. After a little while, I noticed something. Even though I was young, I thought that something was wrong. I realized that we were going the wrong way. We were heading towards the woods and the mountains, and the hospital was back in the other direction. Hey, mister, I don't think we're going the right way. He didn't say a word in response. I started to panic. I shouted at him. I tried pleading with him. I pretended I didn't care, but nothing I did could make the man talk. Then, a very basic but frightening question rose to the forefront of my mind, and that question was, where are we going? I was becoming more and more frightened by each passing second. All the town roads and sidewalks were behind us now. We were on trails and dirt roads. There were dense rows of trees either side of us. It was darker there too, without the street lights. Why are we going down a dark forest road? The man just kept pedaling. We were not going to stop. I thought this man isn't a friendly man. He's going to hurt me. He wasn't behaving like any adults I knew. He wasn't like mom or my teachers. This guy was strange. In those moments of quiet contemplation, for the first time in my life ever, I thought about death or being killed. I was so scared that I just started to scream as loudly as I could. I wish I had the presence of mind to do it in the town where there were more people and more lights. My scream made the man talk. He spun his head around to me for a second and then said, We will be there soon. No need to scream. I'm a gentleman and I'm kind. He said that weird statement with a look of sheer frustration on his face. I knew that I needed to do something, but it felt like I didn't have many available options. I decided to jump out of the bicycle seat. I then hit the ground really hard and scraped my knees. I staggered to my feet and then ran as fast as I could into the woods. I must have tripped and stumbled a couple of dozen times, but there was no way I was going to stop moving. From behind me, I heard the strange man yell out, Miss, where are you? Tell me and it will all be fine. Your mom is about to die. If you run away from me, then your mother will die. Do you understand? So hurry up and get out here now. He sounded angry at first, and then he went into a more friendly voice, as if he was calling a cat or something. Miss, come on out. It'll be fine. I'll take you to see your mom. Come on. I felt disgusted by him and his voice, but I didn't want mom to die. I wasn't sure if I should have gone back to the man or not. He was wearing a doctor's coat. I was wrestling with these thoughts in my mind. I was really torn. But then I reminded myself that there were no hospitals in the woods, and that made him a liar. And if he was comfortable enough to lie about the hospital, then he could have lied about mom too. I hid behind a really big tree and I just waited until I couldn't hear the man anymore. Apparently, I was found the next morning in a cemetery at the foot of the mountain, which was about three kilometers from my home. I don't know how I managed to get there, but I was walking around in the dark. An old man who came to clean a grave found me hugging my knees to my chest beneath a big tree. I can't remember much of that. I found out that mom didn't collapse. She was fine. She came home from work, and when she found that I wasn't home and that the door wasn't locked, she called the police and reported me missing. I have no idea what happened with the man, but my mom and I have our suspicions. We think that he must have known about my mom's workplace to feed me that lie of her collapsing in the factory. I don't know if there was an arrest. My mom tried to shelter me from replaying that night's events. We don't talk about it. There are a few questions that are left unanswered. What was the purpose of taking me out into the middle of nowhere? I'm not sure I want to know the answer to that one. Even today, when I try to remember that guy's face, I just can't.
so you can imagine how much help I was to the police at the time. I cannot see his face. Everything is dark now. It was a traumatizing event, and one I am lucky to have survived. Back when I was in high school, I would go over to my friend's house and drink. She lived on the outskirts of town. I remember that I would have to walk down dark, unlit forest roads to get home from her place. It was usually fine in the summer, but in the darker months, it was too creepy. I say it was too creepy, but I still walked there and back at least twice a week. It was great to have a place to drink and chat without being disturbed. The walk home was always daunting but thanks to the wonderful power of alcohol, I managed to summon up the courage to hit the road, even when it was pitch black out. She lived down a dark and deserted road, which used to be a popular one. It ceased being popular when the soccer stadium in our town shut down. I think the team moved. It's not important. So I would walk home from my friend's house down this old, desolate road, which was always empty and quiet. One night, in one of the darker months, I heard some voices while I was walking home. I guess that there were about two or three men out there. Well, this is where you will have to forgive my teenage curiosity and stupidity. I wanted to see who those voices belonged to. The reason for this was because there were rumors around town that the forest area near the old stadium was a local haunt for gay people. I was dumb and drunk, so at the time I thought I would take a look to see if the rumors were true. Not the best move on my part, I know. I could blame the booze and say that my drunken state motivated me to go into the woods. I was always a little bolder whenever I was drinking. I knew the woods quite well, so I thought I would go unnoticed. I approached and saw some silhouettes through the gaps in the trees. It looked like one guy was surrounded by other men. The guy in the middle looked as if he was floating. It was the strangest thing. I could see this guy's legs dangling above the ground. Another guy was hugging the legs of this floating guy. I wanted to see what the hell was going on, so I decided to get a little closer. I got close enough for mumbled and half-whispered voices to be heard. I was watching where I was going. I stepped on a dead branch that I thought could take some of my weight, but I was wrong. It snapped. The mumbling voices stopped instantly. There was an awkward silence. I was feeling full of regret and now fear. Why did I have to come down here to see what they were doing? I should have known it was a bad idea. Next, something unexpected happened. I heard a snorting kind of laugh. A nasty laugh. I saw that there were three silhouettes facing towards me now. I prayed that I was hidden in the darkness of the trees. I stood there silently bracing myself to run at any moment. A muffled male voice then said, Oh, you want to be next, huh? That was enough for me. I ran as fast as I could, and I didn't stop until I saw streetlights. I got home without anything further happening, but it was really scary for me. I didn't really understand what one of those guys asked me. That's probably down to my naivety at the time, I guess. I know what it means nowadays, and by the end of this, you will know too. It's not what you're thinking it means though. When I got to class the following day, I noticed crowds of gathered students all chatting away. It didn't take long for me to find out what the topic of discussion was. In fact, several of my friends wanted to tell me the news. Apparently, someone had taken their life in the forest by the old stadium. There were cops all over town now asking people questions. They found a body hanging from a tree in the woods. So, what does that mean? Well, I think I saw the staging of a suicide out there in the woods that night. I think those other men had taken a life, and I saw them setting the scene when I went snooping. This was a long time ago, by the way, back probably when prejudices towards certain lifestyles were accepted. I wondered if the reason that man lost his life was down to the location he was in that night. If that is so, then the question I was asked by those men in the shadows is all the more terrifying. 
I reported what I saw that night anonymously from a phone booth, but I don't think anything was made of it. Why can I say that with confidence? Well, because five more men have taken their lives in those woods over a ten-year period. I wouldn't be surprised if those men all shared something in common. Thankfully, the old stadium was demolished, and the forest area isn't there anymore. I hate to see nature get destroyed for more concrete constructions, but in this case, I feel kind of good about it. My friend and I were in the car, ready to leave for a music festival, when we got notice it was cancelled. We were all ready to go, so we decided to just drive and find somewhere to camp for the weekend instead. We ended up in a sort of summer resort area upstate. It was the end of season, so the place was completely empty. But it was pretty, nice lake and scenery, so we figured we'd stay. There were no pesky families with kids to interfere with the partying we intended to do. The semi-creepy but friendly attendant assigned us to a site, so we drove down to it. We quickly noticed they'd put us in a site that was furthest away from everything, literally on the edge of the woods, surrounded by empty sites, completely isolated. We thought it was weird, but still, it's what we wanted to just drink and smoke in the woods in peace. So we set up camp, then fucked around until it got dark. As soon as we settled down in the tent and put out the lantern, we heard an unmistakable sound, off to the left of us, where there was nothing but empty campsites, maybe a hundred yards away. Someone was slowly and deliberately sharpening an axe or a knife against stone, long, slow, metallic strokes over and over and over. My friend was terrified, but I was laughing, thinking this attendant guy was obviously fucking with us city slickers. She insisted we would have heard him coming and decided to call the check-in booth. He was still there. It was almost half a mile away. There was no way he could have gotten there in time, and we could still hear the sharpening sound, and the attendant guy confirmed there was no one else in the place except us. We ended the night locked in the car, holding a can of bear mace. My friend fell asleep, but I watched and listened all night. Shortly before sunrise, the noise stopped, the sun came up, and there was nobody around anywhere. I still can't explain it. This weekend, I went through the weirdest road trip of my life. So, for a bit of context, I work with my mom, and we fairly often go on long road trips for work. This weekend, we were coming back from a business fair about 14 hours away from where we live. After about one hour on the road, I noticed a blue SUV towing two bikes in front of me. I remember it stood out for me because the bikes were really nice ones. Eventually, this car overtook a truck and it got away from us. After about two more hours, I noticed a car overtaking us, and it just happened to be the same blue SUV with the bikes from before. I even remember my mom asking if we'd seen this car before, and me answering, yeah, he probably stopped for gas or something and we passed him. The thing is, along the next four hours, this happened at least two more times, even though we had stopped ourselves. At this point, I was already thinking it was weird, but this guy must make a lot of peace stops and likes to make back the time by speeding. We were about eight hours in when we got to a point where the road was completely blocked by other cars that had stopped. We assumed that there was some sort of accident in the road ahead, and that had stopped traffic. I didn't have internet to check, but I could still see a map of the area on my phone. So I started to check for alternative roads while my mom left the car to talk to the other drivers. I found out there was an exit from the main road about 200 meters from where we were and that I could use it to go through an alternative road that would take me back to the main one about 5 kilometers ahead. My mom got the same information from a truck driver who said it was a very narrow dirt road, 
too thin for his trunk, but we could probably go through it and skip the accident. She also found out it had been a pretty bad one and that they probably would take a few hours to unblock the road. Knowing this, we decide to drive through the side road to the exit and try to find this alternative path. We also switch seats since I'm better with maps and my mom drives as well. It was already pretty dark at this point, but we had no problem finding this road. The thing is, it was a really bad dirt path, so we had to go pretty slow. We even reached a small wooden bridge that I had to leave the car to check if it was stable, and it was totally deserted. A bit later, we reached a split in the road, and I look back at the map to see which way to take. I find out we should go left, but after taking a second look at the map, I noticed something that made me even more creeped out than I already was. The river we had just crossed was called Rio das Mortes, which is Portuguese for River of the Deaths, and it encountered the main road at the point we estimated the accident to be. I decided not to say anything, and we continued to follow the path until we got back to the main road, where we switched seats back again. At this point, the main road was deserted as well, probably because every single car going in this direction had stopped at the block in the road. After a short while, we started seeing a few ambulances go by in the opposite direction every now and then, which looked normal at first, but it eventually was looking like we'd seen way too many of them for a single accident. They also looked exactly the same, but that is what you expect of ambulances. The main road was also very dark at this point, and it went on without anywhere to stop for much longer than we remembered from our way back to the business fair. Eventually, a car starts to approach behind me, and after a little while it overtakes us, and to make things even weirder, it just happened to be the exact same blue SUV with the bikes. We eventually pass by a big city, and I suggest we should stop somewhere to eat something a bit nicer even though it would make the trip longer, and my mom agrees. All the weird stuff stopped happening after that, but I tried to google the incident when we stopped to eat, and then again a day later at home, and I couldn't find anything about it, which is pretty weird as well. As a crew guy on an off-road racing team in Baja, California, in Mexico, I got to test drive some rigs and trucks, so technically a truck driver. We were driving down south along Sea of Cortez with a buddy at night at this four-hour dirt road to Gonzaga, which is pretty much in the middle of fucking nowhere in the desert, and we see the lights of a car behind coming down fast and now effectively tailing us and the bastard had bar mount headlights on top, or what seemed like it, which are really bright. It's normal that locals and gringos get wasted in the nearest spring breaker town, and then go down this road really fast to test their rigs, since there's no police there. So I try waving him off to get the guy to keep his lights low since he's blinding us, but he isn't slowing down a bit, nor does he turn the lights off, and it's a really dangerous dark road. Finally, near a curb near the shore, I found a spot to bail off the road without crashing, and we see the lights passing by us really fast and going straight to the curve, and we were like, that's it, he's gonna crash down to the sea. But the lights didn't fall and kept going straight into the beach and the sea, and then pitched up abruptly into the night sky and disappeared. We didn't say a word for a minute or so, and then my buddy says, did you see it? And I say, the fucking flying truck. We didn't talk about it anymore, as it simply didn't make sense to talk about it, or with anyone else when we arrived. My friends and I were driving back from a rave in Denver, we take 287 from Fort Collins to Laramie because it's the quickest way home. 287 is a beautiful drive during the day, but empty and sketchy at night, especially during winter. 
I was in the back seat, so I missed this, but I asked my friend, who was in the passenger seat, to tell me the story again. Owl Canyon is a little two-lane detour that I think might have even been unpaved at the time. My friend said there was a car on the side of the road just after Owl Canyon, so rocky-ass cliffs. It was pitch black either side of the road. There was a guy just chilling in the middle of the road in all black, trying to wave us down. We didn't see him till maybe like 20 to 30 feet, and we had to swerve to miss him. I don't know why he wanted us to stop, but I don't think it was for anything good. This would have been around 3 a.m. probably, and like I said, it would be empty out there at that hour. So this is weird. The helper in me is like, maybe he was in trouble, but I'm glad my friends have some street smarts, because if he had some bad intentions or some kind of weapon, we would have been fucked. We were all pretty young at the time, too. This isn't as exciting as some other stories, but I wanted to give some Wyoming flavor to the sub. This state is so big and empty. There's no way there's not some backwards creepy stuff happening all the time. Every weekday, I would wake up early for a morning workout, then head to my job. Generally, I would leave my house around 5.30 because my morning drive took around 25 to 30 minutes, giving me enough time for two hours before I needed to leave before my shift started. Most of my drive was just putting loud music on, trying not to fall asleep, and it being a freeway before 6 a.m., Almost everyone was going at least 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. I drive most of the time on a main interstate before turning off onto a smaller highway, which I would only use for a mile or so. This highway was three lanes on each side. People also drive fast on here, but usually no more than 75 miles. And while you get some unsafe drivers in the morning, most people aren't swerving erratically. This highway runs north to south. An on-ramp from a main street becomes a lane. Then there are two entrances from the freeway I would take every day. One from the eastbound side and one from the westbound side. I hope that makes sense, but basically, I got on from the eastbound side right as three cars were entering from the westbound side. One was some sort of orange sportyish car, and the other two were identical dark gray sedans. I don't remember exactly what make and model they were, but I remember them being fairly uncommon models, not a sedan you'd see a hundred times a day. One was in the front of this orange car, one behind. These guys were going at least 80 miles per hour. The orange car would change lanes, and the car in front would cut him off, while the one behind would change lanes to remain behind him. They kept this up the entire time I was on the highway near them, weaving in and out of cars, not slowing down, before I pulled off at my exit. This could be a complete coincidence and some asshole drivers, but I definitely got the vibe that the driver of the orange car was trying to get away from the gray cars. Maybe it was extreme road rage, or maybe something more sinister. Regardless, I'll never know. I took my dog out for a hike on the Appalachian Trail. I keep her off leash so she can run around and sniff like crazy, but call her back when I see other people. She's incredibly friendly, has never barked or shown her teeth to anyone. She doesn't jump, so it's not a big deal to me if she says hello to someone. So, walking down the trail, I see a guy walking toward us. I call her back, put the leash on, move to the side to let this guy pass. My dog goes nuts. Her hair stands up and she shows her teeth. She growls and barks like never before or since. I've always wondered what she saw in this guy to do that. I assume he's a murderer walking the trail, leaving dead women behind. I went on a mountain hike in Transylvania with a group of friends from school, and way up, 
after maybe 12 to 14 kilometers of trekking, we saw a house. It was in the middle of nowhere. It had a barn with a few animals, a couple cows, chickens, and whatever else. As we got closer, we see a few people. A guy and five to six women. I'm not sure if there were more inside. The guy comes to greet us, barely speaking the language. We had a hard time understanding what he was saying. They lived without electricity, gas, or anything. This is in the early 90s, so there's no internet or mobile phones to worry about, at least for most people. Anyway, they all looked weird, kinda dumb expressions on their faces. We can barely understand each other. They asked us who the president was then, and if we wanted some milk. They look at our clothes and shoes weirdly and curiously. Who knows when the last time they had human contact was, or maybe there were more crazies around those parts, I don't know. I'm not sure to this day what was going on. It's not typical in the region, so we kind of freaked out, especially because this guy looked a bit disturbed and we were too young. We were looking around to see if there were more of them. Paranoia was getting to us thinking there must be a village nearby. What was also weird is that all the women kept their distance and never got close to us. It was like he was guarding them or checking us out if it was safe for them. One of my friends kept saying we don't want their milk and we just need to go because it's getting dark. We walked calmly for a while and when we thought we were out of their sight, we bolted out of there like crazy. Needless to say, we camped after a few hours, and we always had one person awake to keep watch. We told people that were living in the villages near that area about the mountain people, and they didn't believe us. They said nobody lives up there in the mountains. This happened when I was about 14 to 15 and often stayed over at my cousin and her husband's house. Their names were Skylar and Josh. I'd been staying at their house for a week straight prior to the incident with no issues in a neighborhood that was pretty rapidly expanding. You know, those monochrome suburban nightmare cul-de-sacs. There were tons of half-finished houses lining the far end of the neighborhood. I feel this information's pretty important. Anyways... Josh and I are avid movie watchers and stayed up late most nights watching whatever looked good. That night, Skylar went to bed early and we stayed up to watch Would You Rather, then Ridiculous 6. For some semi-important context, Josh is a smoker and goes out to the back patio for a cigarette every so often, especially at night when he takes their beagle, Banjo, out to pee. I end up sleeping through the movie on one of their two couches. At some point, I keep hearing Banjo whooping and hollering in the playroom, then again in the kitchen, then the playroom, and so on and so forth. The dog's going apeshit in literally every room on the first floor, but he's a clingy dog that hated when Skylar and Josh shut him out of their room, so I figured he was just whining. He's also a beagle, so we're used to him being vocal. In hindsight, I probably should have wondered why he was running from room to room though. Whatever. I try to sleep through it. After a good while of Banjo flipping his shit in what I think is the kitchen, he goes kind of quiet, but he wakes me up again growling at the window right next to the couch I'm sleeping on. The dog won't be still. I still don't get up. I fall back asleep for a bit. Then out of nowhere, he jumps on the couch right on my stomach and again starts losing his shit, barking and howling. That wasn't what woke me up, though. It was the light shining from outside the window, right in my face. I wasn't scared at first, more confused than anything, since my eyes haven't adjusted at this point. Then the flashlight shines up, right on this man's face, and he looks identical to Josh. Could have been twins. He's crouched down with his face almost right up on the glass, and when I see him, I jump really hard. I don't remember if I screamed, but the man starts laughing at me, and I can hear it from the other side of the window. However, because I'm big stupid, 
I assume it's Josh on a smoke break just trying to spook me. I start walking upstairs and I pass by their kitchen clock. It was like 4am. I didn't even put two and two together that Josh has no reason to be outside and awake at this hour. I'm so groggy, but also unnerved at this point, so I go sleep on the upstairs hallway floor. I didn't go alert Skylar of what just happened, mostly because she's cranky when you wake her up, and I was still more willing to accept the idea that it was Josh being an idiot on a smoke break rather than some maniac scoping out the house. The next afternoon, I bring it up to them, and they sort of write it off, ask me if I'm sure I wasn't dreaming and whatnot but they did say they heard the dog going wild. I check outside where the window is to see if the man dropped any evidence of him being there, and I kind of wanted to vomit. The tall grass along the house was pressed down like someone was on their knees. I don't even want to know how long the man was sitting there for the grass to have been pressed down still, but I have a feeling it was pretty long because Banjo sat by that window for a hot minute and the flashlight is the only thing that woke me up. I'm glad I saw the grass though, because it felt like such a fever dream. Sometimes I still wonder if it happened, but I know it did. My theory is that some squatter in those unfinished houses was either bored or on something and decided to go on an adventure. But yeah, I would have absolutely gotten my shit rocked in a horror movie at that age. It was over 10 years ago now when a friend and I visited Japan. It was our first time there, so we went with a tour company. However, after the tour ended, we stayed an extra night in a hotel in East Ikebukuro. During the tour, the tour leader told us stories of haunted hotels and other urban myths. One of the things he'd tell us was to be wary if you find a room where the head of the bed was positioned next to the window. He tried to scare us by saying in those rooms, Ghosts would come through the window at night and drag you out to your death. Back to the East Ikebukuro Hotel. We check in in the early evening and the first thing we notice is how small the room was. The second thing was they gave us a double bed instead of two singles. The third, the bed head was right next to the window. We rationalized that the room was too small really to align the bed any other way and the tour leader was full of shit. To be honest, we were more annoyed that we had to share a double bed. We decided to let it go since it was just for one night. So we went out for dinner before turning in for the night. That night, I get woken up by a door slamming shut and I jolt up. There, sitting at the foot of the bed, is a woman in a blue kimono. She had long hair and from what I could make out, her kimono had butterflies on it. I freak out, dive, and bury my head under my pillow. I remember thinking, is this real? How can I check without looking? In my genius, I decided to shuffle my foot down the bed, thinking if I don't touch anything, it's just my imagination. Little by little, my foot moves down the bed when I notice that there's definitely a depression at the foot of the bed. Someone or something was there. I retreat my foot, start to sweat, and at this point, just start repeatedly saying the Lord's Prayer till I must have fainted or fallen back asleep. I remember waking up at six the next morning and my friend was already dressed and packed. I asked him if he saw or heard anything last night and all he says is, I don't want to talk about it. Let's check out. I was backpacking through Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina with my dog. Just the two of us and we were exploring the woods around Little Lost Cove open orienteering style so we were not on an established trail. We'd been hiking throughout the day following a creek and toward the evening, I noticed my dog was acting abnormally. She was very much caught in a scent of something and wouldn't ease up. 
This continued for about two hours before we made camp. That night in camp, she remained on edge and staring off into the wood line. I went about camp business as usual. Then, at around midnight, I got this prickle like I was being watched intently. I let the feeling ride for a bit and kept tinkering with the fire. Then I heard the brush rustle. I got up from the fire and shone my flashlight up in the hillside. A figure on all fours just managed to escape the beam. All but the tail. It was a tale I knew was not supposed to still exist in the southern Appalachians. I cast my light again across the hillside, and this time I caught its eyes. Two glowing yellow orbs, just watching and waiting. At this point, I went into a fury, grabbed my tomahawk, and charged up the hill after the beast, screaming curses all the while. The watcher ran off but neither I nor the dog slept that night. The following morning we left camp at first light and began hiking up the mountain to the ridgeline which would lead us out. Atop the ridgeline in the fresh mud were a series of tracks, tracks left by an animal that officially no longer exists in the eastern U.S. They were catamount tracks. They commonly go by cougars in the east, but we'd been stalked by a mountain lion just the same. Those tracks ran across the ridge, revealing that it had been watching and stalking us throughout the previous day as we hiked through the creek bed below. They weren't bobcat tracks, I know that. They were way too big, and those eyes I saw were too. I truly believe that if my dog hadn't given me red flags, I would have been mauled that night. It remains one of my personal scariest experiences ever. The other night around 10, I stopped by a liquor store with my friend. We pulled into the parking lot and noticed a black truck to the left of my car, with a man who appeared to be sitting in it, not doing anything. My friend waited in the car and I went in to make my purchase. Everything in the store was fine. I grabbed what I wanted, then the hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I could feel someone watching me. I turned slowly, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw the truck guy standing at the refrigerator with nothing in his hands. He was just standing there, watching me. I'm used to this kind of behavior, honestly. It takes a lot to bother me, so I shrugged it off and walked towards him to get to the register and briefly make eye contact with him, and the look in his eyes changes immediately, and he lunges towards me. I stop, fast, look up in disbelief at him. He makes some quick, awkward apology and laughs. I just kind of shake my head and begin to start walking when he does it again. At this point, I'm holding onto the bottle I want to buy, ready to defend myself with it. I give him a, are you serious right now, look and walk up to the register. The truck guy follows. There's one person in front of me, and the truck guy doesn't understand or care about the typical personal space bubble. I'm actually anxious at this point. I can almost feel him breathing on me, and I'm regretting my choice of clothing. The dress I have on doesn't cover much. I haven't been worried about my clothing choice in a decade, but this guy's making me uncomfortable. I should have left the store then, I make my purchase, leave the store, and quickly tell my friend about the encounter and say, I want to get the hell out of here. The truck guy must have been quick in the store because as soon as I'm turning my car on, he's already in his and still staring me down. As I take a right turn to leave the parking lot, I see in my rear view that he's got his right blinker on too. We leave and this guy proceeds to follow us. Not down just one, but several streets. Both my friend and I are freaked out at this point. After 15 minutes of driving with him following us, my friend tells me to pull over and let him pass. Anxiety peaks as he pulls over behind us. I have no clue what to do at this point. I don't want him to follow me home. My friend is angry as hell and steps out of the car, just stands there and stares at the guy. 
After a few minutes, fortunately he drives off. I don't think he knew I had a guy with me. I waited a few minutes to calm down before heading home. Nothing has shaken me quite like that, not in a long time. I won't be going to that store or town any time soon. This is kind of a long story, but details are important. My boyfriend and I went backpacking in the mountains. I had been camping before, but only car camping, and I never had to carry my bag for long, if at all. So this was my first time actually backpacking. After getting lost, trying to find a parking lot the map swore was there, we drove around the mountain and finally found a parking lot at the top. We planned to walk up the mountain, camp, and then walk back down the following day, but walking down at first was okay too. About an hour in, it's maybe 6pm, and we come across this guy sitting off to the side of the trail, cooking in a cheap oil stove. He asks if we know where we're at, and if we can point him in the direction of a certain place on the mountain, and says he was parked there. He continues talking about how he had a friend drop him off who was going to pick him up at point A, and then changed the story to he was parked at point B, and then said the friend who dropped him off went to hike somewhere else, and another friend who had the map turned back at point C to wait in the car. We finally bid this guy good luck and continue down this trail. The trail is poorly marked and doesn't correspond with the map we found online, so we were really confused when we come to a horse trail with no markings to tell us if we're still on the right path. We decide to go down the trail and see if we can find a place to camp for the night and find our way out in the morning. Both sides of the trail are lined with barbed wire, preventing us from being able to camp there. Eventually, we decide to turn back and go back to the trail before it turns into a horse trail. That way we can camp there for the night because it was really dark. About 20 feet behind us was the man from earlier. He talked to us again. And through the conversation, we learned he had heavy narcotics, including fentanyl and one other I don't remember the name of. So we took off, deciding to go back to the car and just drive home. We live four hours away and we're about six miles from the car, so we take off up the trail as fast as we could. I got severely dehydrated on the way and was struggling. Finally, we got to the car and drove home. On the way out of the park, we saw a sign saying hitchhikers may be escaped convicts. So this happened a long time ago, but I've never forgotten it, as it was one of the strangest encounters my family and I have ever had. One time as a child, I went with my family to the grocery store. It was our monthly trip to stock up on groceries, so we were going to be there for a while. I was about 12 at the time, so by that age I had a good understanding of how to read people. We started in the produce aisle, and suddenly a strange man caught my eye. He was standing awkwardly close to us, sort of fake browsing the vegetables. His body language seemed off. He was standing with his back to us, but something seemed strange about the way he was positioned. As we slowly moved down the aisle, he would slowly rotate so his back was always facing us. As we got a little closer, I could tell he was wearing those see-behind sunglasses. Those gimmick sunglasses that have hidden mirrors on the inside of the lenses so you can see behind yourself. He had a dirty grey zip-up jacket on and long, dark, messy hair. He had to be in his 40s. Our shopping went on, and wherever we went, I would see him standing there staring at me from across the store. He would keep his distance from us, but he was always with an eyesight no matter where we were in the store. About 30 minutes in, my mom still hadn't noticed it, but he was starting to really creep me out. My mom didn't believe me at first. Eventually, we got to the refrigerator aisles, and this is when it got weird. Whatever aisle we were in, 
he would quickly pace past us occasionally. At this point, he wasn't even trying to look like he was shopping. My mom and sister were starting to notice this and also seemed concerned. At one point we were grabbing something off one of the shelves, and I could see him just standing on the opposite aisle, peeking through the shelves at us. His sunglasses were still on, but now his hood was up. We started to walk faster and do some random zigzags around the store to see if he was really following us and try to lose him, but he would keep up, all in a very sneaky way at that. He would always be at the opposite end of the aisle, but he kept up with us the whole time. By this point, my mom was concerned, so we pushed the cart up to the customer service area to talk to a manager about it. By this time, we lost him. We informed the manager, and she was very helpful. She actually went to go find the guy and talk to him. We waited at the counter until she came back to us with a confused look on her face. She walked up to my mother and told us, He said, You're his mom. My mother and sister were concerned. The manager rang us up and said we should leave, and then they will escort the strange man. We walked out to the car, staying close to our mother, when we were met with a horrible sight. The man standing across the parking lot with his head slightly tilted and a big grin on his face. We floored it out of there, but we could still see him just standing there, watching us leave. My story takes place in a small countryside in the south. As I tell you this story, it has now been two years since it happened. I was 13 years old. One evening, my parents decided to go have dinner at a friend's house, but I preferred to stay home. It was a Friday night, and I was tired. It's actually quite common for my parents to leave me alone at home in the evening, because I rarely go with them when they go out to eat or to parties. So... I'm used to being alone at night. I must admit that I often have this feeling of being watched when I'm home alone, whether it's day or night, but I always thought it was just paranoia, until that night. So, we're at the infamous night when my parents go to dinner at a friend's house and leave me alone. I'm watching TV on the couch with my cat, and then I decide to go back to my room to be on my phone. After several minutes... I hear noises coming from the kitchen, but that is common, but once again, I chalk it up to fatigue and stress. Then, a little later, I hear what sounds like glass being placed on the dining table. The stress becomes more and more intense, and I do the dumbest thing to do in those moments. I went to see, and there was indeed a glass on the dining table. It couldn't have been me because I always have a bottle in my room and I only drink from it. The stress rises even more, but at the same time, I prefer to stay in denial and tell myself that I left the glass on the table while clearing it. As I'm about to return to my room, I hear something scratching behind the garage door. I'm about to open it, thinking it's my cat wanting to come in, but I freeze when I reach for the handle, and I remember that my cat was on the couch with me earlier. So... I turn my head to check if he's still there, and unfortunately he is, and so is my dog. At that moment, I'm genuinely worried, and I rush back to my room, but on the way back, I notice that my parents' bedroom window and the bathroom window are wide open. I didn't know what to do, so I locked myself in my room with my cat and dog and scrolled through TikTok, trying to forget about this incident. When my parents came back, I acted as if nothing had happened. I don't really know why, but currently, no one knows about this story. One of the creepiest events in my own experience that I can recall happened when I was about 9 years old. It was late 1978 or early 1979, if I'm not mistaken, which would have put me in fourth grade at the time. Just a bit of background information on my school here. It was a newer school for my district at the time, 
and I guess is an experiment in innovative architecture. The school had no square angles in the walls at all. Rather, for simplicity's sake, imagine a U-shape where the opening of the U faces onto the parking lot, but where there were hexagons attached to the outer edge of the U. Each of those hexagons was called a pod, and each of those pods was divided into six classrooms and one central area for that pod, from which a person could see into any of the six classrooms at one time. The playground was the entire area outside the U-shaped collection of pods, first being blacktop and then, further out, grassy field. Critically, this meant that, if you were very close to the pods, it was possible for someone else, also close to the pods, to be within 20 feet of you and still be hidden around the bend of the wall. So, on this day in 1978 or 1979, My school had open house parent-teacher conferences. This was when parents were welcome to come to the school and talk with one another, and especially with their children's teachers, and to see how their child or children were performing in school. My mom never missed one of these, and this day was no exception. We went to the school and saw all the teachers and kids and parents gathered in the cafeteria. After whatever general address the principal had to make, Everyone went their separate ways to meet one-on-one. My mom had teachers to meet for two children, for me and my older brother, who was one year ahead of me. When we met my teacher, Mrs. H, my mom brought me and my brother into the classroom. She apparently had good things to say about me, and we were done quickly. But when we met my older brother's teacher, Mr. C, for some reason, my mom told me to go out onto the playground and play. My brother remained in the classroom with my mom and his teacher. It was still light outside, so all seemed okay. However, by this time, an hour or more had probably passed since the principal's speech ended. Any parents who attended only for that or who only wanted to meet a single teacher briefly had done so by now and left. The playground area was devoid of people. The naive little boy that I was... I just walked around the pods like I was in my own house. I stayed close to the outer wall of the pod for no real reason. All of a sudden, without hearing or seeing anything to prepare me for what was about to happen, I was pinched across the back of the neck very hard. The hand that held me seemed too strong for me to break away. I didn't even have time to try before a voice whispered in my ear to stay still and not turn around. I nodded as best as I could. The voice told me to walk, and it led me around the pot to within sight of the parking lot, where a few cars remained. The voice asked me if I saw the green car, the station wagon with wooden paneling on it. I did, and indicated so. The voice told me, walk to that car, get inside, and wait there. Do not turn around, I will be right behind you, and if you turn around, I will know you did. Do you understand me? All the while, the owner of the hand and the harsh whisper squeezed my neck harder at intervals to add emphasis to certain points. The person then sent me walking to the car. I think I know how the condemned, dead man walking must feel. I was a naive boy, but not so naive as to believe getting in that car was a good idea. On the other hand, I felt sure that turning around was death if the owner of that voice was really still there. I'd gotten halfway to the car when I wound up freezing, unsure what to do. I just stood there, crying, which was already an improvement over the extremity of fear that preceded it. I don't know if I stood there seconds or minutes, but eventually I turned around. Nobody was there. I figured they were back around the park peeking and waiting, but my mom was that direction also, so I swung way out into the playground area and walked carefully back around. Somewhere near where I was originally pinched were two boys a year ahead of me, my older brother's age, playing marbles, Roger and another boy whose name I never knew. I avoided them, feeling sure they, Roger in particular, were probably the ones who had pinched me but I'm sure at some point they noticed me passing them at a distance. 
they did not react at all. In fact, my brother talked about Roger much later by chance, in terms that caused me to believe that he was a nice guy. It's probably as important. Later reflection led me to consider the whispered voice and the powerful hand to most likely have belonged to an adult male, not to a fellow child. But why did that fool want me in Mr. C's car? Mr. C was in a conference with my mom, so it was not his doing. My only other guess was my third grade teacher, Mr. S, who had once grabbed me violently when I got up from my chair in class without permission while he was in a bad mood. That guy was eventually arrested in 1980 on suspicion of touching four boys earlier the same year a year after my traumatic experience on the playground. I'll never know for sure, but I will always wonder who it was. When I was 18, I worked at a local Target. This was when we used to have a wall next to the register of Pokemon, baseball, and collectible cards, and that kind of thing, and a Starbucks in front of the register by the front doors. Well, one day I was filling this wall with more cards, and an awkward tall man came up and started looking at the Pokemon section next to me. He asked, Do you like Pokemon? And I said yes, which then led to us talking about Pokemon. I didn't think anything of it. He picked some, checked out, and left. Three days later, he returns to the store, finds me, and buys me candy and tells me to have a nice day. So things start escalating. He would come in frequently looking for me, started sitting at the Starbucks tables and watching me while I worked. Then eventually, he started buying me more candy, Starbucks drinks, flowers, and then little girl accessories, which of course I'm freaked out now. I tried telling my bosses. They couldn't do anything about it. I called the cops and they couldn't do anything either. He followed me to the back room one day, since I started leaving the registers whenever he came into the store. And that's when we were able to call the cops, because he finally cornered me in the back room. But thankfully our stockroom guys were back there to basically save me. We were able to get a restraining order on him for the store, so he couldn't enter anymore but that's when he started waiting outside for me, following me to my car and leaving notes on my vehicle for me to come out to. It was terrifying, and my mom knew, but again, we couldn't do anything. One day, he actually followed me from my work to my mother's house, where I lived at the time. He stood outside the house, singing love songs and reading poems he wrote me, loudly. My mother called the cops, we kept telling him to leave, and when the cops finally got there, we were able to get him to go away. But now he started to leave notes at my house, he sent me letters and packages with adult content, sexy outfits, girly panties, and other weird things. During all of this, my mom and I were trying to get a restraining order on him ourselves and charge him for harassment, but it's not like that stopped him. Finally, one night, I was coming home from work. He waited around the corner of my house and attacked me. He grabbed me around my face and dragged me to the ground. I screamed so loud and so much that luckily I had neighbors that came outside and helped me. He got arrested at that point. I had enough evidence saved up to be able to take him to court and he was in jail for 8 years. He was released in 2021. He was a jester in the IV unit. He was stalking another local girl that I connected with so we could help each other out after he got sent away. She was just starting to get his attention, so luckily she never got hurt. I don't want to meet him ever again. I used to work night security at a group residential slash commercial building that had been converted from old factories, old, like 1800s old. Some of the buildings still had a few features from when they were industrial buildings. The basic concept of the buildings were, 
lived slash workspaces for people running photo studios and the like. The first building was commercial only. It was almost always completely empty at night after a certain time. I had this dinosaur of a freight elevator at one end of the building. At the other was a loft that contained the roof hatch. The maintenance guy would sometimes forget to secure it, and on windy nights you could hear it banging around. When it was left open, you could also hear the elevator machinery from the floor below when the elevator was in use. Also, this building is two floors and laid out as more or less a straight line from end to end, so no one can come or go on the floor that I'm on without my noticing. One night, shortly after I'd started working there, I was on a foot patrol of this building and was at the loft at the end, and I could hear the roof hatch door banging and the bus of the freight elevator machinery starting up. After my heart attack, I went to check the far end of the building to see what was up. There's no one there, but the elevator has moved between floors. No one came out of any of the commercial spaces on the second floor to call the elevator up there. I would have heard them opening and closing their door and moving in the hallway. Also, there's nowhere to go because it's a straight line, except for the elevator that is around the corner. It can't be someone on the first floor fucking with me, because there's a call button on each floor, but no way to control the elevator from the outside other than that. In order to control the elevator, you have to be inside. So, I would have either seen them in the hall or found them standing in the elevator. Also, this particular elevator is one of those really old manual style ones, where you would have to open and close the doors by hand, and it's difficult to do quietly. The elevator doesn't move at all unless the doors are closed. The last time I'd seen that elevator, it had been on the first floor, with the doors open. This story is unfortunately true. I grew up in the Sierra Nevadas. I wasn't big on camping, but spent a good chunk of my childhood weekends hiking with family and friends. The summer that I was 16, about 10 years ago now, my cousin C had come back from her first year of college and her boyfriend Jay was visiting. Jay wanted to go on a hike with lake views, and C and I knew just the one. It was one of our favorites. The three of us set off on this hike. The trail isn't the easiest to find, but it's really popular with locals because of the view and general lack of tourists. We saw a couple of other hikers, some with dogs. It is an in and out trail that takes about two to three hours to the top and two to three hours back down. There are some smaller trails that branch off. We make it to the top in good time and enjoy our lunches overlooking the lake. After about an hour, we hear a scream in the distance, specifically a mountain lion scream. If you've never heard a mountain lion scream, it's really unnerving. It sounds a bit like a very loud, terrified woman screaming. This is not good, because when a mountain lion screams, it's part of a mating ritual. That means there are multiple mountain lions, and close. The bears in the Sierras are softies, but mountain lions will attack you. They'll attack your pets. They've even been known to attack bikers. Jay was really freaked out. C and I were wary, but it wasn't the first time we'd heard mountain lions, and we'd both seen them before. There was also an incident where, as kids, we laid out some expensive stake in my backyard in hopes of luring a mountain lion to take pictures of it. It didn't work, and my mother was unhappy about the stakes. C and I tell Jay that we need to pick it up and get back down the mountain. About 40 minutes into the hike back, Jay realized that he forgot his phone at the lookout in his rush to leave. Of course. We decided that C and Jay would hike back up to retrieve his phone, and I would stay there, on the trail to warn any other potential hikers that there are lions in the area. This is obviously not ideal for any of us, but it seemed like the best choice at the time. I found a nice rock to sit on by the trail and was going through the pictures we took. C and J had been gone for around 50 minutes when I heard the scream again. And it's hard to tell, but I think it's closer than before. 
I start to freak out, because being alone is not good if the lion is nearby. About 20 minutes after that, I hear the scream again, and there is now zero doubt that it's closer. Logically, I know that lions don't scream when they're hunting, they are quiet. If a lion was hunting me, I wouldn't know it. That knowledge did not make me less scared. A couple minutes after that, I hear it again, extremely close by. And I'm looking around and trying to find the best place for me to stand, back covered, in case of the worst. Suddenly, I see something out of the corner of my eye, standing still, 20 feet down the trail, a couple feet off of it, is a man. He's completely naked, he's filthy, he's skinny and he's just standing there looking at me. If you don't know where you're going, it's easy to get lost in the woods around there, and it doesn't take long being alone, lacking food and water in the wilderness to make people a little disorientated, a little crazy. My immediate response is that this man is probably a lost hiker, and judging by how dirty he was, he'd been lost a long time. He needs help. I started walking towards him, asking if he's okay. I suddenly get this feeling of wrongness. I don't know how else to describe it, but the hair stood up on my neck. I stopped in my tracks, maybe 15 feet away now, and had the overwhelming urge to run. It seemed wrong. He looked wrong in a way I can't quite articulate. Instead of wanting to help, I'm now scared. I ask again if he's okay. He looks at me and opens his mouth wide and screams, not a normal scream. He screamed so loudly. Worse, it sounded just like the mountain lion. It occurred to me that we were probably hearing him the whole time. It was the single most terrifying thing I have ever witnessed. I started screaming too. Why was he just standing there screaming? Do I run? Do I get out the bear mace? Suddenly, he closed his mouth, turned around, and ran into the woods very quickly. He disappeared into the trees, but the feeling of wrongness was still with me. I considered bolting down the trail, but decided to wait for C and J, who luckily arrived within 10 or 15 minutes. I told them what happened and we decided to call it in to the rangers when we got service. I've always been left with the unsettling question, did I see a mentally ill lost hiker who really needed my help, or did I see something else, something not human, mimicking the call of a mountain lion and stalking us down the mountain? It was about 10 p.m. and I was staying at a hotel in downtown Chicago, right by Lower Wacker Drive. I had just gotten a new Eats delivery because they weren't doing room service because of the pandemic. Pot bellies, it's important for later. I was listening to music, but I had my hood up because it was freezing. I was smoking and this guy walked up to me and asked for a few cigarettes. I gave him one and my lighter to use. Come on, you can give me more than that. I thought if I just gave him another cigarette, he'd just leave, so I gave him another one. I expected him to say thank you, give my lighter back, and leave. He didn't do any of those things. He was standing right in front of me, and I started to get anxious. I moved back, and I'm essentially against the window for the area where you check in. He just kept standing there, and then he noticed my bag of food. Can I have some of your food? I told him I was sorry that it was just a sandwich and soup because my husband ordered food from a different restaurant. Well, at least give me half the sandwich then. I apologized again and said no. Then he started getting closer to me. I realized that I needed to get away, but he blocked me. Dude, give me my lighter back. I thought I needed to pretend I wasn't freaking out. I put out my cigarette and put it back in the pack. I don't have any food and I could freeze to death, he said to me. I'm sorry you don't have food. I don't know what else to say. 
I didn't want to say, hey, you're wearing a really nice looking coat and fancy sneakers, so give me some of your food then. He was right up in my face, and I was scared because he seemed to be getting more angry. I'm sorry, I can't. Please move. Yes, you fucking can. At this point, I was terrified he was going to hit me or something. So I banged on the window, and the people at the check-in desk ignored me. He got really angry. What the fuck, bitch? Then, like a miracle, my mom called and I answered. I started crying hysterically, and I started saying, Mom, Mom, thank God, oh my God, this guy won't leave me alone. My mom told me to do anything to get away. At that moment, the guy stepped back and looked around. There was no one around, but I took advantage of him being distracted and pushed past him and ran inside. I was crying so hard I could barely get words out. I was so scared and I realized it was because I tried to get help and nothing happened. If my mom hadn't called, I don't know what would have happened. Later, I thought even if I gave him the soup, it would be like when I gave him a cigarette and it wasn't enough. I did go back down for a cigarette later, but I stayed by the revolving door. This woman was also smoking when I told her what happened. She showed me her mace and said all women should have it. My mom passed away February 13th, 2023. This happened a year or more before that. In my second to last year of secondary school, I was fortunate enough to participate in a volunteer program in East Africa over my summer holidays. The idea was we'd spend a month constructing new classrooms for a struggling school on the coast of Kenya, south of Mombasa, and then work in a safari park before crossing over to Tanzania for an actual safari in Ngorongoro Crater, and then top it off with an ascent of Mount Kilimanjaro. This wasn't free, by the way. I'd signed up to it a year before and had to participate in loads of fundraising events to make it happen. We had two teachers accompany us on the trip. Mr. F, who was a no-nonsense former Royal Marine Commando, as well as Mr. B, who was an absolute legend. Mr. F's girlfriend also joined us. She wasn't a teacher, but she had first aid qualifications. Mr. F utterly despised me and my friends who were, embarrassingly, the skater-slash-stoner contingent of the school, with long hair, banties, the works. To him, we were useless pinheads, and he sent us on all the worst jobs on the construction site. Mr. B was more interested in ordering in crates of Kilimanjaro beer and trading albums with me. I won't digress too much, but giving a band of Masai Mara warriors my CD player later in the trip and watching them do their leaping dances to no effects was awesome. During our free time, we had befriended the local villagers, who enjoyed inviting us to their homes for food and trying to sell us trinkets, cigarettes, and awful-tasting home-brewed coconut wine. Eventually, the most charismatic villager, a fisherman named Saeed, stepped up to the plate and offered us some weed. We bought a stick off of him for about five dollars down in the mangroves, thinking we'd smoke it later when the teachers were asleep, but he insisted on rolling it up, pure, into a single huge spliff, and we hopped in his little boat and he took us on a tour of the mangrove swamp. You like that, he said. Yeah, it's not bad. At home we smoke hash though. Do you get it in Kenya too? I replied. Remember this part, as everything that happened later is contingent on this verbal exchange. During the boat ride, I wasn't feeling much, but then it suddenly hit me as we went back to shore. Pure brain melt, watery bloodshot eyes, insane paranoia. Then the bell rang, summoning us back to the camp. I was not ready. We tried to join up with the rest of the group as inconspicuous as possible, but likely looking as conspicuous as hell. Over the course of lunch, Mr. F kept on giving us weird looks feeding my paranoia even more. Eventually his girlfriend came up to us and said something like, Boys, your eyes look a bit funny. What have you been up to? Cold sweats. It's just hay fever, miss. 
The villagers took us in the long grass, and the pollen got me really bad. It doesn't look like that to me. I better not see you like this again, or you'll be sent home. About half an hour later, two unexpectedly looking nice cars came down the dirt track leading to our camp. I didn't give them much heed, but they pulled up to the gate, and about five or six of the scariest looking guys got out. Chris, can you come to the gate? Some people want to speak to you, someone said, but I don't remember whom. As I was still high, I started to panic again, and the paranoia was back. I walked over to them. I'm not sure how the conversation went, but the scope of this most colossal fuck-up dawned on me. Saeed had totally misunderstood me with his broken English. He had thought I was asking him to send Hash back home, and this was his lucky day, and he could act as a broker for a deal that would set him up for life likely calling someone who called someone else, and so on, until the news had reached some senior guy from Mombasa who'd come down to the camp to strike a deal. And listen, before you jump on me and call me an idiot and tell me not to travel, let's think about this first. In no way is this a reasonable outcome for the conversation I just had. Yeah, fine, smoking on a school trip is never a good idea, but I was in the army cadets for four years and every trip turned into a smoke-up after dark without incident. I think I managed to mumble some sort of feeble excuse like, I'm sorry, I have to go. Then I ran and hid in the toilets and locked the door. About a minute later, I heard Mr. F yell my name. Where the fuck are you, you filthy little druggie? Where is he, boys? He's in the toilet, sir. Silence. Then Mr. F's huge tree trunk arms pounding on the door. You fucking little shit, what have you done? Who are these people? Come out here now. I can't, sir. I'm on the toilet. It's really bad. This was sadly the best thing I could think of. Get the fuck out here now. I can't, sir. It's really bad. You fucking little liar. Open this door. He was trying to shake it off its hinges. I wanted to die. I wanted the ground to open up and swallow me. I was going to get expelled. My parents were going to kill me. My life was effectively over. At this point, Mr. F's girlfriend and Mr. B stepped in, urging him to calm down. Let us talk to him. What happened? Why are these people here? I'm so sorry. I was just talking about weed and he must have gotten the wrong idea. I have no idea how this could have happened. Somehow it was smoothed over. I don't know how, but I stayed in that toilet for hours, fearing shame, mockery, and punishment, when eventually that door was opened. When I came out, the dealers from Mombasa were gone. The teachers had searched all my stuff and found nothing, which had further supported my defense. The rest of the trip passed without incident. I wasn't expelled. My parents weren't called. Mr. F was even nice to me after a few days probably embarrassed about totally flipping out. Sure, there were a few jokes, but it was just too surreal to continually feel bad about. Also, I think Mr. B and Miss F had done me a huge favor by calming Mr. F, coming to my defense, and for that, I am forever grateful. This incident occurred back in late 2021. I was serving in the military stationed in California and lived off base at the time. It was around 9 p.m. when I was driving home from work. I pulled into my apartment parking garage and noticed a guy I'd never seen before and he did not live here. He was just standing there leaning against one of the support columns just staring through my windshield. I tried to gauge what his intentions were by giving him the old Midwest, hey, by raising my finger over my steering wheel. I got nothing, just a blank stare right back at me. At this moment, I knew something wasn't right. I tried to weigh the options in my head. I can awkwardly back out of a very small parking garage and do a few laps around the neighborhood. I could call my roommate and tell him to come down. Strength in numbers, you know. Or I can be a tough and brave military man. I decided to stop overthinking it and just deal with it on my own. 
I backed into my parking space, all while guys directly across from my parking spot just staring at me. I again do the Midwest finger wave over the steering wheel with zero reaction from this guy. I grit my teeth and get out of my car and start walking towards the only staircase up to my apartment, which he was standing directly in front of. So I obviously had to walk right past him. I start approaching and say, hey, how's it going? Just to gauge his friendliness one more time and got absolutely nothing. So at this point I'm thinking, I'm gonna either get stabbed in the neck or shot in the back of the head when I pass him, but nothing happened. I realized that I was overthinking it and began to walk up the stairs to my apartment. I get about a quarter of the way up when I hear running behind me. I started to run up the stairs, skipping a few steps and completely eating shit, cutting my hands and bleeding. But at this point, I didn't care at all. I got up and kept going up the stairs and got to my door. This scene was honestly straight out of a horror movie. Me trying to get my key in the door. And when I turn around, I see him running up the stairs. It honestly felt like it was all in slow motion. I thankfully got the key in and was able to get inside the house. But my motor skills were not all there at this point. So I struggled to lock the door. I braced it with my foot while he tried to get in and I was able to lock it. He started messing with the door handle and banging on the door while I went to wake up my roommate. I grabbed my gun from my bedroom and we both went and sat in the living room, waiting. After about a minute of this, we decided to call 911. And in about 3 minutes, around 10 squad cars pull up and search the whole area. The guy was nowhere to be found. While finishing my contract in California, I was paranoid every time I went to the garage. I still don't know what his intentions were, and to this day, that's honestly the part that irks me the most. Okay, so this happened not even an hour ago and I'm still shaking. I'm now safe, thank goodness, but I'm so anxious I can barely type this out. I'm currently staying with my boyfriend and he was having a small get-together. We were having drinks, so once we were out of most of the juice, I decided to go to a nearby store to pick up a few. Now keep in mind, this store is about a three minute walk away, so I had no problem going by myself since I was also the most sober one. Everything on the way there went perfectly fine. I went in, got what I needed, and left. As I was walking out, a man who looked to be in his mid to late thirties was about to walk in, but stopped. I kept walking, and he turned around and said, Hey. I did not respond and kept going on my way. I knew I didn't drop anything, and I had everything I came for, so I did not need to have any other interactions, especially as it was nearly 3am. He then proceeded to start following me, and when he was close enough, he said, You're pretty. I need me a you. I again ignored him and kept walking. He then taps me on the shoulder and asks for my number. I said no and to please leave me alone. He replied with, But you're so pretty, come on. I ignored and walked faster. At this point, I needed to cross the street, so I called my boyfriend and gave him the rundown of what was going on, and he asked for a description of the guy, so I gave it to him. I heard him putting his stuff on in the background. His friend asked where he was going and he said he needed to handle something. He instructed me to walk faster and at this point I was basically run walking. I checked behind me and the guy was still following me. He had made a gesture for me to lower the phone. Now I was just running and out of nowhere I crashed into my boyfriend. By that point I looked behind me and the guy wasn't there anymore. I'm not sure if he was hiding or something, but he was gone. My boyfriend hugged me and asked me where he was. I said I don't know, and he asked me if I wanted him to go check. I said no, just take me back. So he put his arm around me and walked me back home. I'm now sitting in his room, absolutely horrified. He asked me if I was okay. I said I am and that I'm used to this behavior, but I can't help but be terrified. Usually, once I've told them to leave me alone, they will. 
except for a few times, but I can count those encounters with one hand. But this was so scary, the fact that he gestured to me to lower the phone was something that makes me just want to throw up. His friends asked what happened, and their girlfriends came to check up on me once he told them. I'm now sitting with them in the room, and they're comforting me. I don't know why this keeps happening. I'm sick of this. A group of friends and myself rented a place on a lake for just a fun-filled drunken weekend. We were all in our young to mid-twenties, and it was supposed to be just a big party. For the most part, that's what it was. The Friday night and Saturday morning, we pretty much went all out having a blast on the water and just doing fun, stupid stuff. Well, naturally, when Saturday afternoon rolled around, we were all so dead from just going all out. We decided it would be a night of no drinking and just kind of having a chill evening and night. That's what it was, relaxed. So 9pm comes rolling around and about 8 of us were inside the house and 5 outside. The house was a two story with a second story deck slash back porch and it was surrounded by the woods. And then down through the woods you would then hit the lake. I'll mention that we'd already experienced some weird vibes from the locals when we first arrived in town, mostly just backcountry old-timers that I assumed were leering and irritated because we were a bunch of college-aged kids looking to have a good time. But the town and the lake were large, so it's not like anyone knew where we were staying. Anyways, three of my friends were on the upstairs back porch, and my other friend and I were downstairs outside just talking on this little old table near the woods. I mean, it was otherwise just a really nice night. My friend and I were just getting lost in conversation, and all of a sudden there was this weird feeling that encompassed us, like an unnerving physical experience that came from the woods behind us. It was so strong we both kind of quietened down, and then out of nowhere, this loud chanting abruptly came from the woods. I have no idea how far away it was because of the way the lake is set up. I'm pretty sure their voices carried up through the forest. It sounded like a cult chanting away, and all of the voices were male. I mean they were loud and perfectly in sync. I think we were frozen for all of about 20 seconds before I couldn't contain myself and darted towards the house with her following me. I don't know how to explain the feeling that came with that chanting but it was almost evil, like just something so powerfully uninviting. I was shaking by the time we got up to the second story and ran out on the balcony with the other three friends, one of them my brother. By the time we got up there, the chanting was gone, and I naturally asked, Did you guys hear that? In the most shaky, freaked out voice. They all heard it, and not seconds later, the chanting began again. So the five of us are out there, peering into the forest, listening to this chanting that would sometimes sound far away, and then sound relatively close. All male voices in the weirdest language, or I don't even know what it was. It sounded like a strange, extreme church. Then following the chanting, a loud bang like someone hit a huge metal object sounded, and then the worst part came. A man wailing like an extreme pain wailing. All of my hair was up. It was the freakiest experience ever. My brother and I were staring at each other in a mixture of scared excitement and horror. The wailing stopped, and then it was back to the chanting, which eventually died out. I was so freaked out by it, I wanted to call the cops, because whoever screamed had been in a lot of pain. That, mixed with the weird chanting, just made me immediately think of some terrible sacrifice going on. One friend tried to say it had to be some drunk guys just messing around singing and being weird, but there was no way that was coming from some drunk guys. They were perfectly in sync, then the bang, and then the wail of pain. And then all that weird tension and energy was just gone. No, I didn't call the cops, and I wish I would've. 
but honestly, the forest was so large, and since the lake house was up looking down at the woods and lake, it could have been anywhere. It definitely wasn't in our close proximity, but it was close enough to hear all of that perfectly. We went in and got some of the others, but by the time they came out, the chanting had stopped. Someone wanted to go explore and find where it had been coming from, but obviously that was a stupid idea. After that, I was so ready to go home. I can't explain the relief of driving away from there the next morning. Even now, it gives me the worst feeling. Whatever that was, it felt so wrong and evil. I will never forget that moment. I can only imagine it was some weird cult stuff. Context, I was living in the Fiji Islands back in 2016 and I was 14 years old. This story happened to my family, but mainly my mom lived it. It was on the 31st of October and I was at my school for a Halloween based party and my parents and my little sister had gone to a family friend's Halloween party, so the house was empty. My party finished at 9pm and my dad picked me up and dropped off my mom, sister, at the house because our security alarm was ringing. Because nobody was home, my family obviously called the security company over and they sent a van with three security guards. My mom opens the house and lets everyone in. They check the whole house and they see no one. My mother checks all the cupboards and under the bed with my little sister who's only 12 at the time. The security guards go outside in the garden and in the basement to check if anyone has been there and it's not an accidental ring. We don't have any pets. My mom turns on all the lights in the living room and the balcony. She starts to open a window and the gates that protect all the windows to get to the balcony when she looks at the keyhole to put it in and she knows flip flops on the floor. She then looks closer and sees that there's two pairs of legs hiding real close to each other against the wall underneath the garden sofa. My mom yells out of her lungs. They're on the balcony. They're on the balcony. The two guys got scared and jumped off the balcony into the garden. One of the guards grabbed the guy, but the second intruder jumps onto the guard and they run away, jumping over the fence and running into the forest. My mother regrets yelling and that if she would have came down and talked to the security guards quietly, the guys wouldn't have ran and probably would have been caught. My mother is crying and holding my sister to the side and telling her everything will be okay. The security guards then called the police and they did report and describe the guys and started to search for them. The cops were here in about a minute since I live about 100 meters from the closest police station. The guy who jumped lost his hat. There are also flip flops and they left socks to use as gloves and two knives. Also, one of the thieves legit shit in our garden. Sadly, the guys were never found, but two weeks later, my mom pulls out of the driveway, looks in the rear mirror of her car, and sees what she's 90% sure of, the two guys at the opposite house staring at her. The short one had the same new hat, and the other guy had brand new flip-flops. When my mom drove away to the police station, the guys were gone and never to be found again. I got home after with my dad to find my mom and my sister crying. My dad was mad that he didn't stay, but my mom had drank and could not drive. Luckily, my mom saw them before she opened the window. Otherwise, what could have happened? Now, how did the two guys get on the balcony? Well, it's going to sound stupid, but right next to the balcony where they were hiding are like two wooden poles linked with a weird plank. My dad asked the landlord to get rid of it, but the landlord did not want to. To give you more about this pole thingy, me at 15, I could jump and climb onto the balcony because I did it to sneak out of the house to go see my girlfriend at the time. I am now 21 and live in Australia, and even though I did not live this myself, it made me really scared because I was young and now I live alone, 
and have to check the entirety of my house to make sure the house is always locked to the point that I lock myself out of the house way too many times. Years ago, when my grandmother had passed away, we had to go from one side of the U.S. to the other ASAP for the funeral. Well, we got to Oklahoma real late one night, and my folks stopped at the only motel available. I don't remember the name or place, but it was like time forgot it. Some old log cabin buildings, and it had been backed up to a forest that had initially been partly cleared to make the road connect to the interstate. That didn't happen and nature was reclaiming the road slowly. Well, my folks went to sleep, and my brother and I went for a walk down a path that was semi-asphalt and semi-overgrown. It led to a dead end where you could see the highway about a mile away in the dark. We walked about a mile max and smoked a joint on the way. Well, my brother said, time to head back, and we start heading off, and me being a lightweight started chuckling and chatting on the way back. He grabbed my arm as hard as shit and looked in my face serious as fuck. And we kept walking, all the while he was making eye contact with me and darting his eyes to the right and walking quickly but not running. We made it to the clearing at the motel parking area and I walked up to the nearest stairs and jogged up and looked down and saw my brother staring at a humongous white wolf thing. He walked backwards slowly and the thing eventually trotted off like a horse it was that big. It was really mangy and had patches of hair missing, and you could tell it was hungry. We probably made it back just in time. We still talk about it to this day nearly 20 years later. My brother is tough as nails, and I'm dedicated and hardworking, but I'm kind of a pushover in the outdoorsman area. I was 22 and living on my own for the first time when this happened. It was the mid-90s. I had just gotten off of work around 11pm. To reach my apartment building, I could either walk on the sidewalk or cut across this communal garden. I saved about a whole minute of walking time by cutting through the communal garden, but being young and stupid, a lot of times I took the shortcut. That night, I got that weird feeling to not take the shortcut. I kept the sidewalk, but there's no one else around. When I got past the garden, all of a sudden, this large man pops up from its exit path. There was no way he could have been in front of me or just standing behind me as I was walking. I would have noticed him. The only logical explanation was that he'd been hiding in the pitch black garden. A drunk who had been sleeping it off. No. My body was screaming at me to get the hell out of there. I begin walking faster. My dad had taught me to always carry my keys in my fist with a key pointed out in case I needed to punch someone. So I had done that. But I'm 5 foot 4 and probably weighed 110 pounds. This guy was tall and big. My only chance was to outpace him. I'm speed walking at this point and I feel him matching my pace, getting closer. He's breathing heavily. I feel this angry energy coming off of him. But my apartment building is right there, so I put on a burst of speed. When I reach the entrance, two people are leaving and hold the door for me. And him too. I don't know why I didn't tell them I thought this guy was following me. My mind froze and I was just trying to get inside my apartment. Plus, I was still trying to rationalize it. Maybe he was visiting someone in the building. Maybe it was all just a coincidence. Don't be paranoid. Besides, it took only a couple of seconds for them to be out the door. I had missed my chance. I'm climbing the stairs as fast as I can. It's a three-story building and I live on the third floor. He's climbing the stairs too. Still right behind me. I get to my floor, which has four apartments on the right side, where I live, and four on the left. I pass by apartments one and two. He's still right behind me. 
I stop at apartment 3 where I live, and he stops in front of apartment 4 where I know he doesn't live. He hasn't said anything, just breathing hard, and I think there's no way I'm going to open my apartment door and have him push me inside and assault me or worse. He also hasn't knocked on the door of apartment 4. It's worth noting that the apartments are U-shaped, with mine and my neighbor's door being very close together, so I bang on my own apartment door as loud as I can, but I yell my neighbor's name. Hey, Kevin, let me in. This startles the guy, even more so when my own apartment door doesn't open, but Kevin's does. Kevin sees the guy standing right in front of his door and asks what he wants. The guy starts mumbling something about the wrong apartment, but I have my own door open so fast that I'm inside my place in a flash, locking the door behind me. I grab my cordless phone to call the police, but I hear Kevin through the door telling this guy he needs to leave. The guy does. Kevin knocks on my door, asks if I'm okay, I thank him and say that I am, but inside I'm still frozen, adrenaline pumping, and scared. I thank him again and tell him to have a good night, and I lock my door again. I have my phone in my hand, ready to call the police, but I start trying to rationalize it again. What exactly happened? A guy followed me home, but then he said he had the wrong apartment. Are the cops going to care about something minor like that? I try to calm myself down, but I'm also berating myself. Why didn't I run the instant I felt him following me? Why didn't I tell the people we passed when the front door opened that I thought I was being chased? Worse, why didn't I tell Kevin that the second he opened his door and saved me? He could have let me inside his apartment and we could have called the cops together. But because of my stupidity... Everything felt so ambiguous, and I was questioning myself. A couple of weeks later, I'm visiting my grandparents, and my grandfather is reading the paper. He tells me that a woman was assaulted in the apartment building across the street from mine. It's the same guy. He had multiple convictions for sexual assault, and had recently been released on parole. I was in my college apartment and my roommate had just moved out. Her room was directly across from mine with the living room between us. I had cleared out her room and then closed the door. I left my bedroom door open when I went to take a shower one night. My bathroom was connected to my bedroom. I also happened to leave the bathroom door open. While I was in the shower, I thought I heard a woman talking. I'd never been able to hear my neighbors talking before but figured they just happened to be talking in their bathroom which shared a wall or something. When I got out of the shower, I was surprised to see a black void when there should have been the bright white closed door of my old roommate's door reflecting in the moonlight. I figured I just forgot to close the door and went and closed it. The next night, I once again went to take a shower and left my room and bathroom door open, but this time I checked to make sure the other door was latched and the front door was double locked. When I came back out, I once again saw the void with the door wide open. I slammed my door closed and locked that shit so fast. I convinced myself there was a logical explanation, so the next night I once again checked all the doors and then closed my bedroom door. This time I came out of the shower and my bedroom door was open along with the other door. I showered and slept with my bedroom door locked from that point on. I guess this took place over several nights home alone, and I may not have even been alone. One night when I was 15, I stayed over at my buddy's house. His parents were gone and his older brother was looking after us. When we went to bed, the house was quiet and dark. I could barely see his bedroom door open slightly, and I assumed it was my buddy's brother checking in on us. 
but then I realized that this person looking at us was wearing glasses, and my friend's brother did not. There was no one else in the house, and I could not figure out who this person was. I was frozen in fear, just staring at this figure looking in on us, when my buddy, who was in another bed on the other side of the room, started screaming at the top of his lungs. I've never heard a more terrifying sound, and my heart just dropped out of my chest. The person looking at us quickly backed out, and the door was closed quietly. A few seconds later, we saw the light come on in the hallway, and my friend's brother flew through the door, asking what was wrong. We both started yelling that someone was just here. The brother grabbed a baseball bat from his room and started searching the house. We checked the front and back doors in the garage, but they were all locked. All the windows were closed. He looked in every closet and under the beds. Needless to say, we spent the rest of the night in his room. None of us could sleep, so we just stayed up all night talking. It was one of the most terrifying, but also best nights of my life. So I'm 23 years old, female, and live on my own. I just moved out to the area for school and went to my local Walmart to gather supplies for cleaning. As I walked in, I took note of an older man near the entrance that I briefly made eye contact with and nodded at and just kept walking. I looked at folders for a bit and then made my way towards the electronics section at the back to look for a charger. I was making my way through the aisles on the way down, looking at the fall decorations. Lots of them were geared towards kids, so I just glanced at them quickly and turned around to leave. The same man was there, and he was holding and inspecting some paper plates with childish Halloween designs on them for kids. I thought that was a little strange, but brushed it off, thinking he had grandkids. I left and made my way to the electronics section where they kept chargers behind locked glass doors. I'm there for about 7 to 8 minutes, and the same old man shows up, and I see in the reflection of the glass that he's checking out my ass as he walks by. I brush it off because I'm used to men making quick glances like that in public, and left it at that. He's looking at the display behind me at the other side, goes to leave, and then this is where it's creepy. He stands right behind me and starts aggressively eyeing me up and down while licking his lips, paying particular attention to my backside and legs. He's basically undressing me with his eyes. At this point, he was giving off massive creep vibes and I started shaking with adrenaline. I was afraid he would try and grab me. I stay calm despite my throat feeling like it had a ball in it, and wait for him to leave. He does. Then I go to a random aisle nearby electronics, but in the general part of the store, and I waited for a few minutes, just standing there to see if he showed up. I wanted to confirm if he was following me or not. Sure enough, five minutes later, there he was. I caught him quite literally speed walking down the main walkway looking down each aisle, as if frantically looking for me. He stopped dead, saw me notice him, and then promptly scurried off. I went to the electronics section and informed them that I was being followed and I was not comfortable. I asked them if there was security. They don't have any, just theft prevention and they offered to check me out there or accompany me to finish shopping. They were very kind, and I took them up on the offer to get my cleaning supplies nearby. As we turned together, the same guy was standing further away, staring. He just increased the radius he was using to follow me, and was watching from the front by the registers now. I get my stuff, check out and then weave through all the clothing sections to leave from a different section than the one I originally entered in and saw him from. I didn't see him at all this whole time, and I got into my car. I promptly drove to my new place, but stopped halfway at a random neighborhood. I pulled over and pretended that one of the homes was mine to see if anyone had tailed me. 
I then drove home when I didn't see anyone. I may be overreacting, but this is a new area to me. I've never had someone be quite that creepy and persistent in following me. I've done things on my own plenty of times and never had an issue. This all happened in the middle of the day at like 3pm too. I was wearing loose clothing and just wanted to make a quick trip in and out. I have no idea what could have happened if I didn't notice, or what his intentions might have been. I can't imagine they were good. Maybe he would have followed me to my new place. Who knows? Either way, the whole encounter was scary. He had no clue I saw his reflection and the nasty expression on his face. Just stay aware, guys, and watch yourselves. A couple of weeks before my 19th birthday, I woke up one morning at around 4am while someone was trying to break down my bedroom door. I'd fallen asleep with my light on after coming in tired from work, so when they came into my room, I could see at least what was happening. There were two guys, and one of them immediately attacked me with a hammer, so I told them just to take whatever they wanted. The other guy started to load all my electronics into a backpack. Meanwhile, my mother down the hall had woken up with a commotion and started shouting to know what's going on. The next moment they both ran out of my room and shut the door on their way out, going to my mother's room. She managed to hold the door closed on them for a few seconds, giving me the time to open the safe in my cupboard and remove my pistol. I checked for a round in the chamber and went to open the door to make my way to my mother's room. As I opened the door... One of the guys turned around and ran at me with a hammer. I fired two shots before he could get to me and push me back into my room and onto my bed, where he held me down and tried to take my pistol, while the other guy started to cut my arm and head with what turned out to be my mother's own kitchen knives. My mother eventually joined the fray and managed to take the knife away from the guy cutting me. Meanwhile, I was just holding onto the pistol with everything I had in me because I knew that if one of them got control of the firearm, my mother and I would be dead. My mother froze after she took the knife and the guy got up, grabbing my DVD player and knocking my TV to the ground, then hit me over the head with the DVD player. By this time, I managed to sort of wrestle my gun free and shouted at my mother to get out of the way for me to try and get another shot off. She rolled off the bed and I managed to turn the gun enough to get a shot off into the guy on top of me. It was then that they decided to bolt and grab my bag of electronics on the way out. When the cops came, they found a body with two gunshot wounds in my garden a few meters away from the house, and a blood trail leading away where it disappeared at a nearby road. This happened about a year ago, and I still have yet to return to the store without my husband. So last July, I took my then four and six year old sons to Target to back to school shop. Since having kids and hearing all these horror stories, I'm very observant of my surroundings when out. Anyways, while at Target, unlike most women, I look through all the sections. While in the women's clothing, I noticed two older men close by that kept looking over our way. I thought maybe I'm just being paranoid, so I kept going about my business but keeping my boys super close. We go to the baby section, they pop up, toys, makeup, and the same thing. I was really feeling uneasy because they seemed to be everywhere we were. They never had a cart and one guy was holding one little thing. I go to check out and wait for a big group of nurses leaving Starbucks to walk out with. I threw the boys in the car without buckling them and locked the doors. As soon as I look up, the two guys walk out empty-handed looking around. I didn't think they saw me, so I started to leave when I looked in my rearview mirror and saw them behind me in a truck. I stopped right there and turned and took a photo so they could see me. They turn like they're going back to the store 
and I park over a couple of stores down and call the cops. While I'm on the phone with them in a full-blown panic attack, I watch one of the guys change his shirt and go back inside. I waited until the police got there so I could make sure they were got and had the right guys. I don't know what their plan was that day, but my mama gut told me it wasn't anything good. I'm so thankful my babies and I are okay. I went on a planned trek with a big group of 30 people in the Himalayas. The routine was to pack breakfast, hike the whole day to the next camp by sundown, and at sundown have a campfire and go to bed early. No lights other than your own torch lights at night. As we gained altitude, the camps were fenced with a watchtower. I assume this was due to militants as the army was manning the watchtower. That was the first time in my life I watched galaxies with my naked eye. I used to get very cold at night, so once the fire was out, everyone was to their tents. I had a bad stomach and had to relieve myself, so I woke up a friend and asked him to accompany me while I did my business in the woods. We were strictly advised not to leave the fenced area, but the guy manning the watchtower was so deep asleep, we didn't try to wake him up. We couldn't. He was comfortable in his thick layer of blankets, and I had to go. So we get out of the main gate. There's no lock, just the chain wrapped around it. I do my business next to a glacier that's come sliding down, all the while admiring the stars and chatting with my friend. After finishing and walking back to our tents, and are admiring the view of the night sky, a whistle goes out. We think it's a warning to get into our tents and sleep, so we do so. Someone comes around and checks our tents and leaves. Fast forward to the morning. A big assembly is called. There are more army personnel and they're all very pissed. We're wondering what the commotion's about. It turns out that there was a bear in the compound last night, and someone let the gates open. There were footprints all around the tent. The army guys wanted to know who stepped out last night and who left the main gate open. The guy on the watchtower got a heavy telling off from his superior. We were scared and didn't own up to it. This has been a secret between me and my friend to this day. I still don't have any fear of bears, but it was so close to a real disaster. I work as a customer service rep for a trucking company in Omaha. There are two stories that come to my mind. Both are quite serious. The first one happened about a year or two before I started. One of our local Omaha drivers was grabbing a load from the Council Bluffs rail and headed towards downtown 13th Street. A woman had stepped out in front of his truck and she was killed instantly. Investigators had later found a suicide note she'd written shortly before our driver hit her. The driver was a new guy, and he quit immediately after the incident. The second story happened shortly after I started working there. We dispatched local and OTR drivers, and one evening, just before shutting down for the day, we start getting multiple calls from people in the California area headed west. Motorists are reporting that one of our drivers is speeding, cutting off people, not signaling, and just all around reckless driving. We manage to identify the driver in question, call him up, and the guy is inconsolable. Turns out his sister had been murdered at her apartment, and he was literally racing to get back to Nebraska as fast as his truck could take him. My boss told him to park the truck immediately and bought two plane tickets, one for the driver to fly back to Omaha, and another ticket to fly a volunteer out to California to pick up his truck. This isn't the creepiest thing that's happened to me, but it's up there. I was in the barn milking as dusk was setting, 
and I was walking back into the barn and the dogs started to bark. I walked back out of the barn to see and they started running to a dark SUV, which wasn't there two seconds before, running with its lights on in front of the barns. I wondered how the hell the car drove up my driveway without me hearing it or the dogs hearing it. I had just been out there. As they ran to the car, ready to jump on the side and greet somebody, it just vanished. One dog jumped up to put its paws on the side of the car, and it fell down as the car just disappeared. The dogs ran around where it had been sitting, and looked at me, confused. I stood there, just as confused for a moment. The dogs were unsettled. I said to them, well that was a blip in the matrix, and walked back into the barn. No tire tracks left or any sign that it was there. If the dogs hadn't run around in circles in the place it had been, I would have thought I'd been seeing things. I tried telling a few people after that, but they looked at me like I was crazy. I have seen some odder things here and wonder why. I believe after what I've seen that either none of this is real, this life, or that other dimensions cross into our lives at times. I often had trouble sleeping as a child and would wake up in the middle of the night and go to my parents' room to sleep. I was a very paranoid and sensitive child and I constantly thought there was someone at the foot of my bed or in the dark corners of my room. One time, I still swear to this day, something or someone yanked the sheets off of me one night and woke me up. I sat up and couldn't see anything. But needless to say, I didn't sleep that night. I spent the whole night looking around and waiting for them to do it again so I could see them do it. I was eight or nine at the time. I would have this happen often, where the sheets would get pulled off of me, or at least that's how I experienced it. This went on for years. One time this happened, I crossed the hallway between my parents' bedroom and mine, and there was this bright, blinding light coming from outside the window. I still have that image stuck in my head, but I don't know what happened after I saw that light. I just remember the light. Every weekday, I would wake up early for a morning workout, then head to my job. Generally, I would leave my house around 5.30 because my morning drive took around 25 to 30 minutes, giving me enough time for two hours before I needed to leave before my shift started. Most of my drive was just putting loud music on, trying not to fall asleep, and it being a freeway before 6 a.m., almost everyone was going at least 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. I drive most of the time on a main interstate, before turning off onto a smaller highway, which I would only use for a mile or so. This highway was three lanes on each side. People also drive fast on here, but usually no more than 75 miles. And while you get some unsafe drivers in the morning, most people aren't swerving erratically. This highway runs north to south. An on-ramp from a main street becomes a lane. Then there are two entrances from the freeway I would take every day one from the eastbound side, and one from the westbound side. I hope that makes sense, but basically, I got on from the eastbound side right as three cars were entering from the westbound side. One was some sort of orange sportyish car, and the other two were identical dark gray sedans. I don't remember exactly what make and model they were, but I remember them being fairly uncommon models, not a sedan you'd see a hundred times a day. One was in the front of this orange car, one behind. These guys were going at least 80 miles per hour. The orange car would change lanes, and the car in front would cut him off, while the one behind would change lanes to remain behind him. They kept this up the entire time I was on the highway near them, weaving in and out of cars, not slowing down, before I pulled off at my exit. This could be a complete coincidence, and some asshole drivers but I definitely got the vibe 
that the driver of the orange car was trying to get away from the gray cars. Maybe it was extreme road rage, or maybe something more sinister. Regardless, I'll never know. So, drivers of those gray cars, let's not meet. This just happened to me today. Maybe when you hear it, it will seem like nothing and it has a good ending, but I've never been so scared in my life and I need to share it. I'm a social work student doing an internship at a mental institution. It's not like other hospitals. It's organized like a village with care houses for people who have different pathologies and did different things. Ranging from murdering people, serial assault, to people who just have deficiencies and are considered harmless. There are closed and open units. It's in a remote town outside of the city I live in, and there are woods everywhere in the village. This patient in question is considered harmless, even though he sexually assaulted a nurse and another patient a few years back, and he has deviant tendencies. Thing is, he is in an open unit and has free movements and can go out whenever he wants. Today, he came multiple times by the unit I was working in because he wanted a football magazine we didn't have. We had to lock ourselves in because he was screaming and hitting against the door. At one point, he got yelled at by a colleague and started crying like a baby and ran away. It honestly made me feel so sad for him. He's in his late 20s, but he acts and talks like a child, and he has been here since his teenage years. My co-workers warned me and told me what to say if I ever got face to face with him, in order to not make him aggressive. So, I ended work a bit late this evening, and it was already night out. It was only me and my tutor left in the unit, and I had to leave by myself because she wanted to work a bit longer. So I go out take the usual route, the shortest way out going through a small wooded area. There's absolutely no one out. I walk for a few minutes and suddenly I hear someone running full speed behind me. I turned around and it was him. My heart stopped for a second. He then stops and gets very close to me, starts asking me questions. If I have a boyfriend, if I'm Algerian, if I like football, what team do I support, and several times if I find him handsome. I respond politely to all of his questions like I was told to do, but I see he's not satisfied. He was getting irritated and getting closer, blocking my way. At that point, I think that's it. I'm here alone at night with this guy who's already assaulted people, and it's going to be my turn if not worse. I was told to always go his way, so at that point, I think my only option to calm him down is to talk about something he likes. So I start talking about football with him for a good few minutes. I start to see him get into a better mood, and I think now is my chance. I tell him I really need to go, which he doesn't seem to agree with at first, but finally I manage to get away. I walk as fast as I can to the exit of the hospital. At one point, I look back, and I see he's not there anymore. I felt so relieved. In the end, I didn't know what his intentions were, if I managed to get out of something really bad, or if he just wanted to talk, but he really scared the shit out of me anyway. Thank you for listening. I recently moved into a new neighborhood in the city I live in and was walking my dog when a man I've seen a few times started to talk to me. He was sitting on the stoop of an apartment building one street over and he was asking about my dog. He asked my name and I gave it to him. He told me his. Everything seemed fine but I'm a small female and limit my conversations with strangers, especially men as much as possible because this happens more frequently than I'd like. 
Anyway, I would see him every day from that moment on, in the alley, working. Turns out he's a contractor for that building, and he would consistently hold conversations with me, no matter what I was doing. A few times he's offered to give me used furniture from evictions, and would insist on bringing them into my apartment for me. I live with my boyfriend, thankfully. This guy even tried to pressure me into viewing one of the newly renovated apartments that he's working on, but I obviously said no. For one, I don't need an apartment, and two, I'm definitely not going in there alone with them. One day I was approaching again, this time I was getting out of my car to go into my house, and he stopped me and said, I've been watching your apartment to make sure you're safe. Tell your boyfriend I'm not a bad guy. I'm only watching for your safety. Oh, okay. Thanks, bye. I said. He since followed me a few times driving, but I think he gave up because this was months ago and I haven't seen any sign of him. It was all a little creepy. This happened when I was about 14 to 15. I'm 19 now. I was in my house's basement playing PlayStation absentmindedly late into the night like I did often at the time. Being up until 3 to 4 a.m. was not unusual for me at the time. The way my house is structured is that it has a front door, but also a second set of front doors if you're down the driveway. The basement is by these second doors. As I was getting ready to log off for the night, I heard my dogs start going crazy from upstairs. They sometimes bark at nothing, a car passing in the night, or too much wind whipping past their window. However, as someone who listened to too many scary stories, that was more than enough for me. I went up the stairs and was about to go straight to my room when I caught a glimpse of movement out of a window. I looked through the window to my front yard but couldn't see anything. Suddenly I heard my dad yell in a voice lower than his own. Hey, can I help you? This is what set me into pure adrenaline mode. I stood frozen, staring out the window as my ears strained to hear the guy's response. I still got nothing, before my dad continued. Sorry, you have the wrong house. Get off the property. Here he comes back into sightline, a man wearing a white sleeveless shirt and cargo pants. I watched as he walked off our front path and onto the street, then back onto the path. He was seemingly unsure of where to go or what to do. It was now I realized with utter dread I didn't lock the downstairs front door. I finally break my frozen spell and run back down the stairs and lock the front door. I take a deep breath and start back towards the stairs when I hear it, the door handle jiggling. I don't even look back. I book it to the top of the stairs into my parents' room. My dad had already called the cops. They arrived about a half hour later and seemingly picked up a man from an empty house down the street that was in the process of being sold. The following day, the newspaper told of an escaped convict from the max security prison here. Some sort of mix-up was made and they let the wrong person out. They caught him luckily enough, but it didn't detail where. And that is how I both forgot and remembered my way through a creepy encounter. I used to work at a coffee place. We opened at 5 in the morning, but we were there at 4.30 to set up. We closed at 8 p.m. and left by 8.30 or 9. It depended when we finished on clearing up. One night a week was a deep clean session, so we'd leave closer to 9.30 or 10. I did my fair share of both opening and closing in my almost four years there, and definitely saw some pretty interesting folks in all that time, especially when opening. Lots of homeless people who were sadly mentally disabled or drug addicted. We were in a part of town that was not as nice as it used to be. 
One morning when I was opening, myself and my opening barista were the only ones in the store. I was in the back of the store setting up some tills. She was in the front brewing coffee and tea and so on. Suddenly she started screaming bloody murder. I grabbed a box cutter and ran to the front. She'd been cleaning a drain on the ground by the sink right next to the drive through window. She'd bent down, but when she stood up again, there was a man with his face pressed up to the window, literally inches away from her just through the glass. He was really dirty and messy, and for some reason, he had a pink blanket wrapped around his shoulders. As my barista was screaming and crying, mostly shocked from how quickly he'd randomly appeared and how close he was to her, he started cackling like it was funny. I don't really know why, but that pissed me off so bad. I didn't want to open the window, obviously, so I just told my barista to go into the back of the store, and I made eye contact with the guy through the window, scowled as hard as I could, and pointed down the street and yelled, Fuck off, now. He looked totally taken aback at first, but then kind of stumbled away down the street. He lingered on the block for a long time, but eventually left for good. I kept an eye on him for a while, and then went and calmed down my barista. Another time, I was opening with a different barista. For reference, I'm an average-sized female, early 20s. This barista I was opening with is late 30s male. When we opened the store, we'd wait in the parking lot for the other person to get there, and then we'd walk into the store together. I arrived before him. When he got there, he parked a few spaces away from me. His car is black and small, so it could be hard to notice in the dark and from a ways away. When I realized he was there, I got out of my car to meet him. He left his car too and was walking towards me when he suddenly started yelling, Get the fuck away from her! and running at me really fast. I heard footsteps run away from behind me and was really shocked. Apparently, someone had been hiding behind my car, waiting for me to get out. They hadn't noticed my co-worker showed up and was scared off by him, thank God, because I didn't notice anyone was there. A few weeks later though, when I was closing with a different barista, it happened again. My barista's partner was picking her up from work that night and was sitting in the parking lot since she got there a bit early. Luckily, my barista's partner was also a cop. She noticed someone was crouched hiding behind my car and called her partner to tell her to tell me what was going on. She then went to investigate and shoot the guy away. As soon as he saw her, he ran away again. My barista and her partner both walked me to my car though, just to be safe. So yeah, two attempted kidnappings within two weeks was pretty creepy. All for 15 bucks an hour. Go figure. For a bit of context, I need to explain how transportation works in the area where I live. So where I live, the public transportation is absolute shit. There is only one not very reliable public bus that takes you in and out of the residential area and is a long way walking. So the people in the residential area came up with a cab sort of system where you pay by the seat. So one of these cabs fits up to four people, and a little under a year ago, they decided to identify this cab with a sticker with a number that states that the car is part of the cab line. Also, drivers have to have an ID that has cab information. Now onto the story. A couple of times, men have tried to give me a ride. I do my best to ignore them, but sometimes it's a little bit scary. The part of the residential area where I live is a bit isolated, so not a lot of cars or people go through there. I have to walk alone from my house to the cab line or bus stop. In one incident a couple of months ago, I was walking from my house to the stop, and I was wearing headphones so I wasn't paying that much attention. That was the first mistake on my part. A car pulled over next to me. This wasn't all that strange because I've been using this cab line for a while and a lot of drivers know me. If they see me, they pull over so I don't have to walk all the way to the stop. 
This driver stopped and asked me if I was going to a specific place. I said yes, I was going there. I got inside the car without checking the windshield for the ID number. That was the second mistake. Here's where alarm bells started going off in my head. First, the cars in the line tend to be older cars with no AC. This was a newer car, and when I got in, he locked the doors and turned on the AC. At this point, I finally realized this wasn't one of the cabs. I was in the car with a complete stranger. He began to ask me things like my name, exactly where I lived, and other personal things. I responded very vaguely with my heart beating really fast. I was starting to panic, so I texted a friend my location and told them to call me ASAP. At this point, we were close to the destination, and there was no sign this car was slowing down, and the guy was about to pass the stop. Then the call came through and I started to talk to my friend like he was my boyfriend. Hey baby, I'm almost there. Wait for me and we'll go, okay? My friend was really confused, but when the man heard my conversation, he suddenly stopped the car saying, Sorry, I was so entertained talking to you that I almost passed the stop. Maybe we could see each other again. Here he unlocked the car and I bolted out, barely saying anything. After that day, I became more aware of my surroundings, and I tend to only get inside the cabs at the stop unless I clearly see the ID of the car. A couple of my friends said that I was overreacting, but it still scared the shit out of me. Then today comes. I was walking from my house to the stop, no headphones on this time, and when I'm halfway there, a car starts driving slowly next to me. I keep on walking, and the older man that was driving starts talking to me. Are you Alicia's daughter? Do you live around here? I responded, no I'm not, and I keep on walking. He insisted, saying he was a neighbor and that he could give me a ride. I replied again that I wasn't and that I don't want a ride. Mind you, my mom wasn't called that and had been dead for over a decade, and people did confuse my grandmother as my mother but she's not called that either. He kept insisting. I began walking faster, approaching the stop where there were more people. At this point, the man became angry and started to yell, saying this was the last time he would be nice to me and offer me a ride. Then he sped up and left. Finally, I got to the stop and got inside a cab, and it took me to my destination. When I got to work, I told my boss everything, and she said, Thank God you kept on walking. You could have been kidnapped. So yeah, that was my morning. I really need a car. To both creeps that maybe wanted to kidnap me, or who knows, let's not meet again. My ex's family owns a massive farmhouse that was built in the late 1800s and has been passed down through generations. They inherited it from a pair of bachelor brothers and their sister, Aunt Kate. So it goes she died in the attic, so that's why you hear pacing up there at night. She loves to take things like my ex-mother-in-law's jewelry and move it around the house. The music room used to be used as the funeral parlor for that area way back in the day. They had the original furnace in the basement that looked big enough to burn bodies. One time I came home and noticed my cat was halfway off the ottoman, kneading with his paws like something not there was petting him and holding the front of him. I went over and ran my hand under him, but not touching him and he fell down. My ex was woken up one night with a lady in white standing over him, staring down at him. My ex is an electrician and farmer who wouldn't make this shit up. Aunt Kate's room that she once lived in is freezing cold all year round. There's no AC and it gets hot and humid in that house. One time I slept in there and had seven quilts on in the middle of summer. I went to bed with the door closed. They all squeak loudly when opened and the wood floor squeak too. In the middle of the night, I sort of woke up feeling hands going up and down me tucking the blankets in all my sides, kinda like you do with little kids. 
I opened my eyes even though I was terrified, and nothing was there. The door was open too and would have woken me up from a loud squeak. My ex remarried and had a daughter who always sees an old man in overalls at the top of the stairs who doesn't want her to go up there. She's ten now, and she's seen him constantly since she was little. My paternal grandmother was very involved in her church community and would often bring me along for get-togethers, parties, funerals, and other functions that involved people we knew. I was probably seven or eight when we visited a nice old lady and her family to deliver gifts the church had put together for them. My grandmother, being herself, got quickly caught up in conversation, which left me time to roam around a bit. The house was large and featured a long, tall wooden staircase to the upstairs. I had never seen a staircase so tall and wanted nothing more than to make it to the top. But when I took the first step with my hand on one of the support columns for the banister, I saw a very tall man looking down at me from the top. He was leaning on the banister with an incredibly deep voice, complete with a heavy southern draw. He told me, Boy, them stairs ain't safe. You is too little. Don't you come up them stairs or I'll give you a whipping. Being the good kid I was, I apologized and left the room, though I'm pretty sure his eyes followed me. Fast forward about 15 years, and I met one of the old lady's grandchildren at her funeral. I asked about the grandfather, and I was told he died almost 30 years prior. Apparently, he'd fallen down those steps and cracked his head. The grandkid thought I was pranking him, but I was in disbelief. Tall man with a deep voice, I asked. He looked at me with shock. Yeah, Mima said he had one. How do you know that? I casually replied, I met him once. I inspected vacant houses for banks. I had to document and photo every room, boiler, gas and electric meter. Vacants that sit empty for long stretches get inspected every month. One house I'd been to every month for two years had an attic that just didn't feel right. There were no items up there. It was just an empty attic with no light source. I would take the photo in the dark, illuminated by only my flashlight. Nothing really weird happened for the entire time, but I always took the photo and got out of there as fast as I could kind of like how you would turn the lights off in the basement as a kid and run up the stairs. I did this job for years. I've been in dark basements, alone, and silence, multiple times a day, for years. The last time I did that house, I checked the meter like I always did, dead. Cobwebs on the dial. I photo the house, climb up the stairs to the attic. I reach the top, and the door is open. Odd. I get to a point in the stairs where I'm not all the way there, but I can see level with the floor. All of a sudden a light goes on. There's a light bulb hanging from the center that was never there, and it turned on as I reached the top. Across from the open door was a mirror facing directly towards the stairs. I saw myself in the mirror for just enough time to see how startled I was. Then the light turned off. I have never ran that fast out of a house before or since. Every month after that, I faked the inspection with old photos, and I photoshopped the date stamp. I still get goosebumps thinking about it. I was speeding west on I-70 through Colorado near Glenwood Canyon, when I decided to slow down and enjoy the view, I notice a state patrol car in front of me a minute later when he turns his sirens on, and I think he's got me busted for speeding. Instead, he's pulling to the shoulder up ahead to help a broken down motorist. I slow down and remember looking at the motorist who's sitting in the driver's seat with their head down, thinking, 
Man, that guy is lucky to get help out here. There's no cell coverage or anything. I keep driving west. A few minutes later, I start to notice police cars flying past me headed back east. Sirens blaring, going extremely fast through a curvy canyon. One after another for like 15 minutes. Ambulances, fire trucks. It seems like all emergency response in the country is headed back the direction I came from. The next day I'm at a hotel in Utah and discover what happened. Turns out, the broken down motorist had skipped bail. And after being confronted by the state trooper who was there to offer assistance, exited his car and began shooting the officer in his back multiple times. On a normal day, the officer would have died as they typically drive alone. But on that day, he was headed to training and had a partner in the car who empties his clip and killed the motorist. The officer almost bled out on the road, but luckily he survived. not sure what year this took place, but my little sister was a preschool age. I'm two and a half years older than her. We're now in our twenties. Our family was in San Diego visiting my grandparents. They live inland in a quiet neighborhood. We were racing our scooters down the sidewalk in front of the house, one by one. My little sister, my big sister and I, all girls, our parents were inside. A van came down the road, and we initially thought nothing of it, but the van kept coming back. Every couple of minutes, it would pass again. After a short amount of time, we noticed it. We continued to scooter. The van would take its time passing, slowing down. It was clear that whoever this was driving was paying close attention to us. I was on guard by this point. My baby sister takes her turn scootering down the sidewalk. The van passes again and comes to a crawl directly beside her. It stops next to my little sister as she's slowing down. My big sister and I are screaming for her to come back, paralyzed with fear. I genuinely thought I was about to watch her be snapped up. Luckily, she turned around and scooted past the door of the van a second or two after it stopped. I ran up to meet her. The driver left, presumably to circle back around. And they did. My older sister had gone inside to alert my mother, who promptly came out. We sat on the steps in front of my grandparents' house, waiting. The van came around the corner, and once they saw my mom, sped off down the road. We didn't get the license plate number, which we immediately regretted. I'll never forget that experience and the sheer terror I felt. Hi everybody, so here's my story. For context, I live away from home for school while my sister lives at home with our parents. Both of our rooms face the street and are right next to each other. I have a full-length mirror in my room opposite the window, so if I looked in the mirror, I'd see what was in the window. So around Thanksgiving of 2021, I had just gotten home from school and was relishing my ability to stay up late, and so was my sister. After our parents went to sleep, I was just laying on my bed watching YouTube. I had my window blinds open, and for some reason, I felt the urge to look up. So, I look in the mirror. Outside, someone pops up from below the window and bangs on my window really hard three times, and then sprints away. I'm shaking, on the verge of tears. I run to my sister's room and explain what had happened. She is also shaken up but we chalk it up to a dumb teenager. Just a few nights later at midnight, I see a text from my sister. It said, Did you hear that? There was somebody in the window. I felt that same fear. I take my headphones off and begin to get up. 
when I hear five really loud bangs coming from my sister's room. I run over and she looks really shaken up. She says, he just ran to the side of the house, the wall that's right next to my bed, and he banged on my wall, right where my head is. We were both frozen with fear. We made theories on who it was, but neither of us were the type to have enemies. There were no teenagers on our street. None of this made sense. Sometimes I feel that same chill in the air, and sometimes I think I hear banging. The fear of seeing a face in the window isn't as rare as many would hope. So I'm praying I never see this boy ever again. This encounter would have happened a little over 10 years ago, but I cannot 100% remember what year this was now, but it was sometime from 2011 to 2013. I am a male, and I would have been about 26 to 27. At the time, I was frequently going out with my friends to bars and parties, and hanging out until pretty late most weekends. The friend's house that I usually hung out at was on a side street, just off of a main road where a lot of popular and crowded bars and restaurants were. He had a park on the street at his house, and during the weekend when it was busy, it was pretty common to have to park a number of blocks away. The street closer to the bars was pretty nice, but if you went a few blocks in the opposite direction, it got a little sketchier at night. After a night of hanging out, I had to walk back to my car pretty late which was parked a number of blocks away towards the slightly sketchier area. This was during the winter, so I was wearing some kind of heavy sweater or pullover and a beanie or knit hat. This detail is only important, as you couldn't really gather much idea about what I looked like from a distance in the dark, aside from my general height and build. There wasn't much through traffic as you got further away from the bars, and the roads were pretty dark without any street lights. As I was walking down the sidewalk, a car started slowly creeping down the street, matching my pace as it pulled up beside me, and then stopped. The window of the car rolled down, and driving the car was an attractive young woman who said that I looked cold and that I should let her give me a ride to where I was going. She seemed very friendly. I indicated that I wasn't parked very far away and appreciated the offer, but I was just going to keep walking. She then tried really hard to convince me to get in her car with her, since it was so cold. There was no small talk to establish any information about me to make sure I wasn't a weirdo, just asking me to get in the car pretty aggressively. Based on what I was wearing and how dark it was, there was no way she really could have had much idea about what I actually looked like to possibly find me attractive, and even if she did, I don't know many women who would pick up a male stranger after midnight when they're alone in their car. There were about 10 bars nearby she could have gone to if she just wanted to pick up a guy. There was no reason that I could think of that she would have to resort to driving around offering to pick up strangers. She continued to drive alongside me and offered me a ride again, which I declined and kept going. I picked up my pace and she eventually drove off. As soon as she was a few blocks away, I quickly got to my car and made sure there was nobody lurking around or close by. The whole scenario felt off, and it didn't make much sense to me. I asked my friend about it later, and all of the women agreed. They wouldn't offer a random guy a ride at night time in that kind of scenario, even if the guy looked like Ryan Gosling or Channing Tatum. My suspicion is that there was someone laid down in the back seat of the car, out of view with a weapon, waiting to rob anyone who accepted the ride. I couldn't really figure out any reason she would be offering rides like that to complete strangers in the middle of the night, as it would be very unsafe for her just to pick up random strangers. I just assumed there had to be something nefarious going on in that car, and I do wonder what would have happened if anyone just hopped in the car with her.
When I was probably 13, my family and I were on our way home from a Wednesday night church service. My mom was in the driver's seat, and I was behind her in the back. My five-year-old brother was in the middle, and my ten-year-old sister on his other side. We were just down the road from the church, but it was a country road and late, so there was no light and no one else on the road. We were just coming up to our turn, when all of a sudden a car comes swerving from our turning spot. This little car was taking the turn so fast that they came into our lane and almost hit us. We swerved as they tried to get into their own lane before we collided. Unfortunately for them, they overcorrected and their car flipped and landed on the driver's side door in the ditch. My mom, of course, hits the brakes and immediately jumps out of the car to go help whoever was in there. She got about three steps away from our car and stopped dead in her tracks. My sister and I are sitting there with our mouths hanging wide open, having no clue what to do. All I could think was, this isn't actually happening to us. This kind of stuff only happens in the movies. But why isn't my mom going to help the other person? It was summer, so we had all of our windows halfway down. I heard a person start yelling help from the inside, and my mom starting to move again to help him. But for some reason, she stops again in the center of the road. Another car flies up behind us, and the guy doesn't hesitate to jump out and run up to the crash to help. The man gets to the car and starts prying the passenger door open so the guy inside can get out. I can see my mom wants to run and help, but it's like she can't move from that spot. The good Samaritan that pulled up behind us is able to get the door popped open. The guy from inside crawls out the door and gets into a frog-like crouching position on top of the car. At this point, my mom starts taking shuffle steps back to the car. When I look back at the guy, he has this crazy look on his face. He looks directly at our car and my mom and launches himself off the top of the car and hits the guy who was helping him. He starts running for our car at the same time my mom turns around and runs for our car. He must have known he couldn't get there before my mom did because he changed directions and moves to the car behind us. My mom jumps in and locks our doors, just as the guy jumps in the empty driver's seat of the car behind us. He slams on the gas before he even closed the door and almost hits us taking off a second time. Next thing we know, the guy who was just carjacked runs up to my mom's window and starts screaming and knocking on the window. My mom is of course shaken and doesn't want to roll down the window, so she settles for cracking it so we can understand what he's saying. He's yelling, asking us to call 911 because his phone was in the car, along with his girlfriend. So of course my mom starts searching for a phone to call, but because she's so frantic from what just happened, she can't seem to find it. So I take a break from keeping my little brother and sister calm, and I dial 911 on my phone and hand it to her. While she's explaining what happened to the 911 operator, we hear a woman scream down the road. The man that was at our window takes off running, and a few minutes later, comes back with a severely scraped up woman in his arms. That turned out to be his girlfriend. My mom unlocks the door at this point and he sets her in the passenger seat while we waited for the cops. The girlfriend told us that he noticed her while he was speeding off, and he tried to hit her, but she scratched and punched at him, and while trying to plead with him to stop the car, he kept coming at her and finally rolled down the window and pushed her out going about 60. The cops finally showed up and talked to all of us to get our stories. While talking to one officer, he told my mom, that the man had shot and killed a man behind some apartment complex. That's why he was driving so fast and trying to get away. When we finally got home, we were all told to go to bed, but of course I wouldn't be able to sleep that night, so I went downstairs to talk to my mom. I worked up the courage to ask her why she stopped running to the car when the other guy didn't. She told me that she had such a strong feeling that she should stay in the car with us, that it was almost like she could hear it. When she heard him start yelling for help, she ran to help again, but just like the last time, she got the overwhelming feeling not to go to the car. To this day, 
I wonder what would have happened if my mom hadn't listened to that feeling. The man could have easily overpowered her and got into the car if she'd been any further away. I should also mention that the man was caught that night trying to steal a new car. He had already ditched the car he stole from behind us, so the thing that really helped him get convicted was when the woman was fighting him off. She grabbed the wrap off of his head before falling out. She didn't know she did until the police got there and found it by where she was pushed. He did go to jail, but I was never informed of how long or anything else, and honestly, I never cared to ask. I was in my first semester of university. I had just graduated college not too long ago and had entered into a program that after a while I would come to resent. During that time with adjusting and taking daily transit an hour and a half away from where I grew up into the big city in order to study was somewhat of a new adventure to me. In a lot of ways, I was just beginning to sprout as my own individual and trying to carve a path for my life while simultaneously opening myself up to new experiences and a new environment. I have longtime friends who go to the same facility as me, but at the time, our schedules wouldn't always line up. This meant a lot of my days were spent traveling back and forth and walking around the city alone. I really wanted to try and expand my horizon of experiences and friends during this period. In a lot of ways, I was really desiring to find a good community on campus that could help satiate my boredom and loneliness. I can be extremely extroverted, but sometimes I find that it takes a lot out of me to try and actually pursue and maintain friendships that haven't been established years prior. I've made friends before from different classes in college, but ultimately, I would end up texting less and less until eventually either side would end up ghosting one or the other. Because I'm a busy guy, I don't find myself prioritizing people who I feel aren't as important to me as others. I know, a shitty thing to say, but nonetheless true. One day, I met Joel. I was on the phone with my fiancé, and I distinctively remember exactly how it all went down. As I was walking out of the school Starbucks with the decaf coffee, I had one earphone in, and I was heading to class through a small stretch of underground passageway under the street that connects the school's library building to the actual building that possesses classes. As I was hastily making my way, I saw this short and stout guy, looking roughly my age at the time, with a thick brown beard and a hat on. Our eyes met, and as I was about to simply walk past, he asked me something in a very charismatic and calm tone. Hey, sorry to bother you. You look like a pretty busy guy. But I was wondering, do you mind doing a study about religion? It's for one of my classes. To this, I regret answering and wish I'd simply continued walking. But at the time, I was becoming more and more compelled by the notion of formal religious institutions and questioning my own religious faith, particularly leaning towards Christianity. Sure. I replied cordially. He then introduced himself as Joel, and after we went through a small survey pertaining to religious affiliations and perspectives on religions, Joel informed me that a small group of students like himself were planning on getting together as a group and discussing various religions in order to gather new insights and to create a community. Of course, with the prospect of finding some new friends on campus and also exploring my own spiritual perspectives, I gave him my phone number after he asked for it, and he said that he would contact me in the next following days. Upon entering our first meeting, I sat down in a very crowded place with seats at our school facility and was greeted by Joel alongside a bunch of other members. They introduced themselves to me and vice versa, and they were all extremely kind to me. We began our small group meeting and I was a bit shocked to find out that the sole topic that we were to discuss was Christianity. I wasn't aware that we were only going to be discussing Christianity, which was against what he had proposed this group to constitute upon our meeting in the tunnel. That being said, I was still curious enough to continue, 
and I was accompanied by three other young guys of my age, who after a bit of talking with, I found out we had a lot of similar interests. Joel, who now presented himself as a leader of our study group, relayed how we would be analyzing Christianity through a multi-step program designed to unveil holy power associated with religion to us. Since I was curious and wanted to learn more about the religion as well as having made some newfound friends, I continued to attend this study group for the rest of the semester in which there were a few circumstances where I questioned Joel's interpretations and was met with hard resistance. It felt like at times my wavering belief in what Joel was saying would be met with straight dismissal as opposed to actual conversation. I continued to brush that off as the group I was working with got closer. The school's club, which I was now a part of, provided me with exactly what I had wanted. We even went to a church-run event together where I quit vaping and many individuals reported mystical experiences. Things only started to get concerning with Joel during our one-on-one -on -one conversations. I discussed my personal experiences and belief in my newfound religious beliefs and all of my former spiritual experiences as well, and Joel exposed me to a story and a few incidences that at the time I definitely should have taken as red flags. For example, when he was younger he'd gone on a retreat where when he was in prayer, he said that he began to hear the voice of God talk to him. I questioned at first if he was referring to the voice of God as more so a metaphor, but he reassured me that he literally heard God speak to him before. When he told me this, I became a bit unnerved. At the helm of this community was Joel, but in all other senses, I was satisfied with who I was with and what we were doing together. Though I'm not entirely dismissive of strange occurrences, especially pertaining to spirituality, his experience talking with God in his head came off as uncomfortable for me. He also said that the way he would pray would involve a direct conversation and reply with God. Out of discomfort, I wouldn't prod him on what he meant by this. This, of course, was just the beginning. After the summer had ended, I had found myself in the most religiously devoted state I'd ever been in. Throughout the summer, I had a treacherous injury which made me housebound for months, and to call upon God in a lot of ways for strength. With my newfound devotion, I was elated to fall back into the community that I had nurtured and grown with throughout the last semester, relating to something that I'd found deep joy in. At the first lesson of the semester, something was very different. Joel, as before, was at the helm of our study session, but was now perpetually interrupted by people coming to greet him and give him praise. It was so bad that we literally essentially sat and watched for 20 minutes before we can get on with our lesson, as more than 10 people, mostly young men of our age, came to greet this man. As aforementioned, when not unnerving, he was extremely charming and gave the impression that he cared deeply for everyone. Once our lesson began, he introduced us to the second phase of the program. He explained that this was one of the toughest programs of the different levels that there were, as it required even more devotion and, more importantly, an emphasis on sacrifice for those who engaged. He showed us a diagram of a stick person and he showed that in this program, we would have to accept Jesus as the center of our life. He explained by making our lives around Jesus entirely that we would not be losing something but be gaining. He also began to go over the notion that sex before marriage is a sin, and that if we were to continue this program, we would have to make the sacrifice of giving up sex in our relationships and prove that we weren't. He said that many guys weren't able to continue because of it, I talked about this afterwards with one of the members of this group, who not unlike me had been in a serious relationship with someone they loved for years. In my personal opinion, though we weren't married on the altar, I knew that both me and this other member felt devoted to our partners, as if we were already married in a sense, and we both expressed how Joel's behavior surrounding this was off-putting, controlling, and intrusive. After our lesson, I was a bit dumbfounded by the intensity with which he gave his speech about this new program that we would be engaging in this semester. Joel and I sat down for a few more minutes and talked, 
in which I expressed experiences of devotion from the summer and explained my entire catastrophic experience with my injury. He then went on to tell me that at times he was actually able to know things beforehand. This seemingly random and strange statement shocked me. He said, for example, he was able to know something another member had done before they had even mentioned it, and in the way that he described it, it sounded as if he was saying he had some form of mystical foresight. I was a bit jarred to say the least, though I felt like I would be impolite to question any further. Joel then went on to tell me that he believed that I, if I successfully completed this program, was primed to become a teacher for the first program I'd done the semester prior, leading others who would join, and that I had a bright future in the organization. In that moment, with what he'd laid down on us in the lesson, I felt overwhelmed by his expectations of me. It also became evident that Joel was not a student at our facility. In fact, he was in his mid-thirties and had kids. He was actually just a part of an organization that recruits people to become Christians and missionaries that work on our campus. This means that he actually lied to me when I first met him. He wasn't a student, there was no group talking about various religions, and his whole purpose was to convert me to make me join the organization he was a part of. At this point, school began to pick up a lot, and I was also working part-time to help support myself. As I was on the train to head back home the next week, I'd forgotten that my second lesson of the program that semester was supposed to happen, so I texted Joel saying, Hey man, I actually got onto the train and forgot about our lesson. Sorry about that dude, I'm not going to be able to make it as I have to work later. To which he replied, Can you get off the train? Try and get here as soon as possible. I was a bit dumbfounded at this question. Since I live an hour and a half away, it wasn't as easy as getting off the train and heading back the opposite direction, and he knew that. He knew the area I live in is remote and a long distance away. I also told him that I had to work, which he plainly disregarded. No man, unfortunately I can't come. Have a good lesson, I replied. To which he said again, Come on man, just get off the train and come back. At this point, I was annoyed. Not only did I feel like he was commanding me, but that he was also blatantly disregarding the fact that I had said no and that I had to work that day. I did not answer him. I talked with my fiancé about how I was starting to feel about the whole ordeal and how I felt guilty about having feelings of wanting to distance myself from the group while simultaneously not wanting to lose the community and friends that I'd established along the way. My fiancé told me that by the way that Joel was acting, and with regards to the things he said, that she was starting to become uncomfortable with the whole situation. I remember sitting in bed, thinking about leaving the group, and how the prospect made me feel physically ill. After all, I had been given everything I wanted in the community, except that the helm was a seemingly increasingly controlling and persuasive being who was making me and possibly other members more miserable. There was an event the following Friday that was going to be at the church, which was organized by the community. Originally, since many of my friends from this group were going, I intended to go, but alas, I was scheduled by my boss to work that day, so there was no way I was going to be able to attend. I knew that Joel would be insistent upon me coming anyways, so when Joel texted me reminding me that the event was Friday, I told him that I wasn't able to go because I had to work. To this, he replied and simply said, What? Bro, no way. You've got to come. Take work off and find somebody to take your shift. God wants you there. I was expected. He dismissed my decision and also said that I had to be there because God wanted me there, as if he was his mouthpiece. I went on to text him again and inform him, No, sorry man, I can't do that. I just got a promotion and I have to be there. I hope you guys have a great time anyways. To which he then again replied similarly to what he had before. This was my personal breaking point. He knew the importance of my financial situation and his dismissal of my personal boundaries as well as his commanding made me decide to text him explaining that I was done with the group 
and that I wanted to pursue my own religious exploration without the group from then on. I felt as if he was slowly but surely increasingly controlling me and trying to take what he could, commanding me as if he were the leader of my life in any possible way. It was even up to him if I could fuck my fiancé. He replied with a long paragraph, persisting in this sort of overly kind manner that I had to continue with the group and that it was God's will for me to show up to this event, even though I was completely unable. He was certain that this group was meant for me and that God had told him that this was where I was supposed to be. After I responded again, telling him to stop and that I would not, he sent me another paragraph of similar length, repeating what he would say. No matter what I would say and whenever I would say no, he would overstep my boundaries while maintaining a kind and friendly tone in order to try and push me into submission when I had clearly said no. At this point I said I did not want him to talk to me anymore, to which he replied, Bro, why? Can we meet up? With a smiley face. I want you to explain why you don't want to continue, bro so we can meet up and do that, and I can get a better sense and we can figure out what we do from there," he continued. Even at this, I knew that he was trying to elongate his chance at bringing me back into the group and continuing his reign of control. I said I didn't want to, so we asked again. I decided at that moment that I needed to block him. So I did. A semester later, I was walking down the street of my school and as I walked by a pizza parlor, lo and behold, who came out? Joel walked over to me with one of his friends and said that I was one of his friends to his buddy. I uncomfortably stood there and his friend went inside for a moment while Joel turned around to look at me, and he asked with disarming gentleness, Did you block me? Yes, I replied. You should unblock me. That way we can meet up and talk because I really want to know why you left the group, he said, to which I evidently was frustrated, said, okay, and went on my way. That night, he messaged me on my Instagram, insisting we meet up again. I blocked him on there too. In short, I'm thankful for my fiance, who's the love of my life. Without her, I'm not sure I would have been strong enough to have left the group and his control. The fact of the matter was that there were other guys in that group who had absolutely nobody. They had nothing, and they were prime targets for a charismatic and controlling freak. There were members of that group who were in higher levels, so to speak, who'd done all the programs, who seemed as if they were emaciated, but they'd become such restricted fundamentalists that their lives and their openness to new experiences were significantly thwarted. Beware of who you let into your life, and just because somebody is nice to you does not mean that they might not have ulterior motives. Also, learn to stand your ground and respect yourself. If you say no, mean it. So Joel, you controlling cult leader, let's not meet again. I'm 19 years old and living far from home in a studio room. I'm often up late, and last week I was doing some laundry at around 11pm-ish. I saw a man sitting in the lobby. I saw him around a bit at night, but I didn't think much of it. I'm in the laundry room. I just put my clothes in the dryer, and I hear the laundry room door beeping. It meant someone was coming in. There was the man standing there with no clothes to watch, just staring at me. I maneuvered around him and headed to the lifts. He followed me quickly and cornered me and asked for my Snapchat. I was tired and just wanted to get back to my room, so I stupidly gave it to him. I figured he'd message and try to flirt. I'd say, I have a boyfriend. Sorry if you thought this was anything else, and that would be the end of it. So I'm about 5 foot 4 with very long red hair, and I'm half Indian English with Afghanistani descent. So I'm white passing but kind of exotic, but people tend to stare at me. Anyway, he starts messaging me. 
It's kind of normal. Then he starts saying weird stuff like, I saw you a month ago and I was impressed. I've been visiting a friend and staying here. And I've been watching you. I noticed that you come out mostly at night. He told me that he was Saudi Arabian and only visiting for five more days. Then it gets worse. He says, I love you, I can't help it. And then I say I have a boyfriend and he says, I only want you. And continues to completely ignore that. He asks to come to my room and I said no. And he wanted a hug. He asked me if I lived alone and if I was a virgin. He kept saying he loved me and that I was perfect for him, that I impressed him. At that point, I recorded all the messages on Snapchat, spoke to him a bit more to gather evidence so I could take it to the reception in the morning. He's been watching me for a month. I got my guy friend who lives on the second floor to walk me down to the laundry room. We sat in the student lounge area and my friend calmed me down. I was shaking with adrenaline and fear. We saw him around the laundry room again looking for me, but luckily I'd already picked up my stuff. I ran back to my room and my friend says that I can stay in his room, but I said it's okay, I'll just lock my door. It's about 1am and I hear someone outside my room trying to get in. I ask my friend if he's outside my room and he said no, so I just froze. I didn't want to make a sound. I felt sick to my stomach and helpless. Eventually it stopped, and whoever it was went away. In the morning I reported this to reception, and then went to stay a few days with my boyfriend, then after went to London to visit a friend. And last night was the first time I'd spent a night in my room since this happened. I'm very paranoid now. Sadly, I should probably be used to this. It's not the first time I've been sexually harassed. One guy tried to kiss me in a club by grabbing my head, and a bunch of other things have happened that I won't go into here. But anyway, I'm terrified to go outside my room after dark. I'm constantly looking over my shoulder and feeling paranoid. I just keep blaming myself for being too nice, and I know it's my long thick hair that attracts people's eyes to me. I just want to cut it all off. Has anyone else had a similar experience? How did you deal with it? Oh, and reception still hasn't updated me on if he's still in the building. This was my second year at university. Late at night after hitting the bars, my two roommates and I were heavily intoxicated. An acquaintance asked me if an acquaintance of his could spend the night at our house, as his friend was from out of town and too drunk to drive home. No problem for us, as we considered ourselves stand-up guys, and had plenty of room and a comfy couch for him to sleep on. Our guest introduced himself, but asked that we call him Bullwinkle, as this was his preferred nickname. No problem again. I'm not sure if it's relevant, but before I passed out that evening, my girlfriend stopped by and we had sex. She left shortly after. The only reason I mention it is because from where Bullwinkle was sleeping, it had to be obvious that was what was happening. He must have heard us or been aware. So I eventually pass out in bed alone. Very early in the morning, I was half woken to the sensation of someone tugging at my underwear, basically being pulled down in a way that must have exposed everything. Half drunk and barely conscious, I sat up and said something like, what the hell? I sort of half registered Bullwinkle quickly leaving my bedside and quietly throwing himself to the floor, hands over his head. Not being truly conscious, I stared at Bullwinkle lying in a heap on the floor for a while not truly comprehending the situation. I then lay back down for a second. I'm not sure if I went back to sleep, but I was wide awake after I heard the front door slam. Wide awake and finally beginning to comprehend the situation. I paced the house for a couple of minutes, checked that the doors were locked, 
and other security measures. I confirmed that Bullwinkle had left the building, then woke up my roommates. My roommates also noticed that their underwear was pulled down too. Sheets and blankets were pulled back. Dresser drawers were left open. Underwear was missing. All sorts of creepy stuff. We talked a bit about what to do. We searched for Bullwinkle, discussed calling the police, but rejected that idea, partly out of how embarrassing that conversation might be, partly because none of us were hurt and nothing valuable taken. I tried calling my acquaintance, but no one answered, so we all went back to bed. No one ever heard from Bullwinkle again. His friends say that he disappeared abruptly. So, if you were out there, Bullwinkle, fuck you. I didn't go to uni, but my best friend Tessa did, so of course I wanted to go to her housewarming party after I hadn't seen her in so long. I drove to her new house and met her early so we could go out for dinner and pick up some cheap alcohol and mixers for later. When we got to the house, I was introduced to some of her new housemates for the first time and picked a seat on this rusty brown sofa that looked like a dog chew toy. It wasn't glamorous, but Tess was so excited for her two worlds to collide. A little bit of awkwardness later, I realized I'm the only new person and everyone already knows each other. The house slowly fills with people, drinks are poured and the volume is rising on the speakers. For a bit of backstory, I'm in a career where I have an extended DBS check at all times and cannot have anything on my criminal record, not even a driving offense. I don't really know anyone and after coming back from the bathroom, I can't find my friend. I don't really know the house that well, so I go upstairs to look for her. As I get to the first bedroom, I'm welcomed in by a crowd of shrieking girls who want to compliment my hair and my nails and, oh my god, I love your eye makeup. I ask them if they've seen Tessa and they say no. As I turn to leave, I'm blocked by these three guys leaning over a dresser, doing lines of coke. I'm a bit taken aback, but I avoid eye contact and try the next room. In the next bedroom is loads of people sitting and standing, just talking. As I walk into the room further, I get shouted at by a guy telling me I'm not letting it out. Then I'm whacked in the face by the strongest smell of weed. I walk straight back out after doing a quick scan and still not being able to see her. I then try the bathroom on the landing, and it's another group of girls chatting and giving life advice. After telling them that Craig ain't shit and he doesn't care about you, and them telling me that they don't know a Tessa, I leave to try my luck somewhere else. I'm feeling pretty lost. I can't leave because I've been drinking, and I was supposed to be staying over that night. I go back downstairs and into the back bedroom just off the extension. I open the door to the room that I should be staying in that night with all my stuff in and it's dark and quiet. I sit on my bed, get my phone out and start texting my boyfriend about how I wish I hadn't come and how I don't want to be there. As I'm looking at my phone, I hear the metal from a little tiny bolt scrape across the floor. I can't see the other side of the room, so I lock my phone to see better and can't make out the shapes. Then I hear a guy's voice. Sorry, I just didn't want anyone else coming in. That did not put me at ease. I awkwardly laugh and try to undo the lock to get back out and quickly slip through the door. I finally get to the kitchen and there's a girl slumped on the floor with her head down murmuring to herself. I can't look away and just want to know she's okay, so I reach down to hold her hand and ask if she wants to go sit on the sofa. A guy stood next to her, drinking Jack straight from the bottle, tells me, she don't need to go, leave her. She's coming down and just needs a little pick-me-up, 
don't you, babe? As he passed her a cup from the counter with a pinkish-looking liquid inside, everyone is looking at me, so I just squeeze past to get to the garden, which is where I found her. Three guys stood over her, and she's passed out on the grass. They're taking pictures. I get this horrible lump in my throat when I see all the vomit of the patio steps and three guys laughing. Instinct kicks in and I run to her, sitting her up so she doesn't choke. The guys all laugh at her, shouting, Tessa, baby, look at the camera. Tessa, ha, <laughs> you're gonna love this. I don't know how she knew them, but I didn't and I was so mad. She snapped back to reality and told me that she just felt a bit tired, so she had a quick power nap. After sobering up to that, I slept in my car in fear of the strange guy locked in my room, the girls in the bedroom doing coke, the girl in the kitchen passed out from who knows what, and in fear of being there if the police came. It was selfish, but I stayed until I knew my friend was in bed with other girls around her. I just couldn't be there in that house. This isn't an entirely too creepy story, but it is one that freaked me out. For context, I live in a university-owned dorm about a mile from main campus, and they have a shuttle service that takes you to and from campus and this particular dorm. I got together with some friends on Labor Day for a barbecue and had a little too much to drink. I was still pretty coherent, but it would be obvious to anyone that I wasn't totally with it. Around 10.30pm, my friend walked me to the shuttle stop and waited for me to get on before heading back to her dorm. As I was on the shuttle, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, but there were about four other people on the shuttle, so I assumed I was just being paranoid as well as drunk. However, that changed when I noticed a guy who was in his 20s sitting on the other side of the bus about two seats ahead of me who kept looking at me. I was uncomfortable but ignored it because I would be home and in my dorm soon. The shuttle drops us off and we all get into the elevator, myself first and the guy second. I push the button for my floor and he looks but doesn't press a number, which freaks me out, but I'm still hoping for the best and tell myself he just lives on the same floor. Of course, the other two people in the elevator get off before myself and this guy, and my dorm is the last room on my floor. We both get off on my floor, and I start walking. I look back, and he's deadlocked on me, so I start to panic and walk faster, and so does he. Finally, I pulled my keycard out and practically sprinted to my door as he also began to sprint. I got in and slammed the door behind me and locked it. After giving myself a minute, I look out the peephole and he's sitting across the hall from my door, just staring at my door. He did this for a good 7-10 to 10 minutes before muttering something to himself and leaving. I ended up calling one of my male friends to come over to my room and make sure he wasn't still lurking in the hall somewhere. Again, not entirely too creepy or exciting, but definitely scary at night, alone. Depending on the beholder, this is a ballsy or stupid story I could throw into the mix of all these close animal encounters on here. I lived out of a camper shell I built on the back of a small Japanese pickup I own. I did this with some breaks of couch surfing in between for about eight and a half months, east to west coast and lots of places in between. I was doing some work on a guy's house in Sonora, California. He and his family were the coolest of Mormons, and they actually offered that I just park anywhere I like on their eight acres of property until we got their house finished up to be put on the market. Having a stable campsite, 
I changed things up and would sleep in my hammock beside my truck. The weather was perfect that time of year. The guy's wife saw me in my hammock on the first morning and made it a point to tell me about the two goats they'd lost to a mountain lion the year prior. One day at dusk while I was there, she and her son got a mountain lion walking up the driveway on video. It was back. I knew the risk, but figured it's far too scared of human smells and lights and sounds to ever realistically mean problems for me, which is the case for 99% of those cats. Just be nosy before bed and you're set. After lights out at night, I'd sit and browse the web for a while in the cab of my truck, and I could charge my electronics from the inverter I had in there. I wasn't done going in and out of the camper shell in the bed of my truck, so I'd left both tailgate and hatch wide open. It was well into the night. I'm just reading away, and all of a sudden, my entire truck lurches from a dip in the rear end something in the back of my truck. I shuttled people around back there and have a good sense of how the rear leaf springs do underweight in this truck because I've owned it for so long, and it was as if a slightly less than or equal to 200 pound man sat down on his ass on my tailgate. Oh shit. My first thought is that it's a person. I didn't think at the time, but there's no way it's a person. I'm parked on crushed gravel that gives away the approach of anything putting body weight on it, unless this person was being intentionally sneaky, but that gets thrown to the wind with a jump onto the tailgate, so it wasn't a guy. A useless wide-eyed check of my mirror sent me thinking of a better plan. I'm not getting out of the cab. I manually lock both doors, as it's an old truck. My keys are already on accessory to run charging so it's less than an eighth of a turn of the key and the truck is running. I rev the thing in accordance with my heart rate, but I don't blast the horn because I don't want to wake this family and their five young kids up. The plan works, and the truck springs back up unweighted. The noise did scare the cat, but a mountain lion at night did pounce into the back of my truck. I shut off the truck and waited things out a good while. All clear. The ballsy or stupid part comes now. I was 21. This was my first adventure I dreamed about since I was a kid. I don't have wild behaviors, but I honestly feel all but dead inside until I face some kind of challenge or adversity and I'll come alive. I grew up watching too many movies or something. All my favorites share that common theme. Anyway, I didn't want to back down. Slight dehydration was on my side and I knew my piss was going to smell a little stronger because of it. I pissed all over the trees my hammock was strapped to, and underneath, and in a little sea bear circle around the hammock itself, and I did that every night for the next two weeks with no problem, until we finished the job. It was ballsy then, but it's stupid now. The reality, though, is that anyone who sleeps outdoors in their habitat for any amount of days more than one out of the year has slept in a mountain lion's territory, likely under one, in terms of hillside, not trees. The consensus around them is that they see you. You don't see them. A few years ago, about 2019, I was riding the bus one night to get home. There was a guy on the bus that was a little disheveled and dirty, reeked of alcohol and generally acting weird. I was sitting in the back and he sat near me and tried to talk to me. I was polite at first. I ride the bus at night a lot, so a drunk homeless guy does not bother me and I have no problem making small talk with a stranger on the bus. Plus, I'm used to there being one or two sketchy people on the bus, considering the route and the fact it's late at night. When he tried to get flirty, I politely told him I wasn't interested and put my earphones back in and ignored him. He got a little frustrated and even said some vulgar things, but I couldn't really hear him, so it was fine. It's not my first rodeo being in that kind of situation, and while it is uncomfortable and there's nothing okay about that sort of behavior, I rarely feel threatened. 
Most of the time they're harmless, all bark and no bite. And I'm a big girl, as in tall and overweight. And I know basic self-defense and always have an exit strategy when in scenarios where I don't feel safe. When people get like that on the bus, I find most of the time ignoring them and acting like I'm not phased is enough for them to get bored and find something else to do. I only engage if they get in my face or start harassing other passengers, especially other women, kids, and seniors, or anyone who appears vulnerable, because I will not tolerate that. And the bus drivers usually don't put up with that either if it escalates enough. Anyway, this random, drunk homeless guy would have been just one of many random, drunk, homeless guys if it weren't for what happened next. So, my stop is coming up. I'm looking forward to going home. I'm exhausted and so ready to get to bed. I pull the cord to indicate that I want to get off at the next stop, and the guy gets up and walks to the front to talk to the driver, then laughs loudly. I don't think much of it, except I'm a little wary and thinking, please don't tell me we're getting off at the same stop. As the bus slows down, I'm waiting at the back door to be let off at my stop. Instead of opening the back door, he opens the front door and the guy gets off. I ask the driver to open the back door, and I see him shake his head in the mirror. And annoyed, I walk to the front to get off there but he closes the door before I can get off and starts driving. Angry, I say. What the hell? That's my stop. And the driver replies, Sorry, but I can't in good conscience let you off at the same stop as that guy. Either get off at the next one, or wait until we get to a transit station and take a bus going the other way. Not getting it, I ask. Why? because of what he said to me, he says. I ask what he said, and the driver just says, nothing I would like to repeat, ever. I'm so sorry, but just trust me. The driver actually looked shaken, and considering the tone of his voice and the look on his face, as frustrated and anxious as I was to get home, I trusted him and took his word for it. I caught another bus going the other way at the next terminal and watched the driver radio dispatch to get some peace officers and transit security to patrol the area near that stop. They were parked in the parking lot near the stop when I finally got off. I was extra paranoid and on high alert as I walked a couple of blocks to my apartment that night, fortunately without further incident. I never saw that guy again and I'm okay with that. To this day, I wonder what exactly he said to the driver. It bugs me not knowing, but at the same time, maybe it's better that way. Either way, the implications are enough to have freaked me out. So just a detail before everything, this takes place during my mid-twenties, and at the time, I didn't know I had cyclothymia, so I didn't know how to regulate my mind, and my life was a quiet and emotional mess. It was summer of 2020, I was back in town after a long while. At the time, I was living at my grandmother's apartment, which was in the worst part of town. My friend lived ten minutes from my grandmother's place, so I used to see him often, we used to play video games, have long talks about life and future, smoke pot, usual best friend stuff. That night though, as I thought about going home around 2 in the morning, my friend told me he had the end of a whiskey bottle and we could drink a glass to enjoy my return in town. We rolled up two cigarettes, poured two glasses, and went walking in the night around the lot in the park. We continue our discussion. As we were talking outside under a street lamp, we saw a car with a bunch of guys. They just passed on by and we didn't think much about it. It was just a car passing by. After the glass and cigarette, we decided to go back to the apartment. On the way, we saw two or three guys in the street passing us. One of them exclaimed, That's them! 
but it seemed to look away behind us. Again, we didn't think too much and continued to walk. When we arrived, my friend said I could stay on the couch for the night because it was pretty late, but I knew I would be home in 10 minutes by bike. Plus, I didn't want to bother his roommates, so I said no. I added that I was used to this, so there was no problem and he shouldn't worry. But boy, was I wrong. I packed my stuff, said goodbye to my friend, put on my headset, and rode towards my grandma's place. After a minute, I saw a sketchy guy on the road. I put some distance and that was it. I turned to take the usual shortcut, a narrow path with a big rock at the entrance to avoid cars. But this time, there was a car stopped right there. All of its doors were open and the engine was on. Now, it didn't surprise me too much because there were a lot of these in the neighborhood. As silly as I was, I just assumed it was the way these groups hung out together. Smoking pot, music blasting out these open cars. It was something I was used to seeing in the area I was living in at the time. The thing is, the path being too narrow, I couldn't just pass by speeding on my bike. So, I got off the bike and started walking by, only to jump back on a few meters further and ride again. When I was a few meters from the car, a man appeared from the complete darkness with a disturbing grin on his face. I realized there were at least three other guys behind me, just standing there, watching. The guy got in front of me, squeezing my front wheel between his legs. He was silent, staring at me with a disturbing smile. My brain was on alert, but I was feeling slow and hazy because of the substances I had in my system. I rolled the bike back and started to turn back, and he said something like, Okay, I got it. In the middle of my turn, the man repeated himself, squeezing the wheel again. Suddenly, he grabbed the back of my neck with his hand, forcing me to lean down. Now I knew I was in a real shitty situation. He was making fun of me, saying to his friends, Oh, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do now? And he was laughing. Just so you know, this is hilariously stupid. People usually say I look like a nice and chill guy. I have round glasses. That guy was rather muscular, shirtless, and full of bad hash and coke. At some point, I managed to free myself from his grip and took a few steps back and turned. I was now facing him, and that's when he threw a punch to the side of my head. I saw a white flash. I fell on the ground head first on my back. I was hyperventilating and in a state of shock. He started to search in my pockets in my bag. He took my phone, headset, papers, everything I had on me. I heard the voice of a girl saying, Enough. Leave him alone. But he didn't pay attention as he was going through my papers. She obviously knew him and was part of the group. Lying down on the road, I was paralyzed in fear. I remember I was afraid to draw attention to me if I tried to stand up. I was also afraid he would just beat me up and break my arms and legs, or roll over me if they decided to go, as the scene took place just near the back of the car but they apparently were more interested in my belongings. I decided to stand up. The girl standing near the guy looked at me and said, You need to go now. So I took my bike and started to walk away. The other guys were around, watching in complete silence. Suddenly, I heard the man screaming, I'm gonna kill you, bitch. Terrified, I threw the bike and started to sprint towards my friend's flat. I heard him run behind me on almost the whole street before he gave up. I've never ran so fast, even in sports class. I knocked at my friend's door, barely able to breathe. He opened up, sat me down, called the police and gave me a huge glass of water. I woke up his roommate. He appeared more annoyed by all the noise and the fact I could have led these guys to the apartment than anything else. I finally slept on the couch. This isn't even the end of the nightmare. The next day at around noon, I called my friend asking him to help me try searching for anything they would have left behind. We met at the scene. I found my now empty wallet, and he found a small sachet full of coke. I also found a dead crow. 
On my way back, I noticed a car similar to the one from last night in a street nearby. It wasn't moving, but the engine was on. I didn't want to care. It was broad daylight and I was going home to sleep. When I arrived in the parking lot of my grandma's place, I heard a car honking. I turned back. It was the same car I saw earlier. It stopped in the middle of the now empty road. The men were throwing me a killer look, screeching tires, and they were gone in a second. Now I was paranoid on top of all of it. I walked to the doors, looked around to see if anybody was watching me, removed my name from the letterbox, and went inside. That night, I laid in bed with a butcher knife under my pillow. They had all the information about me. I was terrified they would come back at night and hurt my grandmother. The next day, I headed back to my parents in the countryside. Again, this is not even the end. My mother found me a psychoanalyst near their home in a small village. I went there. He started to ask me about my bad childhood. I remembered I thought something was off when he started to say things like, God, your childhood was not easy at all, and other personal remarks on my life. I thought it wasn't part of his job. This was the first red flag, but the worst happened after I told him what happened to me the other night. He told me that all these people spread all the information about me all around the town, that I was now their milking cow and their easy target, and if I showed up in town again, I should be very careful because they would know me. He added they probably assumed that we were a gay couple, and that's the reason he wanted to beat me up. Just before I left, he told me he would like to talk about the interesting way I dress and what I wanted to communicate with my different style, which is funny because I like to dress like Chandler in the first season of Friends. I was even more shocked and completely paranoid after that. For no reason, the town's bicycle agency refused to take the police report about the bike theft, so I had to pay the full penalty. I also had to replace all my IDs and cards, the psychoanalyst's bill. I ended up paying almost a thousand euros for everything. I lived as a recluse for two years at my parents in the countryside, feeling highly depressed. I felt no one could understand my distress, and no one would try to help me at that moment. I felt alone. What still disturbs me to this day is the fact that even after he mugged me and had all my possessions, that man still wanted to beat me up for sadistic pleasure. I'm so glad I have good legs. Now, I often have PTSD episodes when I try to sleep, and also a lot of anger and feeling of injustice inside. So, to that psycho bastard full of coke, the silent group around him, and that twisted psychoanalyst that made me flip into paranoia, Fuck you, and let's not meet again. A couple of years before the pandemic started, a friend of mine, Mary, introduced me to a guy. He wasn't really my type but she's one of those people who turns into a matchmaker when she's in a relationship. So I agreed to go on a couple of dates with him so she wouldn't feel as worried that I might die alone and so on. The first time I met up with this guy, it was a group date with Mary, her boyfriend Tim, and another friend and her boyfriend. This guy Mary was trying to set me up with, Joe, seemed alright. We talked, traded jokes, that sort of thing. I was comfortable with him because I wasn't interested in him. At the end of the night, he asked if we could meet up again sometime, and I agreed. Afterwards, I told Mary, and she was delighted. Her boyfriend Tim was not very happy though. Tim's training to become a doctor. He's a very smart guy, and my friends and I greatly value his opinion. There's something off about Joe, Tim said. I agreed and Tim and I talked it over for a bit, but neither of us had seen or felt anything worse than a bit of weirdness. Be careful with Joe, 
Tim said when I hugged my friends goodnight at the train station. Joe and I texted for a couple of weeks before we met up, and those exchanges only cemented my first impressions. I just wasn't into him, and something about him was off. He began to reveal a side of him that was less friendly as well. He had very low self-esteem and was always looking for reassurance. At first, that wasn't so bad, but it turned toxic pretty quickly. He seemed to get off on that sort of attention. I didn't really want to go out with him again, but Mary was really invested in the idea of Joe and I getting together. Mary is a sweetheart, but she doesn't really have any instincts. Occasionally, that gets me, or someone else in our friend group, into trouble. Mary's cute, and everyone wants to make her happy. She has good intentions, but she has no instincts. She can't sense danger, and sometimes she drags people into dangerous situations unwittingly. I was hoping this was not going to be one of those episodes. Anyway, Mary was excited about the next day and Joe kept asking when I was going to meet him, so I invited Joe to an event my hobby club was holding. I figured that was safe, because we'd be surrounded by people I knew well. The evening was alright. Joe wasn't as creepy in person as he had been over text messages lately. After the event, we walked along the river for a bit, on a walkway crowded with families and tourists. We parted ways at a busy train station. I figured I'd just gently push this thing further into the realm of platonic, and everything would be alright. Then, on one night a couple of weeks later, Joe called me, and he was going to end himself. I freaked out and tried to calm him down. I stayed up all night talking to him, from when he called around 10pm until the sun rose. Every time he calmed down, I tried to say goodbye, but he kept saying that if I hung up, he would do it. So I stayed on the line, talking him down over and over again. Something about the situation felt wrong, but what else was I going to do? I wouldn't let anyone do that. As I sat on my patio, watching the sunrise over the forest behind my house, he finally let me off the hook. He said, thank you. And for a moment, I felt that I'd done the right thing. Maybe I just saved a life. Then, Joe said, with a voice full of glee, that was the best night of my life, and hung up. I was stunned. What the hell? Had this psycho really kept me up all night, knowing full well the next day was going to be busy for me? just to get off on the attention. I decided there was no way in hell I was ever going to see this guy again. I told Mary what had happened, and she was very apologetic. She agreed that Joe was a complete psycho, said she was sorry she had set me up with him, and told me to call the cops if he came to my house. I didn't think he would. Joe didn't have my address, and neither did the person Mary had met him through. I don't give out my address to anyone but trustworthy family members because I don't want my abusive ex-step-parent to find me. That precaution probably saved me from a much worse experience. As it was, when I broke it off with Joe, he took it pretty badly. He threatened to end it again, so I messaged Mary and she contacted her and Joe's mutual friend, who kept an eye on Joe for a few days. Not long after that, I started getting creepy phone calls after midnight. They were often at 2 or 3 a.m. The caller never said anything, just breathed heavily down the line. It was so unnerving. I blocked the number every time. Joe must have gone through four or five numbers before he switched his phone to a private number to get around the caller ID. I couldn't block him anymore. I didn't know what to do. For more than a year and a half after Joe got a private number, I was forced to answer every one of his calls. A whole branch of my family had private numbers because one of them was scammed a while back. Luckily the police caught the scammer and they didn't end up losing any money, but unfortunately for me, 
That meant that if I received a call from a private number at night, I had to pick it up, just in case something had happened to a member of my family. On one particular night, my phone went off at 3am. It was a private number. I knew it was probably Joe. I was staring at my phone, trying to figure out what to do. I never let these calls go to voicemail, because apart from the whole family issue, even if he didn't know where I lived, he certainly knew where Mary and Tim's house was. I was afraid that if I didn't play along, he might go after my friends. The phone was still ringing. I reached out to swipe up and answer the call, then paused. I had an idea. Back when I was in high school, my dad would sometimes call early in the morning. If no one else was in the house, I'd be woken up, stumble over to the phone half awake, and answer in a slightly croaky voice. I have a low voice for a woman, so every time I answered the phone like that, my dad would mistake me for my brother, John. I realized that I could use that. I cleared my throat, dropped my voice as low as I could, and then said, Hello? I was delighted with the result. It sounded exactly like John. It was uncanny. It made me a little sad, really. John died about a year before I met Joe. It was a bit of a jolt, hearing something so close to his voice again, after almost three years. I quickly grabbed my phone before it could ring out, tapped the answer button, then said that deep, Hello? Again. This time, there was no creepy breathing, only silence. I said another deep, Hello? After a moment's pause, Joe hung up on me. I was overjoyed. Every other time, I'd had to hang up on him. No matter what I said before, he'd always wanted as much of my time as he could get. I let myself feel a flicker of hope. Maybe I was free. It's been over a year now, and it looks like I'm free of Joe. I haven't gotten any creepy calls since I pulled out my John impersonation, and I can only guess that Joe thinks I've changed my number or given it to someone else. Joe never met John, so when I said hello, he probably just heard a young man's voice. If John were still here, I know he'd approve. If I could tell him now, he'd be very happy to know a part of him could still protect me even so many years after he was gone. I will probably spend my life looking over my shoulder. Every time someone attacks the bins on my street, I worry it might be Joe. Every time a beat-up car passes me as I walk to the bus stop or train station, I worry it might be him. I've heard from mutual friends that Joe has said some awful things about me. He's told some people he slept with me, which he didn't, of course. Who would sleep with someone that creepy? Worse than that, Joe and Mary's mutual friend has said that Joe had told her he wants to kill me. Mary and I were horrified by that. The friend has since told him I've moved to another city, so that might be enough. She's very close to him, distantly related actually, so he believes what she tells him. When I'm done with my studies, I'm going to move across the country. Until then, I'm keeping my head down. My campus and Joe's are a 30-minute train ride apart. That's nowhere near far enough away, but it will have to do. There is one positive thing that has come out of this. Mary is now completely cured of any desire to play matchmaker. I live in a small town, and a few years ago, our local market had taken up new owners. They fired all the employees and completely redid everything, including, obviously, hiring an entire new staff. At the time, I'd been a regular for around five years. It was really convenient because I lived down the street. I didn't have a car then, so I shopped there daily, sometimes multiple times a day. I'd built up a rapport with the original owners and banter with the original employees, 
I only knew one person's name because she asked after a year of exchanges, and turned out we shared the same name, but that's about where any passing relationships ended. Moving forward, new owners, reopening, new staff. I got a new car, and my business there wasn't as frequent, but still pretty consistent, needing a drink, snack, or missing ingredient for dinner. I'm a relatively friendly person, but also really anxious, especially with men I don't know. So when the new staff came in, I would wait in line, smile, say hi, pay, say thank you, and dip. They were all friendly, but one cashier was a little too comfortable. He would lean over the counter. When I said I didn't need a bag, he would put my stuff in one anyway and touch my hand when handing it over. It made me feel really awkward and off. I also did a local yoga class, and after class, me and the other women would go get drinks at the market and walk around to catch up. The creepy cashier would always make weird conversation about our class. I stopped going for a bit, then my car decided to stop working, and I had no choice but to start frequenting the market again. The creepy cashier was excited to see me and asked where I'd been. I don't remember what I said, but I kept it casual. Over the weeks he'd creeped on me, he'd never asked me my name, but he had asked if I was married. He also asked a million times if I had Instagram or Facebook. I glazed over the Instagram question by saying I hadn't had Facebook since high school, sort of bypassing lying about not having an Instagram. It usually worked and ended our conversation. Finally exhausted evading his questions, I caved when he asked again if I had Instagram. I said yes and that I don't really use it a lot. Oddly, during that transaction, the register was on the fritz. My card wouldn't swipe so I handed it over, and he manually added the card and I was on my way. I went home, made dinner, put on something to watch and scrolled on my phone. I saw I had a friend request and my jaw dropped. It was the creepy fucking cashier. I instantly lost my appetite and felt so uncomfortable. After deducing he got my full name off my debit card and then looked me up made me sick. I denied the request. Several hours later, another request, along with a message saying, What you up to? I denied the request again and ignored the message. Over the course of two days, there were multiple requests with messages saying, How are you? How's your day? Hey, and hearts. He was trying to engage me in conversation with multiple selfies. I continued to ignore him and then blocked him. I ended up talking to a friend and she said she always felt uncomfortable and that he tried to walk her home one night. He stopped working there a couple of weeks later. Apparently complaints were made. In retrospect, I should have been more direct and no nonsense in my responses with him, but I felt so anxious and uncomfortable, especially since it was down the street from my home. I have had a few unsettling experiences in the woods, but this is unquestionably the strangest one. I have been mulling it over for years and still can't come up with a rational explanation. In 2018, my partner and I drove up to a national forest in Oregon for a day hike in early summer. The area was somewhat remote, but nothing too isolated. Hiking is huge in the Pacific Northwest so there are plenty of other people on these trails at any given time, especially during peak season. Because of this, we chose a less popular trail in the hopes of getting some alone time. It was an approximately six mile out and back moderate difficulty hike with a waterfall at the end. It followed a river and didn't intersect with any other trails. Simple enough, right? We were both experienced hikers in good physical condition so we had no reason to think we needed anything but day packs with a couple liters of water and sandwiches. Getting back before dark should have been a piece of cake. We set out sometime after noon. At first, we took it slow and meandered around the riverbank for a few minutes. 
I found a cool animal bone, and we mused over what it might be. It was clearly a vertebra from a large mammal, so we guessed it was probably a deer bone. Because I'm a little morbid and like collecting things of that nature, I put it in my pack. That might not have anything to do with what happened next, but I feel like I should mention it since it was out of the ordinary. The hike to the waterfall was beautiful. We passed a few of the people on their way back to the trailhead, but for the most part, we had the place to ourselves. We stopped a few times to look at wildlife or take photos of flowers. I was tracking our progress on my Fitbit, so I always knew how many miles we traveled and how much time we had before sunset. We reached the waterfall at about 3.2 miles, which matched up with what the map had said. I paused my watch and we settled on a large boulder to rest and eat our lunch. Another young couple was there with their dog. We said hello and then minded our own business. Here's where everything went wrong. As we packed up our stuff and prepared to leave, my partner, Michael, slipped off the boulder and twisted his ankle badly. The other couple heard his surprised scream as he splashed into the water, so they rushed over to help. The three of us hauled him back to dry land and assessed the injury. None of us were doctors, but we thought it was a sprain. The swelling had already begun, and Michael said the pain was serious. He could barely stand. Upon realizing this, the male half of the couple started backing away and seemed anxious to leave. I asked him if he could go get help, but he didn't respond. Neither did his wife. They both just turned around and started booking it up the trail with the dog trotting behind them. I called out to them in frustration, but they didn't look back. Needless to say, we didn't have cell service that deep into the woods, so we couldn't contact anyone else. We had to hike back. It'll be okay, I said to Michael. It's only three miles. You can do this. We shifted the water bottles and our modest amount of gear into my pack so he wouldn't have to carry anything and made decent progress. I was still tracking the hike on my Fitbit. After about two miles, Michael ran out of steam and we rested again. I told him to lean on me to take the weight off of his injured ankle. Even though I'm a head shorter than him, it seemed to help. We're almost there, I said. Just one more mile. Despite the setback, we were in pretty high spirits. The sun was still up and the woods were still beautiful. We made light of our predicament. Michael joked that he can't do anything without getting hurt or breaking something, and I comforted him. We both thought the ordeal was nearly over. Eventually I realized we'd been walking longer than expected. I assumed it only felt that way because we were moving at a slower pace. But when I checked my watch and saw that we'd gone farther than a mile, I started to worry. We were at 6.6 .6 miles total. That meant the way back to the trailhead was longer than the walk to the waterfall. That couldn't be right, but I figured I must have made a mistake at some point. Maybe I hadn't started the tracker until we'd already traveled a ways at the beginning. Regardless, the parking lot had to be around the next curve in the trail. But it wasn't. We went another half mile or so before stopping to assess the situation. Over seven total miles and we still weren't back. What the hell? I checked the map of our hike on the Fitbit app and saw that there weren't any gaps. It was a straight line from beginning to end with the line doubled back on itself, indicating that we were on the same route. But where was the trailhead? We talked it over and concluded that it had to be a glitch. Michael was adamant that we hadn't passed the trailhead, and we couldn't have taken a wrong turn because there were no other trails. Plus, the scenery was all familiar. We saw things we remembered passing on our way to the waterfall. It was definitely the same trail and well-maintained too. A big, white dirt track that followed the river and didn't veer off into the undergrowth. Losing the trail was impossible. At that point, we started to feel demoralized, but what could we do except keep going? Our phone still didn't have service. Michael was in a lot of pain and struggled to put weight on his sprained ankle. It was twice the size of his other ankle. He was sweating. I was sweating. The whole thing started to feel like a nightmare. 
When we went another mile and still didn't reach the trailhead, we panicked. Night falls quickly in the forest and we had little daylight left. We were almost out of water, had no rain gear or other food, and the only flashlights were the ones on our phones. Of course we cursed ourselves for not bringing more supplies, but we were only supposed to be out there for a few hours. It was just a short day hike, and we had no idea how it could have gone so wrong. Out of desperation, I yelled for help. We'd seen no people since that strange couple had abandoned us near the waterfall, but I was sure that we had to be close to the parking lot. That didn't mean there was anyone there, but we were both so freaked out. I was willing to make a fool of myself if it meant rescue. To our dismay, nobody answered. We were alone. In an attempt to get a grip, we reasoned that maybe we really had passed the trailhead we started at. Maybe we were so focused on keeping Michael off of his bad foot that we'd simply missed it and were hiking toward the next trailhead. We were pretty sure that wasn't the case, but it was also the only explanation that made sense. We were definitely still on the same trail, and though we couldn't be certain, it seemed like the landscape had changed. We no longer recognized any of the landmarks, and that seemed to support our theory that we'd gone too far. We knew we weren't walking in circles. That wasn't possible. Should we turn back? We mulled that over for a few minutes. If we were wrong, backtracking would guarantee spending a night in the woods. Michael couldn't deal with that ankle forever. We decided to press onward. I'm not crazy, right? I asked. That initial hike was only three miles. We went three miles to the waterfall. Yes, Michael agreed. The entire hike was supposed to be a little over six miles out and back. We've walked a lot farther than that. We should have gotten back a long time ago. I don't understand what's happening. When night fell, we picked up the pace. Michael stopped leaning on me and limped down the trail as fast as he could. He later said adrenaline dulled the pain of his injury and gave him the motivation to continue. That part of Oregon is mountain lion country, and I just read about a lion attack a few weeks prior to our hike. Being caught out there in the dark, was the absolute last thing we wanted, but there was nothing we could do about it. We were scared. Michael shone his phone light on the path ahead to make sure we didn't lose our footing, and I shone mine at the trees, scanning for cat eyes. I was crying. Fitbit said we'd hiked nine total miles. After 9.5 miles, we finally saw the sign for the trailhead and scrambled toward it. Relief didn't completely wash over me though, because I expected we'd have to either hitchhike back to where we started, or trudge along the side of the road for a few more miles. There was simply no way this could be THE trailhead. It was three miles past where we should have been. As we climbed the short set of steps up to the parking lot, sweaty, thirsty, exhausted, and completely unnerved, I hoped to see a car. My prayers were answered, but... It was my car. We were at the same trailhead. For a moment, Michael and I stared in shock. Our fear and misery were replaced by sheer confusion, and we just stood there. Then a twig snapped somewhere in the woods behind us and broke the spell. We hurried across the parking lot towards the car, and in those few seconds, I felt an intense dread. The best way I can describe it is the feeling you get in a nightmare when something is pursuing you and you're trying to run away, but you're moving in slow motion, like your legs just won't cooperate, and you know the thing chasing you is going to catch up. This is the only time in my life I've ever felt that way outside of a dream. We managed to pile into the vehicle and peel out of the lot. I was shaking. Michael was rambling about time distortion and dehydration and how we must have lost our bearings somehow. We got out of the national forest and onto the highway, and it was a while before we encountered any other cars. I didn't fully relax until we made it back to civilization. Neither of us can figure out exactly what we'd experienced. Michael was on crutches for months following that incident, 
and his ankle has never been the same. I still have the bone I found, but I keep it in a box because it gives me bad vibes. When we go hiking these days, we stick to the crowded trails. Whatever happened that day, we do not want it to ever happen again. My name is Luke and I'm 20 years old now. This story happened to me when I was 17. This experience still gives me chills to this day. In May 2017, I found myself going out a lot more on my mountain bike. I was getting bored of cruising around the streets, so I wanted to go for a trail slash woodland bike ride. I've never been to Lay Woods before then. Personally, I don't think I'll be going alone again. After some research into a few different areas, Lay Woods seemed to be my best bet. Living only a couple miles away, it was a nice bike ride. On arriving, it looked very peaceful, and I was almost in a dreamlike state by my first look at the place. For a woodland area in England, let alone Bristol, it was amazing. On going into the woods, I remembered seeing different colors at the start of each trail, signifying difficulty for bikers and length for walkers. So I decided to go down a colored trail to see how it was there. Finding it exciting, I decided to go down the harder trail, and now here's where it starts to get weird. I began having this weird sort of vision looking around, as if I'm being swallowed by the woodland. Everything felt like it was getting bigger and further away. I brushed it off, but it turns out I actually lost track of time. I got lost on the trail. Now, Bear in mind, I'm very observant and aware of my surroundings before this trail. I then came to a strange opening. I could go left in the rough direction of the way out, or right deeper into the woods. Me being me, I decided to go deeper into the woods. I came to a weird little trail that just had dodgy written all over it, metaphorically speaking. I went against my gut feeling of turning back, and I went down there. I came to a point of which the trail continued, but it was getting dangerous. The trail being too bumpy for me to even walk down, I then turned back. But for a few minutes before turning back, I don't know why, but I was just stood still staring down the trail. I felt like I was being watched from all angles, even though it would be near impossible to have that many eyes surrounding me in that area. I got nervous and I began walking back up the hill as I was too tired to ride at this point. Keep in mind, my bike tires are completely solid. No punctures, slow punctures, or even anything wrong at all. Upon getting back to the spot where I originally went to the trail, that weird loss of time thing happened. It felt as if the whole path had stretched by half a mile, as if the woodland was moving. I began walking up the path, feeling that same eerie sensation of being watched as I did beforehand. This time, it felt a bit more sinister. It felt as if something was about to happen. Bearing in mind, I hadn't seen a single person at this point in time since I went down that first trail. I'll explain the scenery before continuing. It's a long path, a slight steep hill to my left, a very narrow river to my right, maybe four feet deep and four feet wide. Bushes are on the other side of the river with the odd tree every now and then. Upon getting a quarter of the way up the slowly inclining path, I hear a woman crying behind a tree up ahead. I start slowing down my pace to try and get a good look behind the tree, but the whole time I'm thinking to myself, why would someone jump across to cry behind a tree? So I edge closer to the river to look behind to see if this person is okay. Also, because many people go to lay woods to end themselves. So I was hoping to maybe help this person. But you guessed it. There's no one there and the crying stopped. A bit weirded out, I just slowly turn away and start walking again. A bit quicker as I was unnerved at the time. I've had paranormal experiences before 
but not usually in a place like the woods. Usually in a house or some sort of building, so this was new to me. I had this sudden shiver as I was walking, and maybe a minute or so later, only a couple meters away from where I heard the crying, it started again. But this time, it was right opposite me across the river. I didn't bother looking. I started to go into a bit of a jog, and as I got faster, I heard the bushes rustling as if they or it was following me. Upon hearing this, I sped up, and the crying became more and more hysterical. Bear in mind, my bike was fine before this moment in time. I thought to myself, fuck this, I'm gone. I went to hop on my bike with the adrenaline that was rushing through me, and I came to almost a sudden stop. My back tire on my bike had become completely flat, so I had no other choice but to sprint with my bike and pray for the best that I don't trip up or end up having to throw it to run faster. With the crying person still close to me and keeping up, I'm running faster and faster, praying I just get off this path that I was on. I had that feeling of wanting to cry, because I couldn't actually do anything to help the situation or get out of it faster. And after what felt like an hour, but in reality was probably only five or ten minutes, I could see the car park. The crying had stopped following me and getting closer, and it started moving back down to where I first heard it. I sprinted out into the car park. I must have been white as a sheet of paper and hysterical with my breathing and wheezing, as multiple people in the car park turned and looked at me like I was crazy. I saw the exit sign out of the car park and ran towards it, and while doing so, I noticed my bike to be moving a lot smoother on approaching the car park exit. I couldn't believe that my bike tire had suddenly regained all of its air. It was solid again, as if it was before the unnerving crying person shenanigans. I jumped on my bike and got away from Lay Woods as fast as I could, and I haven't gone back there since, as every person I tell this story to becomes reluctant to go there with me, or any extra people. The thing that makes this scary is that I have Irish heritage. In Irish folklore, there's a demon woman called the Banshee. She's seen in the woodlands next to rivers and lakes washing blood off of clothes. It's said that if you see her washing blood off of clothes, the person who owns those clothes will die. Alternatively, if you hear her crying, it means death. I can't remember the meanings exactly of the deaths, but it means either you or a loved one will die. In 2017, I lost my aunt, two of my best friends, and a dog. Lay Woods is no joke. There are many stories to have come out of Lay Woods too. You can read online about them. Search up Lay Woods Bristol Haunting. It's rated 87th most haunted place in the UK, according to Higgy Pop. It's a popular spot for people in Bristol to end themselves. Or it was at least. Even the ghost of Isambard Kingdom Brunel has been spotted there, looking over the suspension bridge, which he designed. I must clarify, this didn't happen only to me, but my uncle too. This was after a Christmas Eve party when everyone went home. I decided to stay because my cousin and I were watching a movie. My uncle, who used to walk his dogs in the wood next to a park, went off to take them out. Before this, my aunt told him to not do it because it was too dark out there. He didn't care much and he went off anyway. My aunt was still worried, so I went along with them. Once there, anything wrong seemed to happen. Everything was quiet. My uncle and his dogs were having a relaxing walk, as usual, and I wasn't really paying attention to the surroundings, when suddenly, the dogs went still. This wasn't that strange. They always stopped their way to stare and bark at other animals they noticed, like rats, birds, insects, or other dogs. However, this time was different. 
When the dogs got still, my uncle and I noticed something was going wrong. The dogs weren't angry or curious. They were kind of nervous, anxious, and afraid. One of the dogs, the largest one, was growling and shaking. As my uncle started to get worried about the situation, we heard it. People in the woods. We didn't see how many because of the darkness, but they were saying something. We made out. We all gather here by blood of. We. And thee and I. As my uncle and I heard that, he yelled for his dogs to follow him out of the woods. As we left, he turned his head back and he saw a slight movement of branches and shrubs, perhaps because these peoples were trying to hide. After all that happened, he hasn't walked his dogs near those woods or even when it gets dark out. So me, my boyfriend, his best friend and his girlfriend drove up to Big Bear. Then a day later, another friend of ours drove up. He was supposed to sleep downstairs and couples sleep upstairs, since there's only two bedrooms. The first night we stayed there, it was kind of creepy because the cabin was pretty remote. And of course, there's absolutely no lights outside. It's the woods with coyotes howling and bears but nonetheless completely normal activity. On the night that our friend drove up at around 12 a.m., my boyfriend and I were in bed when suddenly our friend sleeping downstairs comes banging on the door, freaking out, saying he saw shadows in the woods and that the motion light came on and that there was thumping outside. We got a little freaked out, but my boyfriend gets out of bed and checks the entire cabin. He even goes outside nothing. We go up to the other couple's room where there's a porch with a sliding glass door that looks out into the woods. It's important to note that I'm a naturally very anxious and scared person while my boyfriend is a rock. He's calm and logical while I tend to jump to the worst case scenario. My boyfriend goes over to check the last place in the cabin so he pulls the curtain and jumps and yells, oh my god. At this point, I'm terrified. My boyfriend is a 180 pound CrossFit coach, and to see a big guy like that scared is nauseating. He locked the door and backed away slowly. He quietly says, There's a large man standing outside staring at us. He's just standing in the woods looking at us. At this point, I'm thinking he's messing with me. He looks at me and says, Go lock the door. That's when I knew he was serious. Everyone is freaking out. I run and lock the door behind us and we all decide to stay in the room to keep an eye out. It's the middle of summer and it's really hot, but we refuse to open the window. I'm so scared but trying not to show it as everyone else seemed to have calmed down. About 30 minutes go by, nothing happens. I get annoyed with the heat and the fact that there's five people in a tiny room and three of them are men, so my boyfriend and I go back to our room. I'm still pretty spooked, so my boyfriend tries to cheer me up. At this point, it's about 1.30 a.m. I told him I was too scared to sleep with the lights off. He tells me that it's totally fine and he understands, so we just lay with the lights completely on. Finally, I start drifting to sleep when I hear a thud. I sit up and look at my boyfriend. He looks at me. And then the power cuts. I immediately start sobbing. I'm trembling and I can't see anything because it's pitch black. I try to get out of bed and run, but my legs get tangled in the sheets and I fall. My boyfriend picks me up and we grab our phone and run to the other room where everyone else was staying. I'm hysterical at this point. I try to contact our host, but nothing will go through. I try to call my dad, but all of our phones say no service. We are alone out there. Thank God the friend who drove up after us had a different carrier, because his phone had one bar. So he calls the local sheriff. 
He's on the phone with them and they transfer us to the utilities company. We give the address and they tell us we're too far in the woods and they don't cover that area. At this point, we're wondering if the entire area has no power or if the man outside had just cut our power. I cry more and we call 911 to report suspicious activity and a power outage. They send the fire department. A few hours go by and it's 3am and suddenly the power comes back on. We fall asleep and the next day we talk to some of the locals of the area. We told them our power went out and he said that was strange and shouldn't have happened. He told us the only reason that happens out there is because of a snowstorm. He said he couldn't explain it. So, to the man in the woods who might have cut our power, let's not meet. This was very recent, 11 days ago to be exact. I'm a fan of hiking or just simply taking walks in the woods. The only time I go alone is when I'm in the woods I live near. This day I was not. I was with my friend Lars in a walk about 3 hours from my house. We were planning on traveling around and staying at motels in the meantime. That day we decided to take a walk in a popular area for people who like to walk in the woods like me. The catch was that these woods were huge. Not really bad to us though, we were thrilled. We escaped the crowd but every now and then we would see someone walking by. We walked for a while until we got to this spot, not too different from the rest, except for one thing, nobody else was around in this section. That's why me and Lars took this turn. After a while of walking down this path, we spotted a man, a naked man. We gave each other the look and turned around. The man was slightly off path, bent over and looking at something. As me and Lars were walking back, talking about the strange man, I heard a voice behind me. I turned to see the man. He was talking to us about the bug he picked up. I got a good look at him. He was a bit tall, nothing crazy, bald with a bit of brown hair beginning to grow, but completely naked. I flashed the man a smile and sped up. We got out of that place as fast as we could. Once we got to the car, we kind of laughed. Yes, it was creepy, but more weirdly funny. The car ride was nothing, so skip to the motel. As we're checking in the motel, we see the man walk in. He was a bit hard to recognize considering the fact that now he had clothes on, but they were torn up. He waited behind us in line. Good thing we were almost done checking in because as soon as we did, we went right to our room and locked it with no thought. Now it was definitely creepy. Was he following us or was it a coincidence? We both decided we weren't going to stay at this hotel for more than a night. Hell, I didn't want to stay one night if it weren't for Lars telling me it's okay. That night, Lars wanted to go outside for a cigarette. I don't smoke, but no way was I going to stay in this room alone. I followed him outside and we chatted for a bit. After a few minutes, I see the guy walk out the doors. Lars put out his cigarette and began to walk inside, but before we got in, the guy pulled out what was probably a knife or something else sharp, and he started carving through his sleeve and right at his arm. I saw liquid trickling to the ground, and I immediately knew it was blood. I rushed into the lobby and Lars got the idea and followed. We alerted the staff, but by the time they got someone to come out, he was gone. To this day, I still have so many questions. Did he follow us? Why was he naked? Why was he doing that to himself? I will probably never know the answer, but honestly, I'm still spooked. I don't know what to do if I see him again, but I hope I don't have to think about that.
My childhood best friend, Marie, and I were around 11 and 12 years old at the time. Marie's family had their own campsite in a provincial park about two hours from our hometown. We would spend the entire summer each year living in the camper out there. This particular summer, I was able to go and stay with them for a week. We were excited to spend our time adventuring around the forest. On the last night I was there, we decided we wanted to hurry down to the ice cream shop by the lake before it closed. It was early evening at this point, still pretty bright out but beginning to lose light. The path we took was down a short slope right next to the main road with maybe 10 feet of thick brush and trees in between. On the other side was the forest with more tall, thick brush. So we were walking along, not seeing another person on the path in front or behind us. We hear a sudden rustling and snapping of branches, similar to the sound of maybe a deer moving through the woods. I wouldn't have thought anything of it, but then the sound of running footsteps follows. Marie glances back and suddenly grabs my arm, urging me under her breath not to look back. At the same time, the running stops. I don't know why I didn't ignore her and get a look myself. I guess I could sense the very real fear in her voice and chose to listen. We both start to panic, getting that feeling like when you're running up the stairs after turning the basement light off. We pick up speed as much as we can without breaking into a sprint knowing that the ice cream shop is only about a minute walk away at this point. The path soon breaks and we're in the parking lot. Suddenly Marie steers me hard to the left, heading towards the lake in the boat rental instead of continuing straight to the ice cream shop. I go along with it silently, understanding ice cream is no longer an interest right now. Marie is clearly panicking at this point. We're both looking around, but it seems whatever scared her is nowhere in sight at this point. Marie walks up to the boat rental and gets us a kayak. We climb in and begin to paddle out into the middle of the lake. As we paddle, she tells me that there was a man behind us, and that the man had stopped running at us very abruptly upon making eye contact with her. He'd been wearing a long black coat with a hood up, despite it being the middle of July. He had a terrible smirk on his face, and she swore that as he stopped running, she saw him put something shiny away in his coat. He appeared to have just emerged out of the bushes after we walked past, given the sounds we heard right before he came running onto the path. We reach the center of the lake and stop paddling. I pull out my Nokia brick phone that my parents had given me, thank God, just in case. I hand it to Marie and tell her to call her parents to come pick us up. As the phone rings, I see her look out past me to the shore and she goes pale, lifting a hand to point out to what she's seeing. I turn and there was a man stalking his way around the path that circled the edge of the lake, staring out at us. We sat in the middle of the lake and watched him do two full laps, never looking away from us before finally disappearing. It took us a few times to get a hold of her family. We were freaking out the whole time as the sun got lower and lower. We did manage to have someone come with the truck, but by the time we reached the shore, it was pretty dark out. I don't know what we would have done if we hadn't been able to call for a ride. Looking back, I don't know why we just didn't go up to the ice cream shop, inform an adult there, and ask her parents to come get us then. But it worked. We got back safe, and we thankfully never saw the man again. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, 
This is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Nick Bigdoski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel De Luna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Kuro, Ember Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Plays 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasps Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, this bad kitty, your pappy's dilly, Laney, tripping balls through history, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, Pie Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracoed, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.